Okay, welcome back folks. Today we are going to be looking at the RCBS Rebel Master Reloading Kit. I want to take it, load up a bunch of ammo, see how each component performs. We tried to cover a lot of platforms and get a lot of variety here. So for pistol stuff, we're going to load up some 45 ACP to shoot in my 1911. And we'll load up some 357 Magnum to shoot in my Ruger GP100 and my big boy Silver Henry. And we'll see how those do. P pistol stuff should be pretty straightforward. On the rifle side of things, for semi-auto platforms, I want to do uh, 223 and 6.5 Grendel for the AR-15 and 308 for the AR-10. And then for bolt-action rifles, will do 6.5 Creedmoor, 6 PPC in the Benchrest rifle. That should be fun. Hopefully that'll be a small group. And we'll also do 300 Winchester Magnum because that's the biggest cartridge I shoot. So that's kind of the plan. If you're, if you're looking at the length of the video, which this is going to be a absurdly long video I'm sure but if you're seeing that and just freaking out like dude just I'm just shopping for a press kit just tell me if it's good or not well we'll do a summary in the last five minutes of the video so watch the rest of the intro here and then once I start talking about nonsense you don't care about or maybe don't even understand yet just jump forward to that last five minutes of the video and I'll give you my feedback on the kit. Because at this point, you know, most of it's green. That's about all I know. It's still in the box. I haven't used any of it. But I have a lot of experience with most of the individual components. So here at the beginning, I'm expecting nothing but success out of this kit. There's really only one part that I'm really concerned about. But the rest I expect to go really smoothly. This So this new press makes no freaking sense to me whatsoever. I don't get it because I guess this press is supposed to replace the Rock Chucker Supreme, which in my opinion is about the dumbest thing RCBS could possibly do. I'm, I'm hoping maybe that's wrong. Like uh, maybe they're in the midst of, you know, reconfiguring their product lineup. Maybe the craziness of 2020 has kind of thrown off that plan or something and we still don't have the big picture. I'm not sure, but like, it seems like this is just going to be a direct competitor with the Rock Chucker if that product line is meant to continue. And if they're abandoning the Rock Chucker name, that's just nuts. Because right here, this is my grandfather's old rock chucker and this press was on his bench my whole life from my earliest memories this this was on my grandfather's bench so so maybe i'm biased like I, i've always just thought very very highly of the rcbs rock chucker and i've always felt like you know the, the rock chucker was one of the best names in all of reloading like it's so the whole situation's a little bit puzzling and if in case you're wondering once again, over on, on Twitch, we were talking about this old press and somebody mentioned you can remove the bushing and they actually have the date stamped under there. So this one is a 1968 model and there are some out there that are older. So you don't just throw away over 50 years of brand recognition, do you? That just seems dumb. And you know, so the current or the latest version of the Rock Chucker the Rock Chucker Supreme, I think it's got a big like new uh, Roman numeral four on the side of it. Like there was the original Rock Chucker, like my grandpa's I just showed you. Then there was a Rock Chucker two. And then there's this Rock Chucker Supreme with the four on the side. Was there ever a Rock Chucker three? We're getting a little bit off topic. We're going to get back to the rebel here in just one second. But I find this all relevant discussion because as far as I'm concerned, the rebel should be the Rock Chucker five. And I just don't understand why it's not. It just seems super stupid. Now, if you want to see the actual differences between the Rebel and the Rock Chucker, like I don't have a Rock Chucker Supreme here to, to show you myself. So go over to Gavin Tube, Ultimate Reloader, did a really good video on the press, showing off the differences and like he weighed them and, you know, like just really covered the difference as well. And while you're over there, he also did kind of an unboxing video on the RCBS Rebel Plus kit. So this is the master kit. There's also a plus kit. So this is the cheaper of the two kits. The plus kit comes with a, a few additional items. I will already tell you, I would pretty much universally recommend you go with the master kit. Everything that comes with the plus kit is either something I wouldn't buy in the first place or it's something you need, but I just don't like the one that's in the kit. And we'll, we'll cover that in much more detail as we go. Now, as far as price goes, actually these are in stock right now at Mid-South Shooter Supply for $488.95. It's listed at Midway for $454.99, but it's out of stock. So it looks like that's the going rate. I actually ordered this kit back in December. Midway had an amazing price on these. I can't remember if it was a, you know, Black Friday sort of 
promotion, but I got this for $359.99. So, you know, that's a full hundred bucks less than what it's going for right now. I, I did see it over on uh, Natchez Shooter Supply for $394.99, but it's currently out of stock. So, you know, we're still a long way from normal. I mean, right now you buy whatever you can find, whatever you can find it. But hopefully once everything gets everybody's uh, back in stock and things calm down, like maybe the, the price of this kit will settle in a little bit under 400. That would be my hope. And I think at that price, it is an outstanding deal because I went through all of the components of the kit and, you know, looked up their prices at Midway and Mid-South, which if, you know, if you're just new getting into the hobby, those are two, Mid, you know, Midway USA and Mid-South Shooter Supply are a couple of our huge retailers that usually have very good prices. So to buy all of this crap individually, I came, it came out, they were within $4 of each other, $5.79 at Midway and $5.75 at Mid-South. So at the price I paid for the kit, I mean, it's a smoking deal. I saved 200 bucks. Current price, you know, like Mid-South, like I say, it's in stock right now at $4.88. You're still saving almost 100 bucks. And as I mentioned, the, the scale in here is really the only thing I'm freaked out about. Assuming this is a good press, which it should be, I can already vouch for the rest of this stuff. It's good stuff that you're going to use that you're not going to have to replace or that you're not going to have to throw in the trash. So even if the scale ends up being garbage, it's a $33.55 scale at Mid-South right now. So you're still coming out way ahead and maybe you end up with a backup scale, even if it is a piece of crap. Okay, where... Let's get going, man. I feel like uh, we need to get going. Let's get all this crap out of the box and we'll just quickly go through each part one at a time and then we'll just get started with loading. And I'll try to explain everything pretty darn thoroughly as I go along. This will kind of be 50% product testing and 50% beginner's guide. And I'll tell you what, my normal, my normal viewers might be shocked to see how clean my bench is and how few dies I've got here. And I did that because I want to closely track during this video all of the, the other little things we use as we're loading. You know, that way you know what else you need to buy. Because, I mean, there's a couple major components that you need that aren't included in the kit. So we want to document all of that. I'll give my opinions and explanations as we go along. And then hopefully, you know, by the time we get to the end, we get to that five-minute summary at the end, we'll be able to have a nice clean list of everything you might need. All right, let's get this crap out of the box. So it'll actually be easier to look at the press once we get it mounted to the bench and all that. This is So these are extremely heavy. I think this guy's right about 25 pounds, if I remember correctly. Hopefully you went over to that Gavin Tube video I was talking about, so you already know what it weighs and what the difference is between the rock chucker and all that. It's heavy. It's, it's a freaking boat anchor. But before we get it out of the way, this might be the best place to show you. Yeah, there's a Zerk fitting, so we can use a grease gun to... To grease this guy up, usually with uh, with presses, you're you're left to just you know squirt a little oil and work the ram up and down that sort of stuff. Yeah, this one we can grease it up for real. So the uh, what do you call this bolt pattern? I guess you could call it is the same as the rock chucker. So if you've already got a rock chucker, if you if you got a rock chucker four and you're replacing it with your new rock chucker five, which is what the rebel should be, maybe we'll just call it the rock chucker five. Maybe that'll be our thing. Maybe we can start a community thing and convince RCBS to rename the Rebel to its proper name, Rock Chucker 5. Yeah, but that's where the that's where the mounting bolts go. And well, that's about it. As far as interesting stuff to talk about right now on the press. I guess one good thing to bring up now, we need to we need to start our list of crap you are definitely going to need. And entry number 1, I guess should be a like a, a mounting solution. So are you going to mount that directly to your bench? RCBS makes a plate that you can mount to your bench that then that mounts to, I guess. I don't know. I've never used that one, but what I did buy was the Inline Fabrications uh, number 26. I, I wrote that on there. So yeah, number 26 uh, mounting plate. This is for the Inline Fabrications quick change kit, which I'm going to go ahead and bust this guy open and get this thing attached to it. This underside, I guess maybe these, there's these recessed, there's these four recessed silver spots. I'm thinking maybe that lines up with the RCBS mounting plate. Yep, that must be what it is. These things are always so awkward. All right. Uh, I think that's good right there. Come off there. Which means I can just set this guy out of the way here for a second. Well, now that it's mounted, I might as well just, yeah, let's go ahead and finish talking about it. 
So this is this is the inline fabrications uh, mount I was telling you about. It's uh, I went with the flush version. I sit down to reload. So this plate pl plus a little spacer is the, uh, the the lowest mounting option, and then they've got others, whatever. And actually, a couple of their taller uh, mount options are shown in that uh, that ultimate reloader video I was talking about. So other than the handle. So this, yeah, this comes in the package as well. A nice sleek handle. This is the only uh, assembly required for the press. Now this press does give you the option to mount the handle on the left or the right. So, you know, ambidextrous operation, I reckon is what the feature list says on the website. Okay, yep. Uh, do I need to, it's got flats here. You can get a wrench on it. Eh, whatever, I'll get it later. It probably won't come loose and drive me crazy. Yeah, first stroke with the handle there. Feels a little bit, it feels tight. You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't feel like gritty or anything, but if, you know, it feels like there's some, some friction there just in the fitment here between the, the ram and the press body. So before we get running with this guy, we'll go ahead and give it a squirt of grease in the old Zerk fitting there. But other than that, I mean, it looks like we're ready to go here with the press. I was just kind of looking at the clearances, making sure like this handle does kind of go forward quite a bit and doesn't look like, you know, I was just imagining it, imagining it if I did have it on the edge of the bench. Is anything close? I don't think it is. And down here at the bottom, just kind of looking here, doesn't look like there would be. So yeah, not, not really any clearance concerns that I'm spotting. Ooh, you know what? One thing I should have told you. So there's a hole in the back of the ram here on the bottom. This is where our old primers are gonna come out whenever we're decapping our, our old brass, removing those old primers. They shoot straight down the ram and out. Now, a lot of presses these days will have a, you know, a similar setup, but they'll have like plastic tubing or something to catch the old primers, or you can take the cap off the tube. It usually has a little cap. You can dump it, you know, straight into a trash can. So here, RCBS was kind of like, screw you and your tube, you're going to use a trash can. So not really any alternative. And I can see it being a problem like if you were mounting to a bench with, you know, something enclosed down here. So that's at least something to consider. You know, you got to get a trash can under there somewhere or you're just going to have primers all over the floor. And speaking of primers all over the floor, the Rock Chucker Press, the original like my grandfather's, the primers came out of the, uh, the front of the RAM. And this, yeah, this piece right here went on the front and collected those primers as they fell. And I think the, you know, the current Rock Chucker Supreme shoots them out the back and then there's this plastic contraption that resembles the female reproductive system that goes back here and catches them. It's always been the biggest complaint about the Rock Chucker presses. Primers all over the godforsaken place. Like the, the, the spent primer catcher has been driving people crazy for 50 years. So here on the Rock Chucker 5, that should have been the biggest selling point. Could have made a big joke out of it. We've been driving you crazy for 50 years. Primers all over the floor. And they finally done something about it and moved it out the bottom of the ramp. That could have got a lot of old rock chucker owners to upgrade. But nope, we get the Rebel with no history, no pedigree, trying to make a name for itself from scratch. Very sad. All right, I think that's enough of the press. Let's go ahead and move on through the, uh, through the rest of the kit. We'll be sick of looking at this press by the time this video is over. All right, let's try and bust through this stuff quickly and I'll use my list here so I'll make sure not to forget anything. We already looked at the press. It also comes with this guy right here. This is a powder measure. So we're gonna dump powder down into this hopper and then we'll have this big uh, you know, reservoir of powder and we'll be able to dump, dump charges out here with this handle. Pretty darn handy. So I believe this is the Uniflow 3, the third version if I'm not mistaken and my regular viewers will already be used to looking at this guy. This is my Uniflow 2. So this is the previous generation of Uniflow powder measure that I've used for uh, quite a few years, at least 10. I'm trying to remember when I got this, but it's been a long time, so I've always really liked this powder measure. I'm looking forward to trying out the new version, and we'll look at the differences whenever we get to the, uh, you know, whenever we get to that part of the video where we need this guy. We'll be talking about it a bunch. It does come with some uh, accessories, Different little, like, uh, yeah, these are little nozzles you screw into the bottom with different size openings or orifices. Would that be an opening or an orifice? 
I felt like saying orifice. This guy right here is an emptying tube of some sort that I've never used on my other one. I, I think it came with one as well. I've never really used it, but we'll, we'll try it out whenever we get to that point. And it comes with this thingy, which is a mount of sorts. The powder measure actually screws onto this guy, kind of like this. And you're able to hang this off the side of your press. So this hole right here goes over to your press and a, and a, uh, a die goes into the press and holds the powder measure in place hanging off the side. This is probably not something you're going to want to use long term. Like this is kind of a, we got some scrap, might as well stamp them out a little thing, sort of whatever. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it works well. We'll try it out just to say we tried it out, but we're going to want an actual powder measure stand. And once again, my regular viewers will already be used to staring at this stand on my bench all the time. I sure know how to frame a shot, don't I? <laughs> There we go. Well, that still sucks, but whatever. It's YouTube. Come on. Uh, yeah, this, I forget what they actually call this thing. What do they call it? I don't know, but it's, it's an RCBS powder measure stand. I think it's the only one available right now. You'll notice that it is quite tall. Like, uh, you know, that's, that's a good 10 inches, 10. Yeah. That, that's a little over 10 inches tall. I would think. Now my grandfather had this one from way back in the day. This is also an RCBS powder measure stand but it is significantly shorter. I don't think this short guy is available anymore. I think for most situations, the tall stand is gonna be the one you want anyway. And this does work okay for me sitting at the bench, you know, but every once in a while I do think like, man, that thing sure is tall. So I'm thinking we may end up using this one, whatever. But you know, it's just a little stand that has a hole that your powder measure goes into. There we go, I'll back out a little bit farther so you can see. It just, uh, you know, this would be mounted down to your bench securely. And then this just sits right in there and puts it at a, at a nice height for, uh, for working. So we need to add to our list of crap you're going to need, right? Or is that what I called this? I need to actually start a spreadsheet here or something so I can keep track of this myself. Uh, we already have our, our mounting hardware for our press, right? You got to figure something out there with mounting hardware. And we need a powder measure stand. You know, maybe there's a couple of you out there who will decide to use this guy. Or I'll tell you what, if you guys use this guy and like us, you know, let us know down in the comments. Why is this the way to go? Or maybe we'll find out later. Like I said, we'll give it a try. I mean, I guess it's nice to have it, you know, your powder measure right there beside the press sometimes. So maybe distance would be a bit of a plus. So the, uh, the powder measure does come with one of these, uh, one lock ring, just FYI. All right. So, We'll readjust the camera. Okay, we got our press, we got our powder measure. Next is the scale. This is the 1500 grain pocket scale. It is a digital scale. This is what we get coming out of the box. And I'll tell you what, no matter what happens with the scale, no matter, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical about this scale. I've tested a lot of cheap scales. They all suck in their own unique ways. Hopefully this one will be mainly usable, but it's really awesome that it comes with one of the RCBS pans. Their pans are amazing. These are really, really good. These, these gold colored pans, uh, powder doesn't stick to them and the weight's just nice. And you know, the color makes you think of gold and great riches like th this. These are really, really good powder pans. And the problem is if you don't happen to get one with an RCBS scale, they're extremely expensive to buy by themselves. They're like 20 to $25 just for that little pan. So here's our little scale clamshell type. We've tried several different uh, brands that are almost identical to this. And I'll pull out some of those whenever we get to this point, but it's got a little, little calibration weight, little pan there, tray there for the, for the uh, object to be weighed, a little bit of a magnetic, uh, yeah, a little magnetic locking, whatever. So. We'll give it a shot. It looks eerily similar to uh, several other scales we tried that all ended up being disappointing. So, Moving right along. Next is our hand primer, which are those parts and these parts. And I think that's it. So this is uh, what RCBS calls its universal hand primer. It's got these little spring-loaded jaws right here that you slide your, your case under 
and it automatically adjusts the size. I love these. I actually have two of these because they are a little bit of a pain in the butt. These are the parts that you need to switch it between, you know, large and small primers. So I got really sick of switching mine between large and small, so I just bought a second one. So I'm a huge fan of this hand primer. And also, further to that, I'm a really big fan of just hand priming in general. Like this is my preferred way to uh, prime cases. And this particular primer is one of my favorites. So I'm looking forward to it. The problem is both of mine are, you know, they're getting, I won't say they're high mileage, but they, they've, they're both well broken in. They got, they got some miles on them. And one of them in particular, I've had a little bit of problems getting uh, primers to seat as deep as I would like and had to mess around with it a little bit. So whenever we get to the priming portion of, of today's video, I'll pull out my old ones. Maybe we'll play around with it, see if we can figure out what part on mine has worn. That's one good thing about RCBS is they're very good about uh, replacing parts. You know, if something breaks on you, you, you call them up and they, they send you one out in no time. And I think my last example was the, the hopper on my old Uniflow powder measure. I had actually dropped it and cracked the plastic hopper. Now the new version, the hopper screws in and out nice and easy to change, but these are actually pressed in. So called them up to see if I could get a part number or whatever, and they just, they sent me one for free good instructions on how to pop the new one in. Like, yeah, it was really good customer service experience. And you'll find a lot of those types of stories as you talk to people in the reloading world. Like RCBS just has always had good customer service in my experience and what, from what I've heard from others. All right, moving along. Next is our powder trickler. So this is the powder trickler two and upgrade kit. Uh, some assembly required, it seems. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll jump ahead. They do give us uh, a set of Allen wrenches. Look at that, RCBS branded and everything. Look at that. So we're going to need that because we need to set this part of our powder trickler down into the base. And then yeah, it goes down right there. And then it looks like we've got a couple little set screws around the edge to hold it in place. And hopefully they gave us the right size. Yep, looks like they did. It's the second smallest one. So not the, yep, looks like they did. The second smallest one. Good, so then that holds this part, which what these are, let me, let's finish putting it together. This part right here, just a little tube, and this slides on and off, it looks like. So I believe we need to pop that off, put this tube through here like that and then slide this guy back on. Oops, wrong way. That way. And I went the wrong direction, I think. Let me read the instructions just to make sure I'm putting this damn thing together correctly. That's kind of funny, because here, here's what was getting me. This little, this little green cap, I thought this smaller part might actually set inside of a groove or something, and that side kind of has a little bit of a yeah, I thought that might kind of slide into there or something. I don't know. But I just wasn't sure which way this went onto the trickler. And looking in the instructions, they've got it put on both ways. So that picture, clearly it's pointing towards the base. And then this picture, it's clearly pointed away from the base. So they don't even know how to put together their own piece of equipment. So I'm not going to sweat it too much. We're just slide, going to slide this thing through here. And uh, let's see, let's go in, let's go inward. Yeah, there we go. Pointing inward like that. And then this spins around. So what that does, so this, this reservoir gets filled with powder. And as you're measuring your charges on your scale, this allows you to quickly just dispense a little bit of powder, just trickle a little bit of powder, which is why they call it a trickler. So this is our powder trickler. We can, uh, there we go, like this. It's adjustable for height, which is pretty darn cool. Like I dig that. And let's see, this little extension tube goes on here. Yep, that's the same size Allen wrench. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and pop this guy on here and tighten down the set screw. I'm not really sure why they don't make it a one-piece tube that's just longer. Like would that have made the packaging larger? They could have fit the whole tube in one piece in the same packaging. So I don't really understand this little extension. And this is not my first experience with this trickler. 
I've already had one. I don't even remember why I bought this. It's hard to screw up a trickler. Like it definitely works, you know, it dumps out some powder. For some reason, I've always kind of preferred, I guess, the ergonomics of this little, of this little Frankfurt Arsenal. So this is the one I generally use. I, I haven't, I just haven't used this one that much. So looking forward to trying the new one today. All right, so I think that's put together. What's next? Ooh, scale, primer, trickler, funnel. Yeah, a funnel. Look at this cute little guy. This is just a basic powder funnel that you'll use. You know, your, your, uh, the neck of your case goes there and allows you to dump powder into your cases. These universal uh, funnels usually work pretty darn decent. See there, it says 22 to 50 caliber RCBS. Like you can get really fancy with funnels and there are a lot of options, but every reloading bench is gonna have a basic universal funnel sitting on it and this one's as good as any. So we get a funnel. Oh, you're going to need another funnel though. Yeah, I want to put this in the on the uh, the crap you're definitely going to need list. Now, this is just a large funnel that you want to pick up at the auto parts store. You know, something with about yeah about that size. And what I use this for is putting powder back into powder containers. You certainly don't want to use something that's you know contaminated from automotive use or anything goofy like that. So get yourself a basic little dedicated larger funnel for your reloading bench for, for moving powder back, uh, back and forth. You know, emptying your powder measure back into the container or emptying your bowl back into the container. This is just a basic little glass bowl that you buy for a dollar from Walmart, but I use it all the time to, uh, you know, dispense small amounts of powder. Like maybe I'm just loading up 10 rounds. Like today, I think that's what we're going to do is we'll load up 10 rounds of each of the eight loads we want to shoot. And in some of those cases, it's going to be easiest just to dump a little powder into this bowl and then work from here. Okay, what's next? The manual. So this kit comes with the spear. Yeah, spear hand loading manual number 15. I guess I could take it out of the plastic. There we go. Yes, yeah, so there's, your, there's your spear manual. Now the spear is a good manual. It's going to have a whole section at the front that teaches you how to reload. And I would urge everybody to read through one or more manuals, you know, like these days, it's it's pretty darn easy to, to learn by video and get a lot of what you need from, from YouTube and other sources. But it seems like whenever I read something, it, it like it goes to a different part of my brain sometimes, you know, like it, it, it sinks a little bit deeper sometimes. But the main thing you're gonna use this manual for is the load data. Basically, about that much of it, is load information for all of uh, your different cartridges. Tells you what powder to use with what bullet, how much you can use, all of that crap. And we've got similar data from the powder manufacturers and other sources. I'm not gonna dive too far into this in this video. Like this, we're gonna cover the mechanics of putting together ammo, but I think if I get into the subject of picking components and charge weights and stuff, if I try and cover that in this video, the length will get even more crazy than it already is. So we're mainly just gonna to stick to the mechanics and we'll talk about that other stuff another day. All right, the manual, that's good to go. Let's see what we got left over here. Let's see, funnel manual tray. Okay, so this is a universal loading block from RCBS. Yeah, they call it uh, yeah case loading block. And you'll see it has all the different size holes. These generally do a pretty darn good job, like especially if you're not shooting anything weird. Like I know that I'm shooting uh, 308 or 6.5 Creedmoor, one of these holes is going to be perfect for that cartridge. Now, you'll notice some damage here. See how that one got squished? Pretty sure this is my fault. Like, I'm certain this wasn't here the first time I ever took it out of the box, and then I've had it back in the box. I think I just squished it with the press. Did I mention that press is insanely heavy? So, no big deal. I'll grab some pliers and eh, straighten some of this crap out clean it up a little bit, it'll still work fine. Now, one thing I'll mention while we're talking about blocks is I would definitely suggest you buy some blocks for your specific cartridges. So I really like these, uh, these Frankfurt Arsenal blocks. They call them perfect fit reloading trays. Yeah, so like this is the Frankfurt Arsenal number two and it fits 223 perfectly. So there's no space and the brass sits down in there nice and tight and isn't you know, prone to moving around on you. Sometimes, you know, with, it's just the nature of anything, trying to make it universal. The fit on these isn't gonna be quite as good. And the other reason I bring it up is these are like $3 a piece. 
something like that. Not expensive whatsoever. Uh, Midway also sells this National Metallic brand. Like this is the this is the tray I use for 300 Winchester Magnum. Similar sort of deal, or you know something like 300 Winchester Magnum, where it's a belted case. You know it already doesn't want to sit nicely down inside of some trays. So nice to have one that's specific. And actually, that in particular, it'll be interesting to see how well this does work for those guys. So yeah, and then here's a here's a Lyman one that's uh, freaking solid aluminum, nice and heavy. There it is, Lyman 485 there. So a lot of options for upgrading your loading block to something specific for your uh, for your cartridges, but nothing you're ever going to find in a kit. But it's always nice to have some universals laying around. Okay, what's next? Manual tray lube. Lube. This is RCBS Case Slick Spray Lube. So the sizing process, whenever you're taking a fired piece of brass and sizing it back down, basically the first step we're going to do during reloading, if you don't lubricate the cases, they can get stuck into your dies. So that's what this stuff's all about. It's a pump bottle <clears throat> spray type. Yeah, there we go. Now, I've never used this before. You might notice that some of it's missing. The other night on Twitch, things got a little bit weird and we were lighting this stuff on fire because there was a big like uh, like fire and explosion danger warning on the outside of the box and somebody on Twitch noticed it and then we started looking and it came from this. This crap is pretty dang flammable. Makes a nice little pop whenever you light it on fire. Not that I would recommend anybody doing anything goofy like that, but yeah, uh, extreme danger, very flammable. And it's poisonous, so, you know, keep away from children, I guess. Now, if you're new to the reloading world, listen, case lube is a hotly debated topic. Everybody has their favorites. So we're going to give this case slick a try, but I can pretty much guarantee you down in the comments, there's going to be a bunch of people talking about how much they hate case slick and how they stuck some cases and how they're never going to use it again. And so finding the right lube for you and figuring out how to use it properly is one of the first skills you gotta learn as a reloader. And if you don't get it right, it can be frustrating. Stuck cases are a pain in the butt to deal with. So I've got a stuck case remover that I wanna show, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. I don't wanna, I may have already confused things, you know, like I don't wanna confuse you as far as what goes in, the, or you know, what comes in the kit and what other stuff I'm talking about. I mean, I guess we've got our crap you're gonna need list. What have we done so? Yeah, well, the powder measure stand. Yeah, you didn't get that in the kit. That's a that's something you need to buy. Nah, I think I think we're good. You guys are smart. You can keep things straight, right? Okay. After the lube is our Allen wrench set, which we already talked about. To be honest, that's a little bit of a weird addition to the kit, but it's nice to have. You're you're going to need one, no doubt about it. Die lock rings and all of the various crap we're going to need to put together and take apart. You pretty much have to have a set of those on your bench. Next are the brushes and the primer pocket cleaners. All right, so you get this little kind of uh, little handle with a little insert on one end and then an opening on the, a cavity. Yeah, we'll call that a cavity. Cavity on the back to put your weed in there. And we've got four, four different things they give us that we can screw into that. We've got two different uh, neck brushes. So this is a pretty, pretty stiff plastic brush that we're going to use to clean the inside of the necks of our cases. And I don't know, is this handle long enough? Yeah. So these actually fit, I think, into the bottom of this, don't they? Into our orifice? Maybe? Nope, apparently not. We could, we could fit one in there. Actually, so that maybe that's what we need to do. We leave one in the tool, which they just screw down in there like that. The next two tools are primer pocket brushes. These little wire brushes that you'll use to clean out the uh, the crud from your primer pockets after you remove the old the old primer. Now the good thing is this like this this thread size for these sort of attachments in the reloading world are universal, which is so nice because you can buy you know you can buy a little tool like this or something, primer pocket uniformer, or a, uh, actually one of my favorite tools, the RCBS military crimp remover, which actually, let's see if I got that old. Yeah, it's right here. Here we go, something like the RCBS military crimp remover. This is the small one. So whenever I'm doing military 223 brass or 556 brass, I take this little tool, screw it right on to one of these little handles like this, and bam, that's your tool. So. There's our brush, second brush in the handle, primer pocket cleaners in the handle. We're ready to rock. And our one last piece is our chamfer and deburring tool. This is used to clean up the case mouth. 
especially like after we trim brass right around the case mouth can have burrs and be a little bit jagged you hit this with a little bit of uh, twistiness and it cleans up all those edges and leaves you with a nice clean case mouth this is a nice looking tool that's almost identical to just about any other you're going to get like these are pretty pretty similar between the different brands so i think this is going to be a good one and you definitely need one just about the only time you might want to upgrade from that is for what they call the vld style you see how this one's pretty darn skinny and long this is a this is a lyman i think it's in a lyman handle but let me uh, yeah, let me get them side by side there you can see that one's much skinnier and longer so it's just a different angle and to be honest i've never really uh yeah i've never had a problem doing them this way so that's it that's the kit so let's see let's move on let me talk about the additional parts that come in the plus kit and i'll see if i can talk you out of getting it so it comes with the powder measure stand we already talked about that right this stand is right at 25 dollars, like 24.99 so we want that that's a good part it comes with a kinetic bullet puller this is uh this is a different brand but it comes with an rcbs kinetic bullet puller you can take a loaded cartridge and it kind of clamps down in here on this end of the hammer with the bullet pointed that direction then you tighten it up you bang it on something really hard and the bullet comes out you are going to need a bullet puller that's just all there is to it we all make mistakes we all load loads that are too hot we all seat something too deep like you know you're going to end up needing to pull some bullets and these kinetic bullet pullers are cheap like uh actually i think this one right here this was a national metallic brand from Midway, I think there's a Frankfurt Arsenal that's, I mean, we're talking 10 or $12. Now, I think if you wanted the RCBS bullet puller, I think their version is 30 or 40 bucks, but they're all the same. But now that I say that, I don't think I've tried theirs. Maybe it is nicer. I usually go with the cheap ones and they work just fine. The next part that the plus kit comes with is a set of analog dial calipers. These happen to be Cabela's branded. And I suspect the RCBS ones would be a little bit better quality because these are particularly junky. But to be quite honest with you, I don't care how good they are. I don't want analog dial calipers for my reloading. So for me personally, the calipers that come with the Rebel Plus kit, I would be replacing them with a digital set anyway. And, you know, if you're used to using an analog set of calipers, you know, and you're good at it and all that, then, you know, maybe they'll be just fine. But the biggest advantage of, of a digital set like this here is whenever you're trying to compare one thing to another, a lot of times it's easier to, you know, like let's say it's here, we can zero our calipers and it makes seeing, you know, like sometimes we're looking, it's like, oh, okay, that's two thousandths longer than the last one, or that's, or it's two thousandths shorter or whatever. Now this can certainly be done on an analog set and, you know, there you can generally rotate the dial and like, you know, the, the capabilities there, but not necessarily the ease of use unless you're already used to them. So if you're like me and you definitely want a set of digital calipers, the amount you're going to spend on them really depends on what type of reloading you're going to do. If you're doing like precision rifle work where we obsess over every single thousandth of an inch, the easy answer is to go ahead and buy a set of Mitutoyo calipers, you know, standard six inch calipers. You know, the, the Mitutoyo brand is most common as the, you know, kind of the high end brand you'll see reloaders use. And I think, you know, you're looking a little over a hundred bucks for a set of those. I bought a set of these in size. This was not a cheap set of calipers either. And these have done really, really well for me. But what's really surprised me has been this set of eye gagging. There we go. This is the eye gauging brand that you'll find over on Amazon. I just checked, these are going for $41.95. So definitely not the cheapest you could find, but there's a lot of value here for the money, I think. All of the features of your Mitutoyos or you know any other nice set of calipers, they also feel really good. Like the, the easiest way for me to tell cheap calipers from nice ones is with like, here's a, uh, here's a really cheap set where th this actual, this specific design, you'll see a lot of, of, of places, you know, I think they're, they're made in the same factory and they slap whoever's name on there that ordered them. These happen to be Cabela's, but you'll, you know, Harbor Freight, I think you can get these for $9.99, you know, 10 to $15 can get you into a set of these, but like the jaws are really, really sloppy. Like there's a lot of, get that up by the microphone you hear that kind of eh, like that's just there you go look at the that top set of jaws like how in the world are you going to measure something precisely with that much slop 
So these are extremely frustrating to use for some of your more precise measurements, but you go to something even just up to the, you know, the $40 set of uh, eye gauging, lot less slop, like a whole lot less slop. So this definitely goes on the, you know, the crap you're going to need list. No matter what you're loading, you're going to need a set of calipers. But if you're loading nothing but pistol, I'm trying to think of any any time I really make critical measurements when I'm loading pistol. It's not it's not very often. Or maybe you're just loading, you know, just plinking ammo. You don't really care. You're not a precision rifle guy. You're not going to freak out. Then you know the cheap set might be good. But then again, if you're that guy, what the hell are you doing buying this press kit? Might as well save money and buy something cheaper, right? So I guess if you, if you're if you're buying this press kit, at least go with the uh, with the eye gauging set or better. I think for the remainder of this video, we will use the uh, we'll use the eye gauging set. Okay, back to our plus kit and our analog dial calipers that it gave us. What else we got? Um, just about everything is the same. They do include some die lock rings, which that's a bit of a whole discussion. That once we put start putting dies in the press, you know, die lock rings will make a whole lot more sense, I guess. Here we go. So here's a die lock ring, a locking style uh, die lock ring. This is not an RCBS, but they give you a set of six of these. And these days, most dies come with locking die rings. So uh, yeah, I, like it seems like a weird thing to include in a kit. Like if you end up needing die lock rings, I found an RCBS set for $11.99. So 12 bucks. And the last thing it comes with is a different hand primer. So remember how I was telling you, this is the universal style with the, uh, the spring loaded shell holder there, right? They just slide right under. Well, RCBS makes a standard hand primer. It's a little bit cheaper that the universal is the, uh, the more expensive of the two, but they've got a standard style that uses standard shell holders. Now, if you don't want to, don't know what I mean by shell holder, here we go. This is an example. This is uh, just a little bit of metal that it snaps into the ram of the press and it fits the, you know, the base of your brass. So this is where you slide the brass in and out of your press whenever you're doing different functions. And the plus kit comes with a hand primer that uses these. And then it comes with a set of these shell holders to use in that. Now, that's probably fine if you're shooting standard you know, normal cartridges. You know, a lot of different cartridges share the same uh, shell holder. If you imagine if you were shooting 223 and 300 blackout, obviously would use, you know, their, the case head is the same or a 308 and a 243 or a 30 six, you know, that like there are different families of cartridges. So with just a few shell holders, you can cover a whole lot of ground. But if you're shooting anything weird and you're getting that plus kit, you'll definitely want to look up that shell holder set to make sure it's got the appropriate shell holder for the cartridges you need. You know, the first one that pops in my head is, you know, so I have a couple of Mosins and they shoot 7.62 by 54R. That would not be a standard shell holder I would expect to come in that kit. But, you know, if I'm shooting 308 and 223, I'd bet you a hundred bucks they're in that kit. So that's, that's the plus kit. That's what it comes with. Like what in the world did we get of value? We got a downgraded hand primer, which I've already mentioned. I freaking love this hand primer. So that's a big deal to me. You know, that that other hand primer might be great. I don't have personal experience, but I do have personal experience with these and I love them and I don't have to mess with shell holders. Like that's one of the, the best things about this is the universal nature of those one less piece to switch out. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a plus kit downgrade. It gave us calipers that we didn't want. So we already needed to replace those with a digital set. It did come with a stand, which is good. You know, we like the stand. So what do we say? That's that's 25 bucks and a bullet puller that we can get something similar for 10, 12. So let's, I don't know, let's call it 15. So 25 plus 15, I'm only getting 40 bucks worth of value out of, of additional value out of that kit. My hand primer has been downgraded and I got a couple of die lock rings, you know, doesn't seem like it's worth it to me. So the next thing I want to talk about are some additional things that everybody's going to need. I think so far we've got a set of calipers. We've got a bullet puller. We got our stand, right? So, so I'm going to go ahead and grab my drill real quick and mount this dude. So there's not a ridiculous amount of force put on the mount here. So I've got some, uh, just a couple deck screws, just, uh, get it where I want it. And that's been good enough for years with my bigger mount. This older mount's a little bit different in that it's threaded like the press where the, uh, 
The newer style, it's actually slick and it just kind of, you know, slides in and out. So it's really easy to pull the powder measure out of this style of stand. A little bit more of a pain in the butt on the short guy. Now, the first time I took this powder measure out of the box, it did not have the handle on it. It did not have what they call the metering insert. Whenever we get to measuring powder, we're actually going to tear this guy apart and we need to degrease it because powder is really bad about sticking to, to the plastic parts and you know it comes oiled up really nicely. So we'll talk about this guy a little bit more in depth later. I honestly just want to get it out of the way here for the next few minutes. There it is. And let's see, we've got our other parts for it. Go, leave those right there. And that's one more box out of our way. Hand primer can live over there with its other parts. All right, this almost feels like a reloading bench. Okay, let me pull out some other universally needed crap. And then I think we'll be ready to get started. Okay, so some of these are gonna be disputed and that's okay. I already kind of brought up the stuck case remover. This is really only a thing for bottleneck rifle reloaders. So if you're just shooting straight wall pistol or straight wall rifle for that matter, you can live without one. But like if you're loading bottleneck stuff, you'll want to have a stuck case remover around. I think this kit is about 25 bucks. It's basically a drill bit and a tap so that you can drill out the, uh, the primer pocket of a piece of brass and tap a uh, threads in there. And then, yeah, so... I've got a whole video on this kit, I believe. So if you're wondering what it does, go there to have a look, but I think you'll get the idea here shortly if you don't know what I'm talking about. Cause once we start talking about case lube and we start sizing brass, we may end up needing it ourselves here. I don't know. Like I said, I've never used this case lube. So I feel a lot better knowing that I've got a stuck case remover laying around. So this right here is a set of check weights. Like these guys here weigh 20 grains a piece and this guy over here is a 10 grain. So whenever we pull out the scale and start weighing powder charges, we'll use a set of test weights to, uh, to build confidence in our scale so we know that it's dead on. These are not particularly cheap. You're looking at about 30 bucks. I think this is a Lyman set. I believe RCBS sells a set. Quite a few sets out there. They're not all that cheap, but I promise they're worth every penny, especially if you're the paranoid type, which I am. So the next thing I think you ought to buy is a Lee powder measure kit. This is a set of scoops that I just dropped everywhere. Okay, hold on. All right, not a big deal. These are just little scoops. So like this one happens to be a 2.8 cc. And you know, so that's kind of a, a middle size one. Here's the smallest one, 0.3 cc's. This guy's tiny. So these are extremely useful when you're measuring out powder. This is the biggest one right here. So that's about how big they get. So this kit, is extremely cheap. It's right, right now it's $10.23 at Mid-South. So they're very cheap. They come in a nice rugged cardboard box, easy to store. You know, it's, it's a pretty big footprint here, but it's a nice box that stores out of the way pretty easy. But you, I use them all the time. So I've been trying to decide how to film this video, like this next portion where we actually, you know, start loading some ammo. And I'm trying to decide how to talk about dyes. Because we, we, you know, we can have a bit of a die conversation here in this video. We're not in a hurry, right? Everybody that's in a hurry, we already sent them ahead. They already jumped to the last five minutes of the video. So we can take our time. I'll tell you what the first thing I do need to do. I need to gather up all of the brass we're going to use in today's video. And we'll go ahead and decap all of it. That way I can go ahead and clean it. So, because I want to, I want to tumble our brass and get it clean. So I'll tell you what, let, let me do that. Let me gather up all of the brass we need and we'll start there. Okay, so I pulled out all the brass we're going to need and loaded up our universal loading block. And the next step I want to take is to remove the primers from all of this stuff. Everything I pulled out is currently fired and dirty. Now they're at various stages of uh, dirtiness. This is 357 Magnum. It's pretty dirty, but it's not too bad. You could absolutely reload this piece of brass right here without cleaning it and be just fine. But some of the other, yeah, especially like this, uh, the 6.5 Grendel brass I grabbed. I think I left this stuff out in the rain the last time I shot it before I picked it up. So it is super duper dirty. Now you don't want to be dragging all of this, you know, dirt and grime and stuff up into your sizing die. So I really want to clean these before we resize the cases. Cause if you're not familiar whatsoever, let me grab a, let me grab a sizing die. That's a, that's a bad example. Here we go. This is our 45 ACP sizing die. This is a lead die. And you'll notice here at the bottom, 
It's got this little pin sticking out. That that's a decapping pin, which it's actually loose. I need to need to tighten that up before we use it. Which I guess if it's loose, I could go ahead and just pull it out. There it is, right there. It's got this decapping pin in the center. So if your brass is clean, it's totally common to just decap while you're resizing and reload without cleaning. Here's some of our 308 brass that we're gonna use. This stuff is particularly dirty as well. I shoot with a suppressor a lot. So like this was fired in my AR-10. So it gets pretty gassy and gets pretty dirty. So we're just going to clean it all. What we're going to use is a universal decapping die. This will be the, the first die we use, which I've got a couple of them here. So the first one here is made by Redding. There you go, small decapping die, 22 caliber to 50 caliber. Now all this is, is essentially an empty die. You know, even something all the way up to uh, 300 Winchester Magnum, it can go down in this die and it's not gonna hit anything. You know, the only thing that makes contact is that decapping pin on our primer. So pretty much the same, the same deal with other universal decapping dies. This is a Lee, haven't used it in a while. It's a little bit, uh, little bit rusty and stuff. This one's got some miles on it. Same sort of deal. All it's got is a decapping pin and an empty die body. And actually, while I've got these two here, let me show you something. So this is the Lee decapping pin right here, and this is the Redding. You notice how much smaller the Redding is? Or maybe you can. It's a little bit smaller. And there's some of our brass today has got small flash holes. Actually, let me grab a piece out of this 308 box. So this is a piece of Lapua 308 brass but it's their Lapua Palma brass, which means it uses small primers, which is a little bit weird. And this particular brass has got the small flash holes. So if we look at the decapping pin on the Lee, it won't go through. But if we look at the Redding with its smaller pin, goes through no problem, right? Goes right through. If we pop it in the other direction, the way it's supposed to go, there it goes, pops right through. So that, that's pretty rare. It's, it's, mainly, it's mainly Lapua brass, and even with Lapua, it's not all of them. So like the, the normal large primer 308 Lapua brass has standard size flash holes. So just something to be aware of because you can, you can kind of ruin your brass. You try and use a decapping pin that's too large. You know, these, the reloading press has a lot of force. It can basically just go ahead and punch right through and turn your small flash hole into a large flash hole. And as far as I know, that's only a rifle thing. I'm not sure if there's any pistol brass with small flash holes, none that I know of. And actually now I'll show you the first uh, full length sizing die I grabbed. It's for my 6.5 Grendel, which my, my Grendel brass has small flash holes. You'll notice this one, I've actually got the decapping pin removed from the die. Because if I'm remembering correctly, the original uh, decapping pin was too large for the flash holes in the brass I was using. So I'm probably overemphasizing this, whatever, just, you know, something, something to keep in mind. Now the decapping pin I actually want to use today is made by Mighty Armory. This thing is brand spanking new. Look how shiny and new it is. This was sent to me by a kind viewer to try out. And I've heard a lot of really good things about these Mighty Armory ones. Apparently they got some really nice, strong, decapping pins and with this one he did send me a uh yeah it's actually a three pack of their smaller pins which are 57 thousandths yeah there's their so left is their big one and right is their small one and they just screw onto this little shaft that goes down into a very simple die right not nothing really going on here it's just a big empty sleeve that holds that that uh decapping pin so that's our setup let's go ahead and go over to our uh to our press and we'll try it out you know what? I forgot to grab my grease gun. I wanted to squirt a little grease into this guy. We'll do that before resizing. Not much force here involved on uh, on decapping. So for any given cartridge, here's you know a piece of 300 Winchester Magnum. We need the appropriate shell holder, which I happen to have right back there. There we go, that's the guy. This one happens to be an RCBS number four. Uh, shell holders are, uni are universal, thank God, across the industry. So today I'm gonna be uh, using this RCBS, I'm gonna be using a Hornady, a Redding, and a Lee. So at least four different brands of shell holders here. Your shell holder is just going to slide right there and kind of snap in, just like that. And then it snaps out and falls on the floor. So, you know, the camera's kind of in my normal way. Generally, I would come in here with my left hand and just, you know, right here. 
So now our piece of 300 wind mag, wind mag brass can sit right in there and now we can now we can work with it. Now one thing I don't have is a trash can to catch these spent primers. Remember they're you know they're coming out the you know the bottom of the ram and for my desk here I'm going to need to pick up kind of like a tall kitchen trash can I think. So for the time being I have a five gallon bucket that I think I have situated in the right place. We'll see if it catches them. So what we do to set up our decapping die, the you know, decapping dies are, are among the easiest to set up. You raise up the ram of the press and then screw the die down until you feel it touch. Pretty standard instructions. All of the, uh, the decapping dies I showed you would be the same way. And then you just back it off a little bit. I think the instructions for this die in particular say a uh, quarter of a turn. So, you know, we would call that off the shell holder. So if you heard me say like, okay, we need this a half, half turn off the shell holder. That's exactly what I mean. We screw it down until it touches and then back it off that amount. So there we go. There's our decapping pin hanging down. And the next time this 300 wind mag goes up, we should hear a primer pop out. Okay, definitely came out, but it didn't shoot out of the, the ram yet. And there it fell straight down into the bucket. I think what happens is the, uh, the discharge hole is actually inside the, uh, I don't know, the, the ram tunnel, whatever, you know, the, uh, the tunnel through the main body of the press whenever it comes out. So the primer doesn't actually fall until you're bringing down the ram. So there, yep, there it went. That's kind of good because we'll see if this one's the same way. Yeah, these primers are just falling like straight down. What I was afraid of was that, okay, at the top of the stroke, if the hole down at the bottom is open and the primer can just fall down and go shooting out, I was afraid primers were still just gonna be, you know, flying all over the place. But since it, it'll, you know, this setup kind of allows the primer to fall down and then it just sits there until you drop the ram a little bit and then it just falls, you know, straight out of the hole, they're falling in a really controlled manner, which is really good news. So decapping only takes a second, you know, uh, Pretty darn easy process. So that's the last piece of 300 Winchester Magnum, which means we're done with this shell holder. Nothing else uses it, but you'll find that certain shell holders actually cover a lot of different things. So this next, this next shell holder is going to decap uh, 357 Magnum, which we don't have to, you know, change any die settings or anything. We just swap out our shell holder and we're immediately decapping 357 Magnum. Now this same shell holder also works for 6.5 Grendel. And like I said, this Grendel brass is one of the ones with uh, small flash holes. You don't want to be too, you know, too aggressive here. Like whenever I'm, you know, bringing up a, a case to kind of approach the, the decapping pin, like I don't just, you know, plow straight through it. You know, nine times out of 10, you're fine with that. Just jam, you know, just bust right through them. But it only takes an extra second to maybe just kind of ease up on that approach, make sure that everything's in alignment, and then you pop it through. It only takes an extra second. And honestly, that attitude goes across any function on the press, like brass resizing and bullet seating are similar sort of deals. You know, I just take my time and try to let things happen rather than forcing it and, you know, maybe breaking a decapping pin or something like that. It can happen. Yep, and actually this same shell holder is used for 6 PPC, which is another cartridge we're loading. No adjustments to the die, it's ready to go. All right, so that's pretty much it. I'm gonna finish up the rest of this brass and then I'm gonna get it cleaned. And then we'll have a little discussion about brass cleaning. I don't necessarily wanna cover it in depth, but we can take a few minutes to talk over your different options. Okay, so our brass is all clean now. Here's a piece of 45 ACP. Hopefully you can see down in there, probably not, whatever, but it is shiny and clean. Now, if you're just getting into reloading, you're definitely gonna to have to put some thought into how you wanna clean your brass. You've got three different ways. So you've got a, a vibratory tumbler with a tumbling media. Uh, it's usually uh, corn cob or walnut media. That used to be how we all did it. But the last 15 years or so, wet tumbling has become very popular and that's what I do. So th these were wet tumbled, which you basically put them in a big vessel with some hot soapy water and tumble them around for a little while with a generally a stainless steel tumbling media. Not everybody uses media, but it's the most common way. 
And the third way would be with an ultrasonic cleaner. Now you get the best results with wet tumbling. I don't think anybody will argue that, but it is a little bit of a pain in the butt. Plus wet tumblers aren't cheap. They're getting a little bit cheaper. So I use the Frankfurt Arsenal rotary tumbler, the full size one. I think they generally go for about 200 bucks, but they're really a little bit too big. Like you could do a thousand cases of nine millimeter or uh, you can probably do a thousand pieces of 223. That might be a tight fit, but you get the idea. Like it's a, it's a huge tumbler. They came out with a light version that's a little bit smaller. And I think it's probably a better size for most of us. I'm generally doing batches, you know, kind of, well, like, you know, I just tumbled the, these hundred pieces and should be able to do that. No problem in the Frankfurt Arsenal light version. And it's only a hundred bucks. So, you know, still not the cheapest thing, you know, it's a significant cost you need to account for as you're getting into reloading, but it's not as bad as it was a few years ago. So another thing I did to this brass was anneal it, which, uh, yeah, that's not a very good example. Yeah, we can kind of see it on the 300 Winchester Magnum brass, a little bit of discoloration up here around the shoulder. Annealing is used for softening the brass and it is way outside the scope of today's video. If you're just getting into reloading, do not worry about it. There aren't any purchasing decisions you need to make at this point that would have any effect whatsoever on annealing. And a lot of people reload a long time and never worry about annealing whatsoever. So don't worry about it as you're getting started. And that's all the time we'll give it in this video. If you want to know my current annealing process, I do have a video. I use uh, a salt bath annealing process. So nothing important here. So I did pull out a second universal loading tray. This is a Hornady. Um, I guess, how's our, uh, our list doing? Our crap that you need to buy list? Yeah, the calipers and the bullet puller were the last thing I put on there. I'm gonna go ahead and put some uh, loading trays on the list because you're going to need it. A lot of times as you're reloading, it'll be very helpful to have kind of one tray that's ready for the next process. And then as you do it, you move it over to the other tray. So definitely get another tray, definitely get something that's fitted to your specific cartridges. Like I was talking about earlier with something like the Frankfurt Arsenal Perfect Fit reloading tray. But since we're doing so much variety here, I'll just go ahead with another universal. I think we'll start out this party with our two pistol cartridges. We've got 45 ACP, and we've got 357 Magnum. But you can't really skip ahead if you want to see everything because, you know, here are our first loads with the pistol. This will be our first use of the scale and the powder measure and stuff like that. So yeah, you're stuck here with me. But the pistol should go quick. And speaking of that, let's go ahead and get started. Let me grab the dies. We'll have a quick talk about pistol dies. I'll talk about the different dies as we go along. So we'll start out with just the two pistol cartridges. I haven't really been loading for pistol all that long. And when I do, I keep it pretty darn basic. And I've always used these lead deluxe pistol die sets. They are a four die set. Yep, right, uh, yeah, right there, four dies. And it covers pretty much everything you're going to get up to with pistol stuff. Remember this, this was the, the decapping pin from earlier. I need to remember to tighten this up. So remind me to do that here in just a couple minutes. Whenever we get this guy in the press, there we go. That's the, that decapping pin. Did I ever kind of complete the thought about uh, the universal decapping die? This is totally optional, right? They're cheap. Whether you buy one now or later, you're going to end up buying one. Everybody does. Everybody does eventually, but totally optional. And your sizing dies like this guy are always going to have a decapping pin in them. Now, one cool thing about the Lee sizing dies for pistol or for straight wall pistol stuff, I should say, is this, uh, this extra shiny little ring in there. That is a carbide sizing ring. So one of the cool things about carbide is we do not have to lubricate our brass. So for pistol reloading, we're not going to need to dip into this stuff out of our kit. So that makes, that makes pistol reloading that much easier, nice and simple. So that's your sizing die. The next die is what Lee calls the powder through expanding die. You might see that it's hollow right down the center. You can actually put a funnel in here and charge your cases on the press. We're not going to be doing that. I might show you once we're over at the press. Let's see if our funnel fits that. Nope, it doesn't. But a leaf funnel, which if you wanted to do this, I mean, a leaf funnel is like $3, I think. Yeah, here's a leaf funnel. It slides right down in there. So over on your press, you can have a funnel ready, ready to dump charges through. But the other function of this die in here is this little thing. And what this does is, so after the case has been resized, it's actually too small at the case mouth to smoothly seat that next bullet. You actually gotta open it back up just a touch. So that's what this expanding die is for. This goes down over the mouth of your case 
and depending on how you adjust it, it progressively expands the mouth of your case a little bit more and more until you can comfortably set that new bullet on there. So for standard reloading with jacketed bullets, this is, you know, this is unique to pistol for the most part. You know, you're not going to you're not going to see any expanding dies whenever we get to the rifle portion of today's video program. So once we have resized our case and then we expand the case mouth, then we can put in a new primer and we can dump powder in it. And then the next step is to seat the bullet. This is the lead bullet seating die. Very, uh, very straightforward, simple bullet seating die. We're, we're going to have a lot more discussion about seating dies over on the rifle side of thing. But here on the pistol side, like I said, I keep things very basic. This is just standard stuff. Don't worry too much about it. It all seems to work great. So once we've seated our bullet we're pretty much ready to shoot but there is one more die called the Lee factory crimp die so inside of the die you've got this weird thing which with that little ridge in there looks like the case mouth it goes up in there for its little bit of a squeeze yeah that's what it is and this die is of course adjustable as well to have more or less crimp i always like to take apart my dies and make sure i you know kind of know the surfaces and know what's going on inside which you know let's say this was a brand new set of dies you need to tear them apart and kind of wipe off some of those the oil they come with from the factory and actually specifically rcbs dies in particular seem to come just dunked in oil so you take them apart and degrease them and occasionally take them apart for cleaning and whatnot but also like i mentioned i like to kind of just know what the the working surface in there looks like helps me visualize what's going on as I'm adjusting it. You know what I'm saying? So that's the Leaf Factory Crimp Die. Now the coolest thing about the Leaf Factory Crimp Die is this also has a carbide sizing ring in there. So you're basically running the loaded round through a carbide sizing ring at the very end of the operation. And especially with pistol stuff, like, you know, once we get to bullet seating, I'll show you. It's easy to get some weird bulges and stuff during bullet seating. And this, uh, this sizing ring really irons those out and makes sure that you're not going to have function issues whenever you go to shoot them. So these Leaf Factory crimp dies are really popular. If you end up going another direction on dies, you know, and get another company's dies, it still might be worthwhile to pick up a Leaf Factory crimp die in that cartridge just because of that. Lo love that little carbide ring in the factory crimp die. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that the, the lead dies do come with your shell holder, right? That goes in the press, ready to go there. And they also give you one little scoop. Looks like the 45 ACP set comes with a 0.7 CC scoop. So we've got everything we need. The other set for 38 Special and 357 Magnum, this guy right here, yeah, there you go. These are exactly the same. Same exact set of uh, those four dies in the appropriate size for 38. So let's go ahead over to the press. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and size some brass. So I'm gonna have to go grab a tub of grease. Just went to the garage to see if I had any grease in my grease gun and I don't. I wanna go ahead and hit this guy in the Zerk fitting, right, in the front here before too long. Now, whenever I was decapping the brass earlier, I did notice by the time I was done, like it is a night and day difference of how much smoother it is now. It started to work in and I'm getting some oil that's collecting around the ram here. So that's good, right? I mean, at least it didn't come dry. Seems to be, uh, you know, pretty well lubricated right now. I'm not too freaked out about, yeah, needing to pick up some grease. So first thing we need is our 45 ACP shell holder. We'll snap it in. Then I need to tighten up this decapping pin. We could just pull it out. Like right now, it's not going to do anything, right? Since our since our brass is already decapped. But with these lead eyes, you want the, the top of the decapping pin almost flush, maybe just a little bit proud. And I've got a couple crescent wrenches here. It's usually best to get it like snug off the press and then do the final tightening on the press. But eh, I might get it tight enough here. We do need to start concerning ourselves with lock rings though. Yeah, that's probably gonna be tight enough. So these don't need to be extremely tight and you don't really want them extremely tight. The whole point of this slip through design is if you do happen to hit an obstruction, the decapping pin will just push out the top. So it should be, should be tight enough. But okay, so the lead lock ring, you might notice this big old honking O-ring here. So whenever we screw it into the press, like this, whenever you you know you get to the point where you're ready to tighten it down, you're tightening down that big huge lock ring or that that big huge O-ring, and the Lee the Lee standard lock rings do not have any 
set screws or anything in them to hold them in place, whatever. So this die with this lock ring, there's really no way to lock our settings in place or anything like that. But with a sizing die, you're about to see it's so simple, there's not much point to it. So I'm not even gonna worry about pulling out a lock ring. I've got some, like actually whenever we do our seating die or something, I can go ahead and grab one. But here for the sizing die, I just don't think it's gonna matter. So the way we wanna set up this die is we wanna raise the ram to the top of its stroke and then just uh, screw the die down until it lightly touches the shell holder and then tighten down the lock ring. So that's it, like that's, that's all there is to it. So then we grab our first piece of brass, put it in there and then just raise it up into the die. So the process of sizing brass is when you, you'll use the most force, but resizing you know, straight wall pistol brass does not take much. Does not take much at all. So it goes really quick and I'm already down here to the last three. No problems to speak of. And that's it. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip around my loading tray and we'll go ahead and do the same operation to the 357 Magnum brass. And I think our instructions are gonna be the same here. Almost forgot to swap shell holders. I would have figured that out pretty quick. So since, since this die kit does both, both uh, 38 Special and 357 Magnum, I know like with the bullet seating die, the instructions are a little bit different, but I think for the sizing die, we just screw it down until it touches because we want the whole piece of brass up inside the die, right? Yep, that's exactly it. So raise the ram, screw down the die, and then tighten the lock ring. And we should be ready to size our 357 Magnum. Now with 357 Magnum, I'm actually loading up uh, 20 shots instead of, I'm doing 10 on most of the others. Because with the 357, I've got uh, not only my Ruger revolver, but I've also got a Henry big boy carbine. So we'll shoot it in both. Figured I might as well load up some extras. Okay, so I'm down to the last one. A lot of times at this point, I would go ahead and just move on to our powder through expander die, or you know, go ahead and expand the case mouths. But I wanna hold off just one minute. Let me swing the camera around and we'll have a look. So the next step we wanna to do to our newly resized brass is to make sure the case mouth is in good shape. Well, I should also say, you know, if we hadn't cleaned the, the brass, you know, or, or removed the primers with the universal decapping die, now would be the first time we have access to that primer pocket. And this would be when we wanna clean that. So if you remember, our kit comes with the little handle with the, uh, the neck brushes. We'll, we'll get to those later with rifle. They don't really have much use here for pistol, but these little guys do. These are primer pocket cleaners. We've got a large and a small size. So 45 ACP, large primer pocket. We would use the large ones and 38 special 357 Magnum is small. So let's go ahead and have a look at the small. Brushes fit down in there pretty nice. I've, I've got a set of these and have for a long time. And I think it's actually the most effective primer pocket cleaner that I've tried. Like these little brushes are really good at getting all the way down into the very corner and all that crap. So. Just wanted to bring it up. We're, going, we're not gonna need it here since our primer pockets are already in really good shape. But that's what the little brush is for in your kit. Now the partner kit we do need is this guy. It's our deburn chamfering tool for our case mouths. So you don't wanna go you know, crazy with these things, but you just you know, twist them around the outside to deburn chamfer that surface. And then same thing on the inside. Now with pistol, if, if my case mouths aren't messed up or, you know, a lot of times this is good, you know, if you got a little booger or a ding or something, you definitely want to hit them with these. And it never, never hurts to go ahead and lightly hit them. But a lot of times I'll end up skipping it because like I said, that next step, we're going to expand this case mouth a little bit. So if the case mouth's in good shape, I usually won't even fool with it. So this guy's ready to go. So I would say the next step we do is we go ahead and expand that case mouth, get it ready for bullet seating, and then we'll be ready for primers. Same deal with uh, 45 ACP, yeah, primer pocket's already clean, nothing to worry about there. Just gonna hit this really lightly and ready to go. So another thing I forgot to mention is that right now is really the time you wanna check to make sure that your sizing die sized the brass enough for your guns. So for 357 Magnum, I pulled out my 
Ruger GP100. We can just take our newly resized brass and just make sure that they're, you know, dropping down in there okay, making sure that uh, nothing weird's going on, right? You know, no problems here. They're going in, falling out nice and easy. And on the 45 ACP, this is the barrel. Out of my 1911, I want to grab a piece of brass and just kind of uh, plunk it down in there. So straight walled pistol cases like 45 ACP or 9mm or 40, you know, all of the stuff that's popular in your semi-automatic guns, headspace off the case mouth. So when the round goes into the chamber, it's the case mouth hitting the end of the chamber that, you know, sets that, that depth. So for your different guns, you'll get a feel, like right here, you know, the, the case head's just a little bit below flush when it comes to the top part of the barrel there. So this looks good, you know, going in and out nice and easy. And just to give you an example, here's a new nine millimeter barrel I recently picked up for my Glock 43, got a threaded barrel for it. And here's a fired piece of brass. It obviously wasn't fired in this barrel. This guy's brand spanking new, but if we try and put this guy down into here, it's not going all the way in and it gets kind of, you know, smushy feeling. We want, we want that to uh, fall in there easily after our resizing process. Now we're gonna kind of come back to this test when we're seeding bullets. You know, we wanna make sure our completed round is gonna fit in our guns. So this is how I always do it with pistol reloading. Just use the actual gun as your case gauge. You know, if you're just getting into this, you might see people talking about case gauges or using case gauges. I don't have any pistol case gauges because I just pull the barrel out and use it as my case gauge. And I don't use case gauges in rifle stuff either, but we'll get to that later. I guess I should also mention that if you were going to trim your brass, if you were going to trim your brass to make it shorter, now would be the time to do it. But you don't really need to trim pistol brass. The resizing process doesn't really stretch it like it does rifle brass. Or I should say straight wall cartridges don't stretch. Because it's, you know, it's the same deal with a straight wall rifle cartridge or even cartridges that don't have a very substantial neck, like maybe something like 300 Blackout. 300 Blackout doesn't really stretch. Now, if you want to check, which I would certainly, you know, support that type of attitude. If we look in our, in our manual, you know, our new uh, Spear 15th edition that came with our kit, there's a whole section for 45 ACP, you know, with low data and whatnot. But there's also a lot of other good information in here as well. The one relevant to what we're talking about right now or the is, is the maximum case length, or you'll sometimes see it called the trim tube length, which I can't see it around the camera. Hold on. There it is right there in front of me. Under cartridge case data, we'll see the, the maximum case length is 0.898 and the trim length is 10,000 shorter than that at 0.888. You'll see that very commonly. You know, the trim tube length is generally eight thousandths below the SAMI maximum case length. So 888 and 898, let's grab our calipers. You bought calipers, right? Okay, this first piece is 0 0.890, so two thousandths longer than our trim length, but still eight thousandths short of our maximum length. Another one, 893, right there in the middle between our trim and our max, 891, 889, you, you get the idea. For general, you know, everyday reloading, just normal stuff, it's gonna be pretty darn rare. All right, so another thing we can do now is grease our press because I finally went and grabbed a tube of grease. So let, let's do that next. Okay, I have a feeling this is gonna get messy. I need to get some paper towels at the ready. All right, yeah, there, there's some paper towels waiting there. I did look in the manual to see if they had any guidance on this greasing process or, you know, warnings about over greasing or there's nothing in here whatsoever. It just says the, the press was lubricated at the factory, so probably a little bit unnecessary here on a new press, but whatever. I just want to make sure the Zerk fitting works the way it should and all that. It says, however, it is necessary to lubricate all moving parts from time to time with gun oil. A Zerk fitting has been installed on the front of the frame to lubricate the RAM frame interface. If rust spots appear, swab lightly with gun oil and wipe dry, blah, blah, blah. Yep. So that's about it. We'll just hook her up and crank on it until we see some grease squirting out in spots where it really shouldn't be squirting out. You know what I'm saying? All right, let's see. Yep, there, there she is. Seems to be on there. And here's one pump. And another. Man, that's pretty stiff. I am starting to see a little bit of squeegee, squeegee. I'm starting to see a little bit of uh, grease moving up here. Tell you what, let me work the ram up and down. See if maybe that, maybe try and pump in some more while the ram is moving. And that does seem to be kind of working a little bit. Yep. 
Yeah, we're getting... And it can't really... See, it yeah, there you go. You see that little glob of grease right there on the bottom, and it's pulling up here. So, looks like we've got enough in there. All right, I'll work it up and down a little bit more. And, yeah, it's starting to get a little bit... Uh, we're, we're, we're on the borderline of some drippage down here. Yeah, there we go. Look at all that. All right, so for a quick, like... Uh, you know, usability update. I mentioned earlier that, you know, this was a, uh, the RAM felt stiff, the RAM, RAM felt tight. It still feels that way. So after a little bit more grease, that didn't really change the way it feels. So I think it was greased pretty well from the factory. But I mean, just to give you an idea, like if I pull the handle back, like almost, uh, let me see right there. All right, I can let go of the RAM right there and gravity's not enough to Finish the handle stroke if you get what I'm saying. Let me go a little bit further until it does. There you go. About right there, you let go of the handle and it hangs up again. Oh, there it went finally. So that, that's pretty stiff. Like, I don't know if, if that would help or not, whatever. Give you an idea of what I'm talking about, but it just feels like an exceptionally good fit between the RAM and the press body, right? Like if you grab the RAM, like there's no slop. You know, of course, my bench is moving and all of that stuff and Coriolis effect and whatnot, but you can't just grab this RAM and feel it moving. Now, it's just an exceptionally tight fit, which is good, which is excellent. All right, let's see. This is a sizing die. We don't need that anymore. So let's start with 45 ACP. And the goal here with this die is to just make it so that it will accept our new bullet because if we look at our, you know, our freshly resized 45 ACP brass and we take, we're just going to shoot a standard 230 grain round nose full metal jacket, right? This is your standard 45 ACP ball ammo bullet. And right now, you might be able to imagine how hard it would be to get that bullet seated straight. If we just put it up into the a bullet seating die like this, it's going to get a crooked start to its seating process and that can cause you problems. So we just want to open up this case mouth a little bit so the bullet can start. Now, this is a little bit confusing because my philosophy on fluttering the case mouth or expanding the case mouth, whatever you want to make it, like do it as much as you need to to make sure your bullet seating operation goes smoothly. But no more than that. <laughs> You don't want to go too much. You don't want to go ridiculous. But then again, you don't want to skimp to where your bullet seating operation is really frustrating. So I tend to maybe err on the side of more flare than I need sometimes. And if you find yourself in that situation, you know, you just back it off a little bit. And then hopefully eventually you find that happy spot where you're doing as little as you have to. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. So let's look at our die instructions. There we are. Here's our expander die. Screw the die in until it touches the shell holder, then back out one full turn. Finger tighten the lock ring, adjust the flare to your liking. Turning inward increases the flare. For maximum case life, flare only enough to easily accept a bullet. Okay, that's easy enough. So we raise our ram, we screw down our die until we feel it touch the shell holder, right about right there. And then we back it out one full turn and finger tighten the lock ring. Now, do you remember this die? Also, you can, you can dump powder through it. We certainly don't want to do that. We haven't even got primers in our cases. So the order of operations here <laughs> is a little bit flexible. You can certainly prime before you do this. Maybe you did want to dump powder charges at the same time. Just touch that greasy ram. Gross. But because of this funnel setup and the powder through functionality of this die, it does something that's a little bit annoying. It's got the wrong shell holder in there. There we go. That one's better. So if we run our case up into this die. You'll feel it hit a little bit of resistance right at the top of the stroke. Won't be too bad. But then whenever you're dropping your ram, it's going to drop a little ways and you'll feel it hang up. So the mouth of the case has gone over that expander and it's kind of stuck there. So on the downstroke, you kind of have to give it a little bit of a pop. It's not much, you know, it's just a little bit of upward pressure. Sometimes it's a little more noticeable than others. Like if you got it like a brand new die, it really kind of, it's a little bit grippy and sometimes you got to give it a little bit of a pop. So, all right, so here's our freshly expanded case. You're not really going to be able to see much visually. Maybe just the slightest little trumpeting of the mouth of the case. And let's take our bullet and see if now we can get it. See, it's kind of wanting to go in there now, but still not quite, right? It's still a little bit hard to get it to 
sit right where you want it. It's still a little bit crooked, right? So let's go ahead and crank this down. And I just know from experience with these dies, a lot of times right around that three quarters of a turn off the shell holder mark is my sweet spot. So right now we're one turn up. So let's go down a quarter of a turn, loosen the die just a little bit and go down right about a quarter. All right, so that same piece of brass, let's run it through one more time and see if that is any better. Yeah, see how that first little bit just goes right down in there. So it's not crazy, like uh, it's not going down in there very far, but it's going down in there far enough to where I feel like I can get the bullet straight and we can run it up into that bullet seating die and get a pretty uh, smooth seating operation. So that's really all it's about. And this goes really quick. Okay, last piece of 45 ACP, and that was nice and easy. We'll just, we'll check a second one here just to, just to make sure. Yeah, that's just about perfect. Like I'm just slightly annoyed that I didn't go a little bit farther. You know what I mean? Like it's still a little bit of a pain in the butt to get it sitting down in there the way I want, which is just about right. So it's the same exact process for our 357 Magnum ammo. Changed out our shell holder run or die down in there. Now, this is where it becomes important to uh, check the instructions because you know this die set is both for 38 Special and 357 Magnum. I think we have to come up off the shell holder like quite a bit farther than we did on the 45 ACP. Okay, for 38 Special, I come off one turn, but for Magnum cases, back out the expander die an additional one and three quarters of a turn. So a total of two and three quarters of a turn. Okie dokie. Tell you what, I'm gonna lose count because that's the sort of thing I do. And I'm going to mark one of the flats here with the Sharpie. There it is, look at that guy. Make it easier to count. All right, so that's touching the shell holder. There's one turn, two turns, three, and then let's go back. All right, so that's two and three quarters of a turn. So the bullet we're gonna be using in 357 Magnum is the 158 grain Hornady XTP hollow point. These guys right here and same sort of situation. Here's our resized case. And bullets a little bit of a pain in the butt to get started. Here's our default setting. Same sort of deal, kind of hung up on the expander just a touch. There's what it looks like. And here's our bullet. Get in there. Mm, yep, kind of like 40. Well, nope, there it kind of dropped down in there. And that felt pretty good. Let's try to come at that again there. And man, it's so close. I could probably get away with that setting but let's go ahead and screw it down a little bit more. Yeah, about right there. And run it back through, and I'll do a second piece just for the heck of it. Yeah, I think this is better. There it is, kinda eh, but not really. Is that in there straight? Yeah, that's pretty darn close. I think it's kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That, those are sitting down in there nice and straight, you know, like, uh, that's, you know, give you an idea about how much the uh, brass has a hold of the bullet, but it's just barely sitting down in there. And about, you know, about that much. So just barely. So that's, that's kind of what you're looking for out of your expander die. Like I think I mentioned earlier, you will run into this occasionally in uh, rifle reloading if you're gonna be shooting cast bullets especially, getting them to seat smoothly is much easier accomplished with a little bit of, a little bit of flare. And you'll run into things like, uh, let's see, where'd it go? Here we go, yeah, this is a Lee uh, Universal Case Expander, expanding die. It's got, you know, kind of for this similar sort of operation, but here in pistol is where I run into it most. All right, so let's see, what's next? Next, we need to, uh, go ahead and prime our cases. I mean, we're really done with all of our, what we, you know, would maybe call brass prep. You know, the only thing left is uh, primer, powder, and bullet. And it's really common for people to just kind of stop at this point and store the brass in this condition, you know, fully prepped and ready to go. Just pull it out and assemble your components. Because this is really, you know, this is the tedious part. Everything up to this point, all of the brass prep, getting it to this point is time consuming and not all that exciting. 
So sometimes it's nice to get a lot of it over with at once. All right, let's, uh, let's get to priming. Now our priming tool is something I've got a lot of experience with because here it is. This is the RCBS universal hand priming tool, that guy right there. And this is my favorite priming tool. Out of all the ones I've ever used, this is my favorite. I've actually purchased two of them over the years so I could have one always set up for large primers and the other always set up for small. So I'm a big fan of this universal hand priming tool. I am about to nitpick it to death. So if this sounds, if this ends up sounding negative, just keep in mind, this is my favorite hand priming tool on the market. So first thing, the, the tray. So it's a universal tray. It's just one tray for large or small primers. Its size is perfect. So, you know, the, uh, yeah, at the top, this loosens up over time. Like right now, this one's a little bit stiff. Okay, a lot stiff, but this little slit part in the middle It'll, it'll loosen up over time and eventually not be quite so annoying. But that is really the only annoying thing I've got to mention about the tray. Because once we get our primers on here and we're trying to snap the tray back on, like, uh, yeah, like this, like it's a pretty abrupt pop. And a lot of times it'll end up flipping over primers. But like I said, that also lessens over time as you get her broken in. So with our two pistol cartridges, we've got both large and small primers. So we're going to be reconfiguring this thing, almost like I planned it that way, right? Yeah, so we've got some, uh, some CCI small pistol primers, magnums. So these will be for the 357 Magnum. And this other box are some standard large pistol match primers, some Federals. So this is what we'll use for 45 ACP. So I've pulled out one, you know, sleeve of each just to show you the... Uh, the tray is the perfect size for flipping either one. So like if you're working with a full tray, like you're going to use all 100 primers, you can just slip off the cardboard, take the entire tray like this, and then flip the whole thing over. Now Federals kind of sit in there a little bit weird, so they're going to come out and kind of go all over the place a little bit because they were sitting sideways. But with something like the, uh, the CCIs here, they lay flat in the tray, so once you flip them, it's usually just a couple shakes and they're all upright. And speaking of that, maybe, maybe you're new. You don't even know what I'm talking about. The, uh, the primer tray has kind of a, uh, you know, a rough serrated uh, circular pattern edge. Is it coming across on camera? Now the rough side of the primer where you see the anvil there catches on those grooves and the primers flip over. So if you just shake them a little bit, they all turn the same direction, or at least they were until I tilted it to show you. And occasionally you'll end up with one that just doesn't want to go and you have to flip it manually, but they usually work pretty good. Let's see if I can get this tray snapped down on here without flipping any of them over. All right, I think I've got it lined up good. That's kind of the, the way I found best is just get it all lined up and then one, one quick motion, snap the whole thing together. And they're all in there in the right orientation. And it's got a little slider there that closes off the tray so we can... Uh, yeah, we can just set this aside until we're ready for it and we can get the, the body of our primer set up for large primers. So this black plastic piece, you'll see that one has an L on it. There's another one here that's kind of uh, white, or would you call that cream? Ivory, perhaps. Yeah, if I can get the shadow just right, you might see there's an S right there. It's a lot easier to see in person. Stupid camera. So that one's used for smalls and the one that's in there is used for large. So the package has a little set screw in it. I'm not sure why it's not installed in the tool, but it goes right here in the side, right there. So we'll go ahead and just get it started and leave that there. We got an Allen wrench. We've got another little wrench, like a tiny little nut driver. And that is for installing these. I don't know what you call them, but they're the actual RAM. There we go. You can see there's one, the, the black one is bigger, silver one is smaller for large and small primers. This is the actual RAM that makes contact with the primer and pushes it in. So this tool is a pain in the butt to switch over from large to small. I mean, that's why I ended up buying another one just to have one so I, so I didn't have to mess with this. But after you after you get through it a couple times, it's not the worst thing in the world. You start out this little, uh, yeah, thumb screw knurled thingy here on your handle. We pop it off and then that releases this little thingy, which comes out the back. And then at that point, the, uh, the plastic square piece thingy can come out. So that's fully disassembled. And uh, let's see, if we go ahead and close the, there it goes. 
If we close the, uh, the handle there, you might see down in there the tip of the little ram. That's not going to show up there. Yeah, this is really the best view of it, but that's what uh, goes up and down. So we want to set this guy up for large primers first. So if we grab the large tip, now, now that I think about it, I'm trying to remember whether I need to uh, install the plastic piece first or this piece first. There we go. See it go down in there and uh, thread into that guy. There it is right up there. Then once you get it started, I reckon we can go to our tiny little nut driver, which just so happens to fit this perfectly, and go ahead and screw it down until it's snug. Now we may be taking this right back off because whenever it's all the way down, I don't know if it goes low enough. There it is. Yeah, it goes low enough. We, so we can slide our, our plastic piece in and out. There it is. Yeah, that goes that way, I think. So we slide our primer feeder plastic thingy in there. And then we put this back in, which is, this is what I always end up getting it backwards. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, there we go. Close the handle far enough to line these up and put that little thumb screw back in there if i can get it to line up there it went and that's uh that's the primer ready set up and ready to rock for uh large primers now do you, do you hear it catching let me get it close to the microphone there's kind of there's little uh a little hitch in its giddy up there at the beginning of the stroke yeah it looks like it's off center I might have to go crazy with my camera settings here to, so you can actually see it. There we go. Now can you clearly see the little black part in there? It shifted way up. Let me flip it around here. And eh, hopefully it's coming across, but it's way off center. And that's what's kind of uh, causing that little bit of a hitch. So maybe that'll wear in. I doubt it. Let me look at my other two and see if they're that way. Yeah, you know what? My other two tilt in that exact same way. Here's the one with the small primer. Got the silver thing in there. Maybe you can see it a little bit better. See how there's that big gap around the bottom and nothing around the top? It just sits in there like that, I guess. But I, I don't remember them hanging up on that. And at this point, they, they both run smooth. So if it was a problem on my other two, I can't remember it. So at this point, we're ready to install large primers. So let's go ahead and do that. Grab our primer tray and just slip it in right there. And we just open up the little floodgate and there's our first primer in there ready to go. So the brass, like I said, it just slides up between the jaws. You kind of, you know, you wiggle it in there just a little bit and the jaws end up coming around the case like that. Now I have had people tell me they've had issues with brass like popping out. I don't expect we'll have any problems here with 45 ACP because it's big enough. You know, there's plenty of, uh, spring load there behind it but if you're something really tiny like i don't know in pistol like 25 acp perhaps i'm trying to think back on the video i did on 25 acp whether i use this primer or not i can't remember <laughs> but for the most part i found it to work really good so let's see if this one will go ahead and put a primer in there we go so we just go ahead and squeeze and you know i can feel that everything just lined up and i'm just now starting to actually push the primer in and then you'll reach another point where you can kind of tell the primer has reached the bottom of the cup. And at that point, you just kind of want to make 100% sure that you got there with a little bit of, of a squeeze, and then you're good. So this piece here is primed and looking really good. And the most important thing with putting in primers is uh, you want to make sure they're, they're not standing up. You know, you want to make sure they, they got all the way in there and that they're seated fully. And that generally means they, they lay just below flush on your case head. So just out of habit, whenever I'm priming, usually whenever I finish a case and I'm, you know, put, putting them back in the tray or whatever, I mean, in that same, move, same movement, I will drag my finger across the case head. It's just a habit at this point. And I'm just looking out for any that I didn't get the primer seated fully and might need a little bit more of a squeeze. Let me try and do one of those here real quick. So let's say, all right, so I can feel it. It's going in there. Let's say I just stop right there. Like I, th I think it pretty much got in there, but I never gave it that little bit of an extra squeeze. Actually, I think this one's gonna still be okay. Yep, it sure is. Feels just fine. But if I did want to seat that one a little bit harder, what I would generally do, so there's already a primer in there waiting for the next one. But if whenever I'm doing that next one, yeah, there it went. Yeah, that, that little bit of a, a hang up there is, it's a little bit annoying. We might try and fix that. 
So here's the next primer that I put in and eh, give it just a little bit of an extra squeeze. Now the primer does have a little bit farther to go. The stop is this right here. So I could keep squeezing this until the handle kind of reached the body there, the two silver parts. So you can definitely overdo it, but I like the way the leverage is on this. Like it gives you just the right amount of power to, you know, put it in there, but not, but not overdo it. I forgot what I was doing there. Hold on one second. We're, we're trying to get back to this one. I wanted to seat this one a little bit deeper. So what I would do, so the next one here, so I, I got the primer seated in this one and this one's ready. I would just release the, uh, the hand primer a little bit and pull that guy out. So that guy's good to go. But since I never let go of the handle, the next primer never fit in, All right? You see, so then I can go ahead and take that one that needs a little extra and slide it in there and give it another squeeze. Sometimes I'll, you know, and sometimes I'll do that. Like I mentioned, I, I drag my finger over just about every case that I prime. And every once in a while I'll, I'll hit one that it's like, eh, you know what? I'm going to hit that one again. Just make sure I got it all the way in there. Now, something you're on the lookout for whenever you're priming brass is loose primer pockets, right? That's one of the, the ways that brass wears out is if you're seeing the primer and it's just, it just felt like it went in with uh, little or no resistance, that primer pocket's probably about worn out. So, so far so good with these, you know, it, it's not much resistance, you know, one, one handed, doesn't take much, no grunting involved usually. But when you come across a loose primer pocket, you'll know it. Okay, so I dumped out too many primers. I need to put them back in the box. You know, and there's even one down in the tool there. So step one, get them back in here. You can usually just flip it over and, uh, you know, might have to jiggle the handle and they all, they all fall down inside of there and you're fine. There's no good way to really do this. If it's a small amount like this, I'll usually just uh, kind of open up the tray and just kind of dump them. right in the middle and then they'll uh, eventually find themselves back into a slot. So now let's switch over to small primers and you might be wondering like remember that set screw we put in the side? What the hell was it for? Because we never tightened it up. It's loose right now and actually if we do tighten it up, there we go, tighten that up, our handle doesn't work anymore. So I, as far as I know, I, I could grab the instructions like there's instructions right behind me. I could grab those easily, but I'm pretty sure I'm right here. Screw the instructions. I think it's a, it's like a disassembly aid to where you can collapse the, uh, you know, the handle, tighten this up, and then the tool will stay like this during disassembly. I think that's what that's about. So we take out our little thumb screw and once that's out, this little thing should slide right out. And then this plastic thing, oh, that actually won't slide out because right now we've got the handle locked with this guy in the up, up position and it's going through the plastic. So that's that's locked in there. I don't know what the heck this is for. I, I don't ever use it on mine, so whatever. Maybe we'll just take it out and leave it out. But you can see, as soon as I open that up, they're, uh, they're dropped out our plastic piece. I've never found it like particularly difficult to, uh, you know, hold this while I'm starting up the, uh, the, the screw thingy. Wh whatever, you know what I'm talking about. We're about to remove it, right? This, the punch middle part thing. Yeah, that right there. I've never found it hard to do it while holding this closed. Now the small one, this neato little nut driver we've got down inside of there, which I'm not going to be able to show you, is a, a smaller size, which is the right size for the small tip. So it actually goes down in there. And there it went. Yeah, see? How nifty is that? Then we screw this guy in, snug it up, and we're good. Drop that, put in our plastic piece. I think it goes like that. All right, then we feed the little metal thingy through the plastic piece and then close the handle enough. Oh, I meant to look. Let me let me do that. Let me pull it apart real quick. I want to look and see if there's anything I can do about that part hanging up. I don't think there is. I think I see what's going on. Let's see if we can see it down in there. Probably not, but I got it jiggling back and forth and it really just has to do with the, you know, the angle that this little pushing rod thingy hits the main uh, ram assembly part. There's just enough force to the side there to kind of tilt that up. Hmm. It looks like something, if it ends up being a problem, I might be able to go with this guy with a file just a touch. I think we're good. I'm just going to roll with it and hopefully it'll break in. All right, we're back together and ready to go. So we need, uh, let's see, 357 Magnum. We do have 20 pieces of brass. 
So rather than overfilling our tray like I did last time, this time I'm going to actually try and get the right number of primers in there. There we go. So we just start opening, opening up the package and we expose 20 of them. There they are, 20 primers. And then we just use our tray and flip them right into it. And heck, they're all pointed the right direction and everything. So let's see if we can get the lid on without screwing that up. Okay, get alignment and pop. Man, I can't believe I've done that twice in a row where everything's gone okay. But if you're new to this tool, like uh, don't get frustrated by that part. Sometimes they really do like to get flipped over whenever you're trying to get that lid on. Okay, so onto the tool and we're off and priming. There it is, ready to go. And the, uh, you know, the funky rim on the 357 Magnum fits just fine. Same sort of deal, felt it go in and uh, stop. Still a lot of travel left to work with. Oh yeah, that's just beautiful. So, so far, so good here with this tool. You know what, I'm not having the problem or it's not nearly as bad with this small primer plastic piece. You know what I'm saying, this piece. So I'm wondering if that might be what I need to do is I need to look at exactly where that ram is dragging and hit this guy with a file or something to uh, take off a sharp edge or something perhaps because this one just doesn't seem to be hanging up like we were seeing with the large primer version. So I wanna show you a problem I've had with mine. Like this one seems to be working 100% perfect. Everything's great, but let's switch over to mine real quick. So there's that one. Oh, in the process of dropping this onto mine, the little plastic corner of mine chipped. It might be getting brittle in its old age. It definitely has yellowed quite a lot. Yeah, maybe just a smidgen brittle. All right, so this one is mine. And first thing I want to show you are the differences. Look at mine when I just put that in. My handle is right up against the body. I have run out of useful range here. Now it does feel like the primer is pretty close. Like I'm feeling resistance before I'm hitting the stop. So let's see what it actually looks like. Yep, and of course this one looks perfect. Yeah, that looks just great. Now unfortunately, we might have to wait until the rifle portion of today's video program. Because I know that in some of my rifle cartridges, I end up hitting the stops and the primer is just not quite as far as I want it in there. These are, these are doing okay. Actually, I'll tell you what, let me throw it into the new one real quick. Just to, just to feel if there was any more. Now it feels, it feels like I'm getting them in there and bottoming out. But, you know, you know, here's that view again. Look how much room this one has. So I don't know what part has worn on mine that causes that issue. My first thought is that it's the springs getting weak. And as the springs are maybe getting weak, these are tilting up a little bit more perhaps. But then again, that doesn't really feel like it's happening. Or maybe the jaws have, you know, physically worn down. And I really don't think that's the case. I'll show you what I've done that's been pretty successful since I started running into this problem. So we know, we, you know, we've got our, the ram with the little, uh, yeah, this little part. So what I actually did was took some Loctite and put Loctite on these threads. Then I put the tool together and instead of, you know, screwing it all the way down, I like left it backed out like a half a turn. And that actually worked surprisingly well. I wasn't sure, it was kind of a trial run. I was just using blue Loctite and I thought, well, if this works, I'll just go ahead and get some red Loctite and lock these into place up high. Since, you know, got two tools, don't really swap them out. But it worked really well, and even just the blue Loctite version worked so well that I never ended up kind of really locking them in with red Loctite. So this guy came loose without too much trouble. So I don't know, I guess keep an eye out on that. If I could figure out what part it was, RCBS would probably send me one. I mean, the only other option would be down here, you know, where this part contacts the, you know, the ram that travels up and down the body. I can't imagine any of that would have worn enough to be affecting the height of the ram stroke. I'm still, you know, I'm still suspecting this, this spring assembly may be getting weak over time. So one more quick note about the priming tool before we move on to powder. It's just, I wanna mention that, you know, none of the stuff in the kit comes in, 
you know, retail packaging. And that can be a little bit annoying because, you know, with our hand priming tool, we've got these fiddly little parts that we need to keep track of. And that, that pops up a couple times, you know, here and there. But I guess if, you know, if you're already a, a gun guy, you're kind of used to that sort of stuff, you know, but I definitely struggle staying organized. So I thought I would bring it up. Okay. Let's weigh out some powder. Yeah, this is a pretty big topic here because we need to we need to cover our powder measure and our scale. Yep, and our scale and our freaking trickler. So this is going to be a lot to talk about. Let's let's start out with the the powder measure because we need to tear this guy apart and degrease it first. So yeah, let's do that. Okay, so step one with the powder measure already happened off camera. It actually came out of the box in pieces, which. Uh, can't I can't remember exactly why I put it together, but whatever, I did. But it comes as a box of parts with some assembly required. So I am currently using the included Allen wrench set to take it back apart. And I just dropped a screw a second ago. There we go. So as, as we go, I'm probably going to be comparing this guy with my original Uniflow. Or this is, I think this is a Uniflow 2. And the new guy is the Uniflow 3. So I'm pretty big design changes. Like, yeah, pretty, pretty different. First of which you already saw the, the hopper, you know, the, this part right here that we easily screwed off on the old version. This is actually pressed in and I did have this break on me and RCBS sent me a new one and had to press that back in. So I do have the, uh, the baffle. They call this the baffle. And I have no idea whether this works with this one. Yeah, it looks like it would work in this one as well. So what a baffle is used for is whenever you've got the hopper full of powder, like let's say we got this guy completely full, you can imagine the, uh, you know, the, the weight of the entire column of powder is resting down. There we go here. Yeah, that's where the hopper looks down. Of course, everything's black under there, whatever, but it's basically just a funnel into a rotating portion here where your powder gets measured. So as you might imagine, as the powder level in your hopper drops toward the bottom and the, you know, the amount of weight in that column of powder changes, your charge weights can end up drifting. So that's what the, the baffle is meant to be, is it just kind of breaks that so that there's always a consistent amount of powder below the hopper in the system, right? So as long as you keep it filled up above, above there, you're always going to have consistent, consistent throws from your powder measure, or at least that's the thought. So as you see, I do have the baffle. They are, they're not expensive. They're two or $3 or something or $4. So I don't know if we'll use this today. Maybe, probably not. But then again, we're not really loading enough rounds today to where I could show you its advantage or disadvantage, right? We can't really evaluate it when we're loading 10 or 20 rounds at a time. So it honestly doesn't matter. Okay, so now with the, the body of the guy here, it, is, uh, it comes with this little lock ring here. So with the body of our powder measure here, to remove this, uh, this metering assembly, metering insert part, we remove this screw over here on the left. And it's one of uh, those sorts of screws. And I remember whenever I was first putting it together, it did take me a minute to get everything lined up and get this guy back, you know, where it needed to be to screw in there. So, but yeah, it should go in easily. And if it doesn't, you got something screwed up. But as soon as we take that out, this entire part right here comes out. There it is. And then the, the drum actually comes out. So you can see that cavity there and the hole up there to your hopper. Not, not, not exactly the most complicated thing, right? So that's all this guy does is move this little stopper up and down. And doing that just changes the volume of this little cavity right here. I mean, that's it. This little part fills up with powder, the drum rotates, and then it dumps it out into your case or measuring pan. Now, the reason we took this all apart wasn't just for, you know, to see how it works, but you might be able to see it is covered in Earl and you will find that anything that powder touches needs to be completely stripped of oil and 
powder likes to stick to stuff like this plastic hopper i can already tell you powder is going to stick to this thing like you know static clinging sort of stuff it's going to be awful but that goes away so even if i don't get to kind of show you a powder measure that doesn't stick a bunch of powder i can tell you for certain this one doesn't and it's got years of uh powder dust and crap which cures all of that. Now, there are some things you can do. So we'll, we'll strip all the oil off of this guy and I'll, I'll, I'll go get a dryer sheet. A lot of people recommend you wipe stuff down with a dryer sheet, try and get some static stuff off of it. My grandfather used to have a dryer sheet around the outside of his measure with a rubber band around it. Like it's, it's a thing and it's extremely annoying. All right, so to degrease these guys, what I'm gonna use is some uh, 99 percent isopropyl alcohol this stuff dries almost instantly we're not going to have to worry about you know waiting for everything to dry in the past i've used brake parts cleaner that seems to work okay or a lower concentration isopropyl like you know 70 percent whatever would be fine you just need to give it some additional time to uh to dry i actually started buying this uh 99 percent alcohol off of amazon it's just about impossible to find locally in my area it comes in handy pretty often. And actually, the last time I ordered it, I got uh, I got like a pack of three of these gigantic bottles. I think this is like a liter, about 950 milliliters. And I think this is actually 99.9%. But it wasn't terribly expensive, and it's handy to have around. You can also pick up some liquid lanolin, and that makes a nice case lube. So once we move on to rifle stuff, and we're having to lubricate our cases for sizing... We'll see how good this, you know, this RCBS stuff is, this stuff right here. But I can tell you it's going to, it's expensive, right? These bottles of, of case lube from any of the companies are going to be a lot more expensive than mixing up your own lanolin stuff. Okay, so I have carefully torn apart and degreased every single part. And just to be clear, I'm going to do this one time. Like this is the only time I'm ever going to clean this powder measure like this. Because like I said, you really almost want a little fine powder dust buildup coating all of the surfaces that interact with powder because it's really the only way to get these things to uh, to stop sticking a couple things that come in the kit there's two of these little like nozzle deals that screw into the bottom of the powder measure so here's my old one and this like i had forgotten there was even a second nozzle this is the only one that i ever use and I'm pretty sure it's going to be the small one. Grab the two new ones there. Yeah, so my existing one, the small one, is the one that I've always used. And I've never, ever run into issues where I thought I needed the large one. So I'm going to install the small one, and we're just going to roll with it unless I come up with a reason why I might need the, uh, the bigger one. Can't imagine what that might be. Oh, I'll tell you what, let me grab a dryer sheet. Yeah, these are just, you know, standard dryer sheets. You guys have these everywhere in the world? What I'm going to do is just everything that's going to have contact with powder, I'm just going to wipe it down with this. Yeah, down there, maybe just a little. Because this does, it leaves a, it's a waxy sort of crap that it does leave behind. I don't know if that's even the, like the, the part that's responsible for static or if that's just the, just the like perfumes and crap. I don't really know. Got to be honest with you. This really doesn't work all that well anyway. It kind of works a little bit. It's better than nothing. Like when you do nothing, it can be awfully bad. But if someone was to tell me I was imagining it, that it doesn't actually help, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't fight them very hard. So the way I use a powder measure in my normal loading is anytime I'm using a ball powder, like a spherical powder, if you guys are new, a couple different kind of styles of powder two main ones one is just generically ball powder or spherical powder those are the tiny little granules and there's also extruded powder that are kind of like little sticks now more in the pistol world than the rifle world we've got we've got flake powders which we're actually going to shoot a flake powder i wanted to see how a flake powder worked in this powder measure i expect it to do pretty good so if i'm running a flake powder or a ball powder i will use a powder measure. If I'm running an extruded powder, I will not because it just doesn't work very well. And I'll show you that here in a little bit whenever we get to rifle, to the rifle powder. Some of those are extruded powders. We'll, we'll try it out. But what happens 
is, you know, so our powder is up here in the hopper, looking down here at our rotating drum. So the open area in the drum fills with, you know, fills with powder. And then as the drum rotates, it shears, kind of a, yep, a shearing sort of action against this surface right here. So sometimes those sticks in your extruded powders will get hung up and you either have to jiggle on the handle of the powder measure to get it to go, or you just need to push harder. So it actually cuts that piece of powder in half. So, you know, a standard powder measure like this is just something I never use with extruded powders. So if you're getting this kit, you're going to be shooting, you know, rifle, most precision rifle loads are, are, are done with stick powders with, with, uh, extruded powders. So you might find this measure just kind of collecting dust for you. But for ball powders in pistol, it's great. And that's what we're doing right now. So let's get on with it. Let me try and, I think I went the wrong way with the drum. It's a pretty tight fit here, as you might imagine. Okay, maybe it does go in this side. Yeah, there it goes. Didn't want to force it. And let's see, I did take this thing apart. This is our adjustment thing. I should have paid more attention to how it went together. I think it's like this. Yeah, there it is right there. And then it's got something of a lock ring here like that. Okay. So hopefully this will, I, well, we need to, yeah, we need to make sure this is going the right direction. I think we want it like that. Yes, we do. This side is where our insert goes. And I guess this hole on either side is what the tip of our little brass screw is going into, I reckon. So let's see if we can get that into there. Okay. And then looking through, through the side, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing here. Yeah, I think that's pretty close. And then that goes in there. Yeah, until it lines up, it's, it, it's not going. You're not going to force it. Come on. There it goes. Yep, when it goes, it goes. So there's that. And I guess, oh, I meant to check this guy out, which I forgot to wipe this guy off. This, this is apparently for emptying the powder measure. You take out this guy. I guess you kind of flip it up, pull this guy out, put this guy in, and then drop it, and you can empty the powder measure. We'll try that out whenever we get to the point where we need to empty it. Because uh, with my old one, <laughs> I mean, I would just take the entire powder measure out and flip it upside down and then bang it on the counter to get the old powder out. Like that was kind of my cleaning routine because, you know, this is pressed on, so you can't really get access way down in there. Occasionally I would hit it with like a long brush or whatever, but not very often. It was usually just banging, <laughs> banging it on the counter. And that's how I broke the hopper on the first one. And I remember calling RCBS. I told him like, listen, I broke this hopper. <laughs> I'm banging on my counter to empty it. And they, uh, yeah, still sent me one for free. But I, I like the new way better. And let's see, that little guy there. We'll put that to the side. Lock ring. I'll tell you what we'll do first. Let's look at this goofy uh, press mount thingy. This, where, where the hell did it go? Yeah, this thing right here. Like what in the, I've never, I've never even tried it with my old one because my original one, here's the one that came with my, <laughs> it's a little bit, a uh, little bit of rust. I never take care of my things. It's awful. But uh, yeah, I never even tried that one out. You can see there's not even any, there's no marks or <laughs> anything where I'd, uh, I don't know. Somehow it goes on the press and it looks like it's going to be pretty annoying. All right. There's our handle. There's our hopper. There's the lid for our hopper. One thing I, th I found funny looking at the, uh, the hopper caps, the markings are identical. Mine's gotta be, I don't know, 15 years old or so. So that's a pretty, it's a pretty long going partnership there with stock cap, two and three eighths. I don't know. I, I don't know why I thought that was funny. Whatever. Saw them laying there. I'm like, dang, those are exactly the same. All right, let's uh, see if this thing works. All right, I don't know how well this camera angle is going to work out. We'll see, whatever. So our little goofy wrench looking thing, there's one side of it that is threaded. I have to assume that goes on the bottom. No, that, 
I should get the instructions. I will here in just a second. But here, we'll put it, put it together how I think it might go together. Okay, so there's your powder measure on your on your little thingy. And then we just, yep, here's a here's a die. It's our mighty armory decapping die. So I think then I put this under there and just screw a die down on top of it. Adjust the arm where I want it. And uh, yeah, tighten down your die. And then this lock ring tightens against this. And we're rocking and rolling on the side of our press. That actually doesn't seem too bad. And this mighty armory decapping die has the dinkiest little locking ring you ever saw in your life. So it's holding it very securely. Now let me grab the instructions, see if I did that correctly. So I didn't really find any specific instructions in the manual for this. It was a little vague, but that's fine. But I think what I got here is it's, it's working. Like it, it seems very, uh, sturdy and stable i could see this you know being a usable setup especially i guess you could just go ahead and install like your bullet seating die and if you got set up you know you grab your your case you dump your charge and then you immediately seat your bullet and bam you're done i could see that maybe working out but so i'm glad i opened the instructions because man we got a whole there's a break-in procedure and everything for this guy and a lot of generally just kind of good information they do mention that it is imperative that the device be disassembled and cleaned and cleaned and dried thoroughly, as previously mentioned, to ensure all residual oil, rust preventative, or moisture has been removed. It's important as any oil or moisture will attract and hold powder, causing inaccurate dispensed charge weights. It is also recommended to wipe down any plastic components with a dryer sheet or an anti-static spray to eliminate an, uh, any static charge that is built up on the plastic components which can attract and hold powder. How about that? It's right there in the instructions. This part was the most interesting to me. Before using UPM3, which is, stands for the Uniflow Powder Measure 3, before using it to reload actual cartridges, we need to condition the powder measure. To do this, set the powder measure for the maximum charge by rotating the cylinder bushing assembly clockwise. This will advance the metering screw outward until it reaches the end of its travel. So it's wanting us to adjust this for maximum charge. All right, so our lock nut is loose. So the little pokey stick in there, we want it all the way back. So the, the chamber, the powder chamber is as big as it possibly could be. So I think we'll go this way, which should start making that longer. Look at it. How about that? Okay, just bottomed out. Maybe I'll back off of there a little. I don't know. And tighten that guy. Sweet. So next step is to fill the powder hopper. So we remove our cap and dump in our powder. We'll go ahead and fill it all the way up. So they want us to run this whole powder measure through, let's see, the Uniflow holds approximately a half pound of powder, so do this twice, so a total of one pound of powder has been metered through the powder measure. Doing this will deposit a thin film of graphite on the internal features, allowing the powder to flow more evenly and smoothly, resulting in a more consistent metered charges. Sweet! I'll tell you what, this mount actually works out well, because I can fit the, uh, the, the powder, which we're going to use Winchester 296 here for the first test. This is a classic ball powder. This powder should give us the very best performance with this powder measure. So if we can't get consistent charge weights or whatever with Winchester 296, we're in trouble. So with this sort of setup, I can basically have the uh, powder canister right under here and go ahead and run through this. This isn't going to take long because this uh, powder measure, you know, whenever it's cranked all the way out like this, throws a really big charge. Like, I bet this is 100 grains of powder at a time. So th this process should go pretty darn quick. Okay, we're already coming up on empty here on the first hopper full. 
which to be honest, I might actually go ahead and just do this three or four times or something. Yeah, empty right there. Fill it back up again. Yeah, that's what I'll do. So let me do this a couple more times and then I wanna move the powder measure over to our stand that we're gonna actually use, or at least we'll use it during the, uh, the scale testing and you know, whenever things are about to get crazy here when we're trying to eval evaluate a scale and a powder measure at the same time. So maybe we'll go back to this mount afterwards. Like, like I mentioned, I think it would be a good setup with the seating die as long as the threads were long enough and you could get everything set up just right. I don't see why it wouldn't work. Throw your charge, seat your bullet. Might speed things up nicely. Or maybe you don't have room for a stand, you know? This seems like a pretty good alternative. Okay, so our powder measure is mounted up. It's full of powder, it's ready to go. And it's time we start weighing some stuff. So I've got our, I've got our shiny new RCBS scale. This did come with batteries. Yep, a lot of the Chinese scales come with these exact same types of batteries. Just to be 100% certain, I'm going to go ahead and swap the batteries. And I've got another scale here that we're going to use for comparison. I'm going to swap the batteries in it as well. Got some nice fresh Duracells here. Those, those ought to do the trick. And what I'm going to do is turn on these two scales and let them warm up for a little while before we start messing with them. Probably turn on a YouTube video, 15, 20 minutes, something like that, just to make sure that they have plenty of time to get up to temperature before we go calibrating anything or, or whatever. So, all right, I'll see you guys in about 15 minutes. Okay, so it's actually been about an hour since I turned this thing on. It's actually been 35 minutes since the last time I turned it off. I was trying to figure out how long it takes this thing to shut itself off. We'll get to that here in just one second. So this form factor might be pretty familiar. I'm gonna kind of move this out of the way real quick. Yeah, does this look uh, pretty similar? Yep, pretty darn similar. So a while back, I ordered a bunch of different scales off of Amazon, and this was one I had ordered. But I tested four or five in this exact same form factor, this clamshell form factor, and had a wide variety of experiences with them. This reloader one was the best, but it was also by far the most expensive. But there was another brand that looked pretty much identical to this. Like I think the designs and markings were, were pretty close on the outside, and I just I don't have any more of them. I ended up getting rid of them because I had too many scales laying around. So I'm not sure what point I'm trying to make. I guess I'm just saying like, you know, this is a similar scale to what we're seeing on Amazon coming out of China right now. But even scales that look identical often work very different. So I'm going into this scale with an open mind. The, the first thing you might notice, well, earlier I had this on here. I had it zeroed with the, uh, with the calibration weight, which, yep, calibration weight sits right there. Nice little package. So let me go ahead and hit the tear button, which should zero this guy. And what I've found so far with this scale is just sitting here, it just will not hold a solid zero. It's drifting back and forth, and it does this pretty much nonstop. And we had opened this up and played around with it on a live stream on Twitch a while back, and we were seeing this exact same sort of deal. So earlier, when I was warming it up, I thought, well, maybe, uh, maybe the load cell needs a little bit of weight on it, and that would, you know, chill it out, make it... Uh, stabilize a little bit better. So that's why I had the calibration weight sitting in the middle when I turned the camera on. So let's tear it there. And it does seem to help a little bit. So like with the weight on there, it seems a little bit more stable. So, you know, I'm, I may have just got a, a bad scale. The scale did come uh, packaged with, it's got a, like a little uh, cardboard sort of thing that goes between the, uh, you know, the load pad which I recently learned is called a platen. I think this, I guess this would be the, uh, the platen. It, it's, it was sandwiched between the body of the scale and that, you know, to protect the load cell during shipment and all of that was in place. Everything looked completely fine. So not really sure what the heck's going on here. Now, the other thing to be certain of, you know, I do, I have the, the windows closed. I've got the vents closed in this room. You know, sometimes air currents can make a scale bounce around a little bit. I do have a fluorescent light overhead let me bump into the tripod and see if I can unplug this dude. Okay, there's the overhead light turned off. So let's just watch it for a second. It's still kind of just drifting. Yeah, so that, that doesn't seem to have made any difference. It, it would have surprised me if it did because, you know, like I said, I've tested a million scales under this set of lights and it's never given me any problems. They are, you know, the, the light is pretty high above the bench and stuff. So, yep, it would have surprised me. And just to give you an idea, you know, here's... 
another scale. This is actually a scale I really like that I, I use a lot. So let's, uh, I don't know, hit tear again. I don't know. See, I, I just, I can't get it to, to sit still. It will not keep a consistent reading. And this is not an insignificant amount of weight. You know, especially with a pistol charge, you know, two tenths of a grain or four tenths of a grain, like right now where it's drifted, is a lot. Like it's a lot. So I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and run through the calibration. And I don't know, should we tell you what, just for just for the heck of it, we'll, we'll go ahead and use the pan. So we'll we'll tear it with the pan and we'll calibrate it with the pan. So what we want to do, the, the button on the right is the mode button. So let's press and hold this guy and it comes up and says cal. And then I think we hit it again and it starts blinking 50. This is our 50 uh, gram check weight or our calibration weight. And then it says pass. So before I removed the calibration weight, you know, still just finished the calibration, just kind of wanted to sit here and watch the numbers and it is bouncing around. I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Like th this can't be normal, right? There's no way the scale made it through their testing and stuff and got approved if this is normal operation. So I think I just got a bad scale. We're going to try and we're going to try and go ahead and use it, but I'll probably weigh pretty much everything on both scales just to be safe. So let's tear that guy. All right. So that's zeroed out. This guy's already zeroed. Did I already talk earlier about uh, having a set of check weights? I consider this absolutely necessary because like, so, so that the calibration we just did, I pretty much never calibrate my scales. Almost never. Usually it's, it's as a demo in a video just to show how it's done. Usually turn it on, let it warm up, and then I'll run through my check weights to make sure. Let's start with a couple of 20s here real quick. So this is a 20 grain check weight, and you'll see 20.0. Let's put it over here on uh, this little bouncy boy and see if it'll calm down and give us a reading. Okay, 20.1. Let's put a... Put a 20 back on that guy. See so it just randomly switches over to 19.8. Then 20.1, 20.2. Like this is no, this is not suitable for, for reloading. And this is like, I'm not, you know, filming an hour here to get this footage. It's just, it's in nearly real time, right? You don't have to wait long. This thing just bounces all over the place and it's almost constant. So I don't know, you know, we got tried fresh batteries, tried turning off everything. I actually took the scale into another room and fired it up just to, to try that. I think I just got a bad one. So if you buy this kit, you end up getting fed up with this scale. You know, there's a lot of it depends on what you're looking to do. If you're primarily reloading for long range precision rifle stuff, then maybe you want to spend five, $600 on a laboratory balance to make sure you can reliably and repeatably you know, measure your powder down to a single granule. Maybe that's important to you. In that case, that's worth every penny. This scale here, which is the one I use in most of my videos, I actually kind of like the, the screens tilted. It's a little bit easier to get on camera. So this one shows up in videos a lot and it's never done anything weird on me. So I'm really happy with it. It's that same reloader brand. So this is like the reloader marksman. I'll throw some links down in the description. I'll have, I'll have a bunch of links in the description. There's another one that I had bought yeah, the True Way Lux, which is the exact same scale. It's just this came in the with the reloader branding and it came with a, a pretty nice powder pan. And these are in the $35 range the last time I checked. So we're not talking about a ton of money, but if 30 or 40 bucks is still more than you want to spend, you can get this one. I had a lot of luck with this one and you can find these for like 15 bucks or at least you, you could. I haven't checked on this one in, in a little while. Now, unfortunately, I don't know of any good middle ground. Like these, you know, I would consider these cheap Amazon scales. There's no kind of like middle point where you, you know, you don't want to spend five, six, seven hundred dollars on a crazy expensive scale, but you know, you want something a little bit better than a $25 Amazon scale. There's not really, I don't have a good recommendation for you. Unless you want to get a powder dispenser, like the RCBS Charge Master Lite, which we're going to talk about that whenever we get to rifle reloading. I want to show it as kind of an alternative. So we'll have a look at that. The scale in that unit does a really good job. So you can kind of get one of those. You have the, the powder dispensing capabilities of it and you also have the built, you know, the scale for just general purpose use as well. But no matter what you do, just buy yourself a set of freaking check weights. Here's another 10 grains 
on this scale, 30.0. Let's move it over to this scale. It reads 30.1 for the time being. There it goes. Here's another 5.0 grains. Now this guy does some time, like I just put on a two grain check weight. This should be reading 22.0. Occasionally it'll give me, a, give me a funky reading if I lift it back off and set it back down. A lot of times it'll pick it up. Yeah, I picked it up right that time. Here's two more. Same sort of deal, and especially with, with small changes, like once you get down to the, the two and the one grain check weights, the small changes can be a bit of a pain in the butt. So here's a half grain, so 0.5. It eventually got there, and that's 1.0. So that's, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Something that's not bouncing around, <laughs> and something that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. This one seems accurate, like I, it's reading about the right numbers, but bouncing around by multiple tenths of a grain, is not cool, man. Not cool at all. And there's 0.5. So it's reading right, you know, like it's reading 60.5, but bouncing around like that makes it almost unusable. Okay, what, what's next? Oh, one thing I want to show you, which maybe I screwed it up. So we, we already saw that if we push and hold the mode button, it goes into calibration. If, uh, I don't know if I've tried the on button. Let's see if I push and hold this, if it does anything. Nope, nothing on the way off. Let's try it on the way on. Yep, I think it just sits there like that until you remove the press and then it boots up like normal if I'm not mistaken. Yep, that's what it did. Now this last guy, the tear button, if you press and hold tear, it comes up to this. See where it says 3600. And if you scroll through, there's a 300, is that 1800, 3600, and zero. So that's what I was testing before I turned the camera on. I think this is changing the auto off timer. I know some other scales, a very similar menu to this changes it. The problem is the scale drifts so much that whenever I was trying to test the auto off, sometimes it wouldn't go off, but I think that's because the scale drifted so much that it basically woke itself up. It canceled the timer and started over the count. So I got it to turn itself off twice and both times it was on the, where'd it go? the 300 setting and it shut off after five minutes. So I think this is seconds and I think five minutes is the shortest auto off you can have. The next thing I did was uh, switch it up to, uh, yeah, 3600, tried it there and that's when uh, I first started recording and it had been on for a little over a half hour. This is the setting it was on and it never shut itself off. So I think that's what this hidden menu here is. It's not in the instructions. It's not in the documentation. So I have to assume zero uh, disables auto off perhaps. I don't know. We'll try that. We'll set it to zero and then we'll just leave it on and see what happens. So once you get the setting you want, if you press the on off, it'll actually say pass and then it shuts off and then you can flip it back on. So, all right. So that's our scales. So far, not looking good. So let's start measuring out some charges from our powder measure. Okay, so I got sidetracked. These have been on for another half hour, uh, probably 45 minutes. And this one never did auto off. So whether the drifting is keeping it awake or whether changing the setting that we changed made the difference, I don't know. The bouncing around is only worse right now than it was. So we may end up just yeeting this, this thing out the freaking window. I don't know that getting frustrated over a bad scale is going to provide any value. You know what I'm saying? All right. Both scales are zeroed with the pan, you know, so with the same pan, very important. Let's see if this pan is big enough to hold the max charge out of this, uh, out of this powder measure. Oh, and, uh, by the way, your pan is another, uh, thing you got to worry about with stickage, but, like I think I was telling you earlier, that's why I love these RCBS pans. This anodized gold color sort of stuff has never given me any sticking problems. So, all right, let's see. Oh yeah, no problem. Let's see what that weighs. 108.8. And the RCBS scale agrees. And then it jumped. 
all the way down to point four and then back to point eight and then up to point nine and yeah next one is 105.5 now that uh what was the first one 108 or something like that so pretty so the second charge was much lighter than the first you'll find that a lot whenever you let your powder measure sit for a while you know obviously the powder is going to settle and that charge weight is just going to keep going up so anytime you come to a powder measure either whether you just filled it up or whether you've had it sitting for a while you want to run you know 10 charges through it before you even really start messing with your adjustments all right let's see that one's 105.4 Let's take a couple more here. One hundred five point five, one hundred five point. Who knows what the hell is going on? Yeah, I tell you what. Let's let's forget about this stupid scale for right now. Maybe we'll mess around with it later. I really want to focus on the powder measure. Uh, where were we at? One hundred five point five or something like that. <laughs> I think it was. Next one's 105.5 is 105.6. And the next one is 105.6. So you can see already, even with a gigantic charge like that, getting really consistent numbers. And like I'd said earlier, you know, this Winchester 296 is pretty much the perfect, the perfect type of powder for this sort of setup. Like I can get extremely consistent numbers with a powder measure throwing powders of this shape. And the most important thing when using a powder measure is consistent movements. Like if you want to, you know, if you want to slowly bring the handle up to the top of the stroke and then bring it down, that's fine. But you just, you need to do that every single time. So that charge I just threw was 104.9. So like a half grain lighter than the consistent charges we were throwing earlier, right? And that's just because that time I was much easier with the handle. Let me see how heavy a charge I can get. Well, let's tell you what, let's do one more kind of light one where it's just, you know, bring the handle up to the top, wait for it to finish, and then bring it down. Just very, very easy. You know, you don't have any anger issues. Everything's good in your life. You don't have anything to take out on your powder measure, that sort of stroke. So this next one was 105.0. So I'm about a half grain lighter than I was with the ones I was throwing earlier. Now, let me try something different this time. So what I wanna do is uh, kinda of bang around on it and beat on it and see what sort of number we get. So like, taps at the bottom, taps at the top. That was 109.6. I'm thinking the next one might, might not be quite that high and I'll tell you here in just a second. So kinda of bang it, bang it a couple times. I think I ended up dumping some of the powder out. Nope, that one's also 109.1. So that's a that's a very big difference. Now this last one was kind of my standard stroke, the way I normally do it. I do a little tap at the bottom, do an extra tap at the top. And that one came out to 107.6. Let's throw a couple more. That one's also 107.6. Next one's 107.7. So hopefully the, the point I'm trying to make here is obvious. That one's 107.5. So now I'm throwing consistent charge weights with the latest consistent technique I was using, you know, with my, what I said was my standard way. But the more aggressive tapping was all the way up to 109, and then the, the slow movements were down at 105.5. So if you're not getting consistent results from your powder measure, that's what it's about. It's your technique. You need to just build a little bit of muscle memory and have a standard way that you throw. And over time, you know, your charge weights will get more and more consistent and you'll be throwing good numbers. Let me show you something real close. All right, I'm not sure what you'll be able to see here, but let's let's take it the easy way. So here's like 
handle up nice and easy, you know, out comes our powder charge, and then down nice and easy. So that one's probably down in the 105 range. Yeah, 104.8. Now let me dump that charge out of there. And, you know, we got us a nice clean pan. But if I put the pan under here right now and just tap on this a couple times, see if I can get you a look. Yeah, there you go. Do you see that? That is a not insignificant amount of powder that was stuck to the powder measure up inside of here. You know, I can tell you that's probably, you know, three tenths, four tenths of, uh, of a grain of powder. So that's the main reason why, you know, at the bottom of the stroke, I always give that extra tap just to make sure there's no uh, either powder stuck or with some powders, especially, you know, the larger extruded powders, when you run them through one of these powder measures, you can have powder bridging. You know, think of, think of that as like, you know, the nozzle gets clogged up just, you know, with the larger clumps of powders, that would be a powder bridge. So that's why you'll see me, you know, maybe being a little bit more aggressive with the powder measure than you might see out of other people. But hey, my charges are pretty consistent. So let's see if we can dial in our adjustment here. So let's see, right now we're throwing what, 110 grains. Let's see if we can dial in 75. So we're gonna be moving this guy a lot. I think usually one rotation is a couple of grains. So we probably need, I don't know, a bunch. Let's just, uh, let's just start cranking on it. Let's see, so I think this is, yeah, that's the, the rough adjustment. It does have this little scale on here. Uh, not sure how useful that's gonna be yet. Tell you what, let's try it right there and see what we get. And that's another thing I didn't realize. So whenever you wanna make adjustments, you need to loosen up the brass you know, screw on the side. It does actually go in and kind of hold the uh, little plunger thing in place, I guess. I don't know. All right, so we just made an adjustment. So these first couple throws are gonna be worthless. But we still wanna use, you know what I just realized? The stupid screws I've got holding this down are coming loose. It's like, man, this thing's like wobbling around. All right, let me fix that. I'll be right back. All right, so that first charge was 77.8. So we're pretty close to our 75 target. Now my stand is, uh, yeah, on there a little bit better. Let's throw us another one. That one is 77.1. Okay, so yeah, we're really close. Like really, really close. Let's throw one more. Oh, pretty big jump there, 75.3. Let's throw a couple more. Make sure we got this thing settled down before we go making any more adjustments. Okay, that, that one's also 75.4. I don't think anything moved on me. I guess it was just a matter of, you know, getting this thing primed and flowing the way it wanted to. Okay, next one's 75.3. Okay, so now we're throwing consistent. Now here's my question. So this, this big course adjustment knob, how much would it change? So how much would one complete turn change? So we know we're just over 75. We're throwing 75.3 right now. So let's go ahead and I guess crack that loose. And it looks like it's got four marks on it. Oop, need to loosen my brass one as well. Okay, so there's one. Or hang on, so as I'm turning this, the rod was moving around as well. Like I had originally had it to where I could see this. Now I guess I could just turn the stupid rod. That might be the easier way to adjust this thing. Yeah, let's just do that. So let's just circle this thing around. All right, there's one full turn. Let's see what our numbers look like now. Where we were, we were 75.3 last time. This first one's probably useless, but it's 73.3. Okay, next one's 71.2. Next one's 71.2. Okay, it looks like, so if we're gonna be 71.2, so is that like 4.1 grains difference? So, how, you know, how much that changes will depend on the density of the powder and whatnot, but at least here for a pretty fine ball powder, one full turn was about four grains. Good, that one's 71.0. All right, so I'm pretty happy with the consistency so far with large charge weights, 
But this, this Winchester 296, this is what we're going to shoot in 357 Magnum. Our charge weight is going to be much lower. So I'll tell you what, let's see how low can we go with this. Because, so the old Uniflow had di different inserts for pistol and rifle. I'm trying to remember which one I've got, but I use it for both and it works fine. But apparently they had, you know, kind of special ones for larger or smaller charge weights with the last generation. So this one's supposed to do it all and do it all well. So let's see how light we can go. Now it does warn you in the manual that apparently it'll allow you to adjust this, you know, farther than you need to. So if we screw this in far enough, the whole mechanism might lock up because the plunger has gone out the other end and is interfering with the, I guess the main chassis on the other side. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> it mentioned that in the manual that if you know if if you feel it dragging on the handle, back it out just a little bit more until the handle moves freely. So apparently we should be able to go about that far with it kind of running out of space here to grab with my fingers. Just make sure we're, yeah, we're still <laughs> moving. I just dumped powder straight onto my bench. That wasn't all that smart. All right, still going. All right, I've gone as far as I possibly can here. And it feels like it's still able to move. But you can see the, the little plunger thing is barely flush here. The lock ring barely has a hold of anything. So let's see what sort of charge weight this gives us. Just gonna run a couple through here real quick. Okay, let's start measuring. Yeah, that's, uh, that still looks like a halfway decent charge. That's probably four or five grains. Uh, yeah, that's not nearly low enough. That's 8.6 grains. We need to be able to go a good bit lower than that. Yep, next one was 8.6. Okay, so what am I missing here on the adjustment of this thing? Okay, so after removing that lock screw, I think now I've got it to the point where, like I'm feeling it drag. Let me move the camera. There we go. Now I'm feeling it drag on something, which doesn't feel good. Just want to slowly move it out. Still a little bit of a little bit of drag there. Okay, now it's clear. Go back. Okay, so it's dragging there and it's not dragging there. So we'll go with that and see what that gets us. Which now that I pull my head out of my butt, I guess so the the flat part of that rod where the writing is, where we were, you know, looking at the scale needs to be pointing that direction because this goes down and uh, holds it in place, right? You get what I'm saying? Yep, that, that little thing there. Okay. Now that's more like it. Hardly anything in there. Yeah, that is 1.7 grains. Next one, 1 1.6 grains. And the next one, 1 1.6 grains. That one's 1 1.6 grains. Okay, so seems to be throwing very consistently on the low end here. All the way down here to 1.6 grains. So that's smaller than anything you're going to need, most likely, unless you're shooting something really weird. So let's actually dial in our real charge weight and get ready to actually throw some charges. I guess the first thing we need to do is pick a charge weight real quick. So Winchester 296, this is going to be for 357 Magnum, and we are shooting that 158 grain Hornady hollow point. Let's have a quick look in the manual. All right, so picking out your charge weights can be a really, really confusing process. And we're not, I'm not gonna cover this for every single round we're gonna to load today, but at least for this first one here, I'll show you kind of my reference sources. So we're shooting Winchester 296, and we're shooting the Hornady 158 grain XTP, right? So if we look in our spear manual that came with our kit, We've got something pretty darn close with the spear jacketed hollow point, 158 grainer, or here's a jacketed soft point, whatever, you know, a couple similar bullets. And our powder list does include Winchester 296. They show a maximum charge of 14.7 grains. So they show 13.2 up to 14.7. Now, if I look in the Hornady manual, here we go. This is the Hornady 10th edition they show a maximum charge of 16.0. So that is significantly higher. So 14.7 from Spear and 16.0 from Hornady. So whenever I see two sources like that, that are that far apart, I'll generally go to a third. So I went to the Hodgton manual. So Hodgton owns the Winchester brand of powders and the IMR line of powders and all of their low data is available on their website. So they show the highest max charge yet of 16.7.
And the Hodgson data is specifically for this 158 grain Hornady XTP. So, I mean, it's even funnier. You look on the Hodgson website, they show a starting load of 15.0 grains. And often with reloading it, you know, it's as important not to go too low as it is not to go too high. Low can be just as dangerous, right? I mean, there's a safe window for most powder and bullet combinations, and you don't want to stray too far from that. So this, you know, this is a particularly confusing situation. And in, you know, in a situation like this, I've got to go with the bullet manufacturer of the actual bullet I'm shooting, which is Hornady, and the actual powder I'm shooting, which is Winchester, you know, so both of them have data for this combination specifically, you know, so the spear data, although it's close, as far as, you know, bullet style, if I, I look, this one has the recommended overall length is 20,000 shorter than the Hornady. I don't know. I don't have any of the spear bullets on hand to compare the, the length of the bullets and stuff. All of that can make a difference and change pressures. Now, another thing to keep in mind, so this, this load with 357 Magnum, we're going to shoot it both in my revolver and also in my, in my Henry carbine. So both of these manuals, so the spear and the Hornady, have a set a separate section of 357 Magnum data in the rifle section. And those numbers are a little bit different between, between the two. So what I've decided to go with is 15.0. So it looks like it's a little bit high if we only go by the spear manual, but I guess the lesson I'm trying to get, give you here is you need more sources of load data. I pretty much never rely on just one. You know, sometimes that's all you have to work with. You know, you look around and you just can't find anything more than one source. And then you just have to use your, you know, your own good judgment and experience and what you know about that bullet and powder and that gun to make an educated guess. But usually you can get pretty close. And, you know, even, even though I know, you know, I've shot this load before, everything went fine, everything's good. It's still going to be in my mind as, as we go along and as I'm out on the range and stuff like, man, Spear thought this was kind of going to be hot. So we'll be on the lookout. That's all we can do is just be on the lookout. We're going to look at our brass out on the range and make sure we're not seeing pressure signs, but I think we'll be just fine. And if you're, you know, if you're new to this, this is not as dire as I might make it sound. We're not going to blow up one of my guns because we're three tenths high on this load, right? Worst case, we maybe see some signs of pressure on our brass. If you're going to blow your face off, it's going to be a, a big mix up. It's going to be a powder mix up or a major screw up in your research, like where you were looking at data for a completely different weight bullet, like it was way, way, way off and you didn't catch it, that sort of deal. Okay, so moving right along, let's dial in this powder charge of 15.0 grains. We know we're down at like one grain right now, or 1.5 or whatever it was. We know that we get about four grains per revolution of our little adjustment thingy. Loosen up our set screw on the side. So we need three and a half turns. Let's try three and a half turns. See, there's one, two, three, and a half. I might be off a little bit there, but close enough. I should have enough threads visible now to get this lock, lock nut back on there. Okay, I think I'm tight. So let's run a couple charges through. Our normal technique, our normal cadence, and we'll dump those, double check our zero on the scale, and start getting some numbers. That looks like a lot. Yeah, 16.8, so we're a little bit high. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go like a uh, half turn, and then run through a couple. Okay, that's pretty close. Ah, 14.9. Pretty darn close. Next charge, 15.0. 14.9. And 14.9. I'm going to actually call this close enough. It's not worth, you know, loosening everything up and trying to make such a small adjustment. We'll just shoot 14.9. So now from this point, I mean, all we have to do is take our primed piece of brass that's ready to go, and we can just dump a charge straight, straight into the case. There it is. Go ahead and set a bullet on top of this guy before I spill the powder, just about like that, and that is ready for bullet seating. Freaking sweet, man. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna grab my tray here. You know, I'm trying to get, a little, get enough elbow room. So what I'm gonna do is throw our charges, Set our bullets into the cases, and we'll be ready to seat these guys. Don't 
Tell you what, I changed my mind. What I'm going to do is go ahead and throw them all. And just try my best not to knock this with my elbow and spill it. What that'll give me a chance to do is at the end, once I've thrown all of the charges, I can look down inside of the cases and verify that every single one got powder and that the, you know, the powder level in the case looks about right, just to make sure we didn't throw a really bad charge or miss a case, you know? Missing a case and getting a squib is pretty much our worst nightmare right now, right? That's what should be at the front of our minds and it's exactly what we're trying to avoid here. Okay, that was the last one there. Now I'm gonna try not to spill this while I pick it up and tilt it a little bit, or just, you know, get your head straight over it and inspect all those powder charges. They all look pretty good. So let's see some bullets. All right, so we need our shell holder again and our bullet seating die. And I think this is another die that's got some crazy instructions because of the 38 special compatibility says, screw the bullet seating die until it touches the shell holder, then back it out three full turns. For magnum cases, back out bullet seating die an additional one and three quarter turns. So we need to be four and three quarter turns up off the shell holder. Okay, ram to the top, screw it down until it touches. When I say four, four and three quarters, yep. Okay, one, two, three, four and we got up out to five just looking at the writing around the edge of the die to gauge things go in about a quarter there it is right there and we'll tighten down the lock ring all right there's that guy and then our bullet seating depth is adjusted with the the adjuster guy on top here let's see what was our target overall length we was uh 1.590 now with the with the cantaloupe on the Hornady XTP, that's about where we're going to be seating down to. So I'll get it near the cantaloupe and then we'll we'll grab the calipers and dial it in exactly where we want it. But this should be pretty straightforward. Probably won't even be touching yet. Eh, maybe, yep, just the tiniest little bit. And boy, that, that seating started very smoothly. If there's a little bit of resistance, right, as you can tell the bullets, you know, starting to, uh, to seat and it's just taking too much force, then, you know, didn't quite go hard enough with the expander die earlier. But this guy started really, really nice and smooth. And we just got a little, little ways to go. So I'll go ahead and just make some crude adjustments until the cantaloupe looks pretty close. It's actually pretty, pretty darn close right there. Grab our calipers and see what we get. 1.608. Our target was what? 1.590? Okay, so we're about 18 thousandths too long which seems about right to me. I'm still a little bit low on that cantaloupe, right? A lot of, a lot of expo exposed cantaloupe there, so no surprise. Down just a little bit more. Nope, that didn't move much at all, 1.603. 1.592, so just kind of need to breathe on it there. Don't really need to be ridiculously precise with this because we're gonna get some variation in this measurement. Like if we dial this one in to exactly 1.590, which is just what we've done. The next one might be 1.592 or 1.588. And that's just the nature of this sort of bullet construction, right? The hollow point there has got some Humpty Dumpty sort of spots around it. It's not perfectly flat and smooth. So, so there it is. That bullet is seated. Let's, uh, let's do the next one. Make sure it starts nice and easy. Oh yeah, like butter, just like butter. And we're right on our number, 1.590. So let me do this 18 more times and we'll be ready for the crimping die. Okay, so I'm down to our last bullet. Everything has gone 100% perfect. Really smooth seating and feeling good. All right, so we are done with our bullet seating die and we wanna move on to our Leaf Factory crimp die. Remember, this is the, the one that has that carbide sizing ring there at the entrance, uh, as well as a, you know, a, crimp, a crimping action for the case mouth. So that, uh, that carbide ring, I just, you know, grabbed this round out real quick to show you. It's really not supposed to do anything. If everything else has gone perfectly, this should not do anything. But if things didn't quite go perfect, like you can, if you look at the kind of the side of this, you can see the outline of the bullet, right? The bullet has clearly stretched the brass just a touch as it was seated down. 
And sometimes, yeah, you can just get funky bulges that need that guy. All right, speaking of that guy, let's go ahead and get it set up. Instructions say, screw the Leaf Factory crimp die in until it just touches the shell holder and back out the adjusting screw. With the loaded round in the die, turn the adjusting screw until you can feel it just touch the case mouth. Move the cartridge out of the die slightly, screw the adjusting screw in a half turn for a light crimp and one full turn for a heavy crimp. Nice and easy. Raise the ram down until it touches, tighten down the lock ring, and then we want to back out this adjusting screw. Okay, so our loaded round goes up into there, all the way to the top. Screw this down until we feel it touch. There it is right there. Drop the ram and it said a half turn for a light crimp and one full turn for a full crimp. We've got a can lure on this, right? So we've got room to really crimp our case mouth in. So let's go ahead and just do a one full turn, full crimp and see what it looks like. So up into the die, definitely took a bit of force and it looks like we've gone a little bit overboard <laughs> with the heavy crimp, right? That's a little bit funky looking. Yep, it's fine, you know, we can shoot this, everything's good to go with it, no problems. But I just don't kinda wanna put that much fatigue on the mouth of my cases. So, let's back this guy out. That was maybe a little bit less than a quarter turn. And we'll go, we'll go to a full, that was a quarter turn, up from where we were. Okay, that one felt a little bit better. Still got a very pronounced crimp there into that cantaloupe. So that's, I would still consider that very heavy. So we'll go ahead and stick with that. You run a couple through and we'll do one last final fit check in the gun, which probably should have done that before I did this crimping operation, but we'll be fine. Like everything's gone completely smoothly. It would be a total shock if anything weird happened now. So, all right, there's our, there's our cylinder and our rounds just fall right in nice and easy. Oh yeah, no worries there. And then if we look at like the uh, front of the cylinder, you know, plenty of room there. We didn't load them too long or anything goofy where they're hanging out the front. Everything looks like, you know, normal. It's gonna fit, no problem. Sweet. So once I get the rest of these crimped, I think the next thing we should do, well, we need to empty our powder measure. So we'll empty the powder measure and switch over to our 45 ACP powder. For the 45 ACP, I wanna shoot a flake powder. You know, a little bit different than this Winchester 296 spherical powder, the ball powder. Flake powders are still gonna meter pretty well, like I expect to be able to throw pretty accurate charges. But occasionally the flakes, like it's not like an extruded powder where you run into major problems. It's just like every once in a while as you're throwing charges, you feel, you feel like a flake or two get chopped and ground and it gets a little bit gritty sometimes, or at least it can. It did in my old Uniflow. Like it's not 10% of the problem extruded powders are, but it's just something that I want to, uh, just want to make sure and test here in this video. Okay, so let's try out this fancy little doodad for emptying the, emptying the powder measure. What we need to do is remove this entire adjuster thingy and replace it with this guy. So I think what we got to do is, well, first of all, we need to raise the handle. Oh, this can is not quite small enough all right we'll use our bowl you guys remember the bowl i told you to buy all right so we're going to raise that and then while it's raised i guess we're going to i guess we need to remove this thing all the way yeah our little thingy comes all the way out and then i think this comes out and then i reckon that ought to slide into its place yeah there it went okay Let's see if i can get this brass bit thingy back in there like kinda, yeah, I think it's got a hold of it. Okay, there's that. So now, hopefully, as I bring this down, we're going to start dumping powder. Look at that, that's not too bad. So, you know, it's, it's done pouring, but of course, you got a huge amount of powder. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the hopper. Actually, I guess if it's empty, I can go ahead and just unscrew it here for you. So here's a good example of what you're gonna be fighting. See all that powder dust there? Like that is, that's gonna cling pretty hard to this plastic. So the first few cleanups, 
are not going to be all that much fun. Really kind of need a brush. Like if I had a really nice long bristled brush right now, which you can't even see where I'm pointing. There we go. Yeah, if I had a long bristled brush right now to kind of get just get down in here and uh, brush things out, that might be enough. But I don't have one, so I'm just going to take like a paper towel and try and get down in there. I'm having a little bit of an internal, so right now, like my internal dialogue is fighting with itself. I'm trying to decide whether to go ahead and just remove this thing so I can be 100% sure I get this thing completely clean. I think I'm, I think I'm going to. These first cleanings are always gnarly. Cause I mean, you know, especially like during the degreasing part, you know, where I was hitting this thing with alcohol, there are little spots that you missed and powder will stick to it. Powder loves sticking to stuff. Yeah, another place it likes to stick is kind of around this nozzle. Oh, this one looks nice and clean. I mean, they do have it tapered to a really sharp edge there. So there's not much of like a shelf for powder, powder to collect or anything. So that looks good. I guess that might be enough. I should just go ahead and take out the entire assembly. And a little, little crusty booger down in there on the wall. But just the one, and it doesn't look too bad. I don't mind being maybe a little bit crazy when it comes to, to uh, you know, avoiding powder contamination and stuff. Like, that's, I mean, not, not only could it be dangerous, it can also leave you chasing your tail with load development or other problems like that. Nobody wants to deal with that. So there's one little area in the threads here that I can't seem to get out the last few kernels. So I do have like a, like a duster. There we go. That definitely ought to do it. All right, let's get this beast back together. That goes that way. Okay, that goes there. Tell you what, getting these holes lined up is a freaking pain in the butt. Okay, that might help. I was just looking. So, you know, that's the hole that needs to be accessible. Yep, kind of like that. And there is a little uh, mark on the body right there that lines up perfectly with it. So maybe I can use that a little bit better. Yeah, there's four of those. Every 90 degrees, there's a, there's a mark. So maybe I can use that to line things up a little bit more precisely because just randomly hoping you get it right it's just not working out that well for me. Yeah, I gotta be honest with y'all, it's a freaking pain in the butt right here. Okay, for the 45 ACP, we're gonna shoot Alliant Unique. This is a flake powder, like I mentioned, and what I wanna do is try to dial up 6.0 grains. And let me double check myself. Yep, 6.0 grains of this. So let's fill up the hopper. You guys wanna watch the scale this time instead? Let me see if I can get rid of the glare. Can you see it okay? All right, so 6.0 is our target. Definitely need to throw a couple that we'll just throw away to get us in the ballpark. All right, 11.8 and 11.7. Okay, yeah, way too high. All right, so I think I went down about uh, one and a half turns. If you remember with the last powder, each turn of the knob was four, uh, right around four grains. This this powder is lighter and fluffier, right? It, it ta it's, just takes up more space for its weight. So it's gonna be a little bit different on this one. Yep, not even close. Tell you what, there's another turn and a half. All right, so I just ran a couple through really, really quick that I didn't weigh. And I definitely noticed that kind of grinding sort of feeling that I was used to from my old Uniflow. I'll show you guys here in just a minute. That should be a little bit closer. Okay, 5.4. Next one's 5.3. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and come down just a little bit more. All right, that was a quarter of a turn on the adjustment. I like to get my, if you notice, I set the empty pan down a lot and let it go back to zero quite often. I found that helps these cheap digital scales. Like something kind of magical happens once they have their empty pan on and they get to go back to zero and settle down. It's like they almost automatically tear themselves. So I find a whole lot less just general drift whenever I, you know, just make sure to get the, the empty pan back on the scale pretty often between measurements. All right, let's see where we're at. Okay, first one, 5.0, oh, I went the wrong way. Yep, I think I just went the wrong way. We'll measure out a couple of them at this setting just for the heck of it, 4.7. Usually those first couple charges after an adjustment are, are high and then it, then it kind of settles down. There we go, 4.8. Okay, I'll make an adjustment after this guy, 4.8, 4.7. Okay, okay, there's a half turn up. First one, 5.9, can't trust that one. Yep, next one's 5.7. And the next one is also 5.7. Okay, got to make an adjustment. Okay, this is about an eighth of a turn. I'll just go ahead and throw a couple. 
All right, this one's for real. Double check our zero. Looks good. Whoa, may have went too, way too far. 6.5. <laughs> that one, that last one that, that just weighed heavy, it did kind of uh, hitch a little bit. Yeah, it kind of, it felt a little bit sticky. And usually same thing with like extruded powders, whenever you're trying to use one of these with extruded powders. Whenever it hangs up or gets sticky or has a problem, that's usually a slightly heavy uh, throw. All right, 6.2. Next one here, 6.3. All right, I need to bring it down just a little bit. Okay, this will be pretty close. We might just roll with it even if it is pretty close. All right, 6.0, but that's the first charge, which is usually a little bit off, so that's got me worried. That one kind of hung up a little bit, so it might be a touch heavy. 6.3, that one also kind of hung up just a touch. Also 6.3, see if I can get one that goes really clean, see what number it gives us. Yeah, that one felt pretty good. I bet it's a little bit lower, and it is, 6.1. That one also went really really uh, smooth, and that one's 6.0. And one more, 6.0. Okay, so if I get, if the handle doesn't hang up on me, which I tell you what, let me go ahead and show you guys what I'm talking about. I'll just dump a couple into the bowl here. So on the way up, there, did you see how that, that hung up and it actually pulled it out of my hand? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Like it kind of, you can tell it, it, it cut one of those flakes in half or kind of, you know, just had a little extra friction. All right, that one, that one felt good. That one felt good. There we go. That one finally, like, you know, it's, it's hard to visualize what I'm talking about here, but it just, you know, it's a little bit of a, a rough, a rough patch on the way up. And usually those charges are, you know, a 10th or two high, like which you can account for, right? I mean, you just make sure you're shooting a really safe load. Like if we're shooting, if we're loading 6.0, but I know that in my gun, I've shot up to 6.5 before and not had any problems whatsoever, then I'm good to go. I throw in 6.0, even if I do get one that hangs up really bad or, you know, a particularly crappy charge and it ends up being 6.3, or 6.4, we know we're still safe. But when, once you get a, a consistent technique, you won't th see those three and four tenth throws very often. You know, the ones that feel right are right on the money. And then maybe the ones that hang up a little bit, it's a tenth or two off. I can live with that. All right, one last check. Let's make sure we're shooting or we're loading or we're throwing right about 6.0. And that is, that's exactly 6.0. So let me go ahead and throw our charges. Now, normally with only 10 loads, there's no way I would fill up a powder measure for this little bit of work. Like I would grab the, the little Lee scoop out of my die kit and I would either, uh, you know, 10 rounds, I may not even bother dumping powder into a bowl. Now this, the size of this case mouth, it definitely would be easier probably to use the, uh, the larger drop tube nozzle thingy here. Maybe fits around it a little bit better, but still, that's about as big as you can go. But even the, even the small one still works. Okay, that's the last one there. So I wanna throw one more and weigh it. Just as a final check, and it's exactly 6.0. So feeling really good about our powder measure setting. So the process here for 45 ACP going to be pretty darn close to what we saw with 357 Magnum. Uh, let's see, need a shell holder. There we are. Got a little bit of grease on me. Like so far, so good with the grease. I was afraid, you know, maybe I went a little bit too far. I did keep on squeezing until I had it squozing out both the top and the bottom, and it hasn't really made a mess. Like I got a little bit of a uh, little bit of excess here at the front of the ram where the shell holders slide in. That's slightly annoying. And then a slight little glob down there on the bottom of the ram. But otherwise, you know, not too bad. Feeling pretty good about that. All right, raise the ram to the top, screw it down until it touches. There it is right there. And we back it out three full turns. One, two, three. And tighten the lock ring. Okay, our adjustment's backed all the way out. Uh, I need some bullets. One last visual inspection of the powder charges, make sure they all look good, and they do look real good. 
set our big old 230 in there and let's see for overall length so we don't have a cantilever on this dude right so the overall length this is a hornady bullet and the hornady manual said 1.210 so we'll we'll try that see if it's doing anything nope not much of anything yet screw the adjustment down and see if we're in the ballpark tell you one thing i hate about these uh these eye gagging calipers is they don't have an auto off so you got to remember to shut them off and i don't always do that all right we're still quite long 1.343 we're looking for 1.210 kind of sneak it up sneak up on it here a little bit all right after a couple of adjustments here we are at 1.212 so that one's two thousandths long i'll go ahead and seat the next one before i make another die adjustment that one kind of seated a little bit hard like it just felt like it was taking a lot of force to get it down in there yep this one's just a little bit long 1.213 so i'm going to tweak the adjustment down just a smidgen call that good enough let's run a couple of them through see i was trying to save a little bit of time and i think that's what screwed up that first one I didn't properly sit the bullet down in the case mouth, you know, and kind of get it ready and make sure it was straight. That bullet's got a little bit of a, a little bit of a blemish on it there, doesn't it? Whatever, it's fine. Let's go ahead and send it. All right, 1.210. So we're good to go on overall length. Let me grab my barrel and I want to double check, make sure things are going down in there. I'm getting a little bit of resistance right there at the end. That's a little bit surprising. Yeah, they're all kind of being that way. Let me see something. Yeah, I think I'm just not, I'm getting a little bit of like kind of what I was talking about with a little bit of bulginess. That one's not very pronounced. Well, none of them are really pronounced, but maybe on that side of the, of the bullet, you can see the line where the bullet comes down to. And then as you go to the other side, it kind of disappears. So it's like, you know, the bullet's just a little bit tiny, a little bit crooked and are crimping die that has the carbide ring is not wanting to go past it like it was with 357 magnum right so hopefully once we go through this it'll drop down into that barrel a little bit easier at least that's the hope let me seat these others real quick and then we'll find out all right last bullet to be seated everything's gone pretty well let's see if this crimp die can help us at all so just like the last one we screw it down until it touches and then tighten the lock ring. Okay, same deal. Take the loaded round up into the die. Now this time, be interested to see how this carbide sizing ring feels. Yeah, not much there. A little bit of dragging. It's almost like a dragging sensation, but nothing crazy. So we raise it all the way up. We screw this down until we feel it touch the case mouth. There it is right there. And I think, uh, yeah, we don't want to go crazy with crimp here. So the instruction said like half turn to one turn. There's a half turn right there and we're just going to call that good. Don't honestly really care all that much about the crimp. Yep, the crimp doesn't really matter. More worried about the uh, that carbide sizing ring in that die. All right, now, moment of truth. Let's see what happens here. Oh, yeah. That is a lovely sound. So it goes all the way down in there. Like you can still rotate it a lot of times like if you've got one where you feel a little bit of resistance at the last minute it can be your the bullet engaging in the rifling right so if you try and twist those sometimes they won't twist because of that so i generally like to uh, like to hear them plunk like that and then I like to feel it like easily and freely twist hopefully all of them come out that way didn't feel much on that one a Lit, little bit more on that one just kind of just hangs up a little bit on that sizing ring. Okay, last one. Let's uh, plunk a couple more down into our barrel. Oh, uh, beautiful. Same thing. Yeah, you can't beat that. Perfect. All right, so I guess that concludes pistol loading. Oh, we have still got so much to do. <laughs> well, first things first, I'm going to do... Uh, get all of this stuff put away empty the powder measure then we'll see if we can make a plan here okay so that's it for our pistol loads i've cleaned up the table a little bit and we're ready to move on to our rifle cartridges before we do that let's double check our list like our list of crap you need to buy let's make sure we caught everything before i go on and forget something of course we need dies 
which we'll talk about the dies we're going to be using for our various rifle stuff here in just a few minutes. Uh, we bought a set of calipers, of course. Got to have a set of calipers. We bought a scale because our RCBS scale is pretty much unusable. Is it a crappy design scale? I, I, you know, I just don't know. I'm not going to be able to say in this video, I don't think. I definitely think I got a faulty unit, but makes me worry about it. Are you going to need to buy a scale? I don't know, but it's on the list. We needed mounting hardware for our press. We needed a stand for our powder measure, kind of optional, you know, if you want to use the, if you want to hang it off the side of your press with this guy right here, you can certainly do that. But the stand's on the list anyway. We need a large funnel and a bowl for handling powder. We've definitely used, we've used both of these already and we'll be using them more as we move forward. I have a bullet puller on the list. We haven't needed it and hopefully we're not going to need it, but you know, there it is, bullet puller. You can get them cheap and you are going to need one. So might as well pick up one of those. Now for pistol stuff, I definitely uh, recommend the kinetic style, the hammer style like this, because it just, you know, it holds on to the rim of the case. It doesn't really matter anything about the bullets because you know, some of the pistol ammo, especially like that 45 ACP with the ball, 230 grain ball, full metal jacket bullet, like there's no, there's no real part of the bullet you can grab, right? The bullet's seated almost all the way down to the start of the ogive. But here with rifle stuff, you've got a little bit more options with bullet pulling. Here's another cheap option. This is a little, uh, yeah, this one's called the grip and pull. I think they sell these on Amazon. I'll add it into our links down in the description, but it's got different size holes for different calibers and you squeeze those over and, uh, or yeah, put those over, squeeze it down, and then use the press to physically pull the bullet out of the case. That works as well, but really only for longer bullets where you've got a bit to uh, grab a hold of, you know what I'm saying? So a couple options there for bullet pullers. There, there's some, there's several other styles, but to be honest with you, just pick you up one of these for 10 or 12 bucks. If you want to get something fancier later then you know, whatever, you didn't waste too much money. Uh, let's see, loading trays. We've already pulled out a second universal loading tray and definitely nice to have at least two. The check weights for our scale, these little guys, we definitely need those. I recommend every, everybody have a set. And the other thing that we didn't really use much in pistol was the Lee powder measure kit, just a set of scoops. Yep, a bunch of different size scoops help you, helps you with uh, measuring out your powder. We're gonna be using those. Another thing I think you should consider is the stuck case remover like the uh, the RCBS. These are 20 to 25 bucks and can get you out of a jam. I'll tell you what, man, if there's something about sticking cases, it always happens at the very worst time. Like you're heading to the range tomorrow with some buddies and you're trying to, you know, finish up some ammo. It's like 11 p.m. and all of a sudden you stick a freaking case in your sizing die and you're trying to figure something out, right? Because, you know, some of these parts you might be able to scrounge from your garage, a drill bit, a tap, this little silver piece, some people can use a, uh, you know, a socket in its place, whatever. We're not going to talk too much uh, about the mechanics of how this works. I've got a video on it in case you're curious, but better to have a kit than not have a kit. Now that that's of course much more important for rifle people. You know, bottleneck rifle cases are the ones you get stuck. Loading straight wall pistol with carbide dies like we've already done that you're not going to stick a case. So in that case, not very important. Couple of other really minor things. Here is a, this is the RCBS military crimp remover. It's this little cutter that will screw right on to your, to your little handle like this. And that is used to remove the military cr uh, primer crimps. You know, sometimes if you're, if you're using like leg city 556 brass, you know, your, most of your 556 ammo is going to have crimped primers. Sometimes it'll be four little steak looking thingies around the primer, sometimes it'll be a circular crimp, but before you put a new primer in, you have to get rid of the kind of the remnants of that crimp. This tool does a really good job and I think it's like 18 bucks. So I might consider one of those. Now, uh, I didn't mention that earlier whenever we were doing 45 ACP, like 45 ACP is another one where you might find some military brass with crimped primers. Not really common, or at least I haven't run into them. So I've never really had to worry about it. And at this point, if I did run into them, I would probably just throw them away rather than full with uh, dealing with those crimps. But 223 or maybe some, uh, you know, 556 or maybe some, uh, some 762, some 308 brass you run into may end up needing something like that. Now here's another set of tools that I'm gonna recommend. 
and these on the left in particular. This is the Hornady Headspace Comparator Kit. It comes with this, this red body thing and these silver inserts. And you can see the Headspace Comparator Kit has five different inserts and they've got you know different size holes. So this first one that, that's connected to the body right now, it's A330, that is actually a 0 .330 inch hole. Now what this is used for is we put them on our calipers like this and we turn them on and zero them out. Now I happen to know that this A330 size is the correct size for 223 and 556. So if I grab either a piece of brass or a loaded piece like this and slip it in here like this, what this tool allows me to do is take a measurement from the, the cartridge base, right? The, the base of the brass to the shoulder. Yeah, so this tool sits right down onto the shoulder. Now this tool is extremely useful when we're setting up our resizing dies. So if we take like one of the pieces we're gonna be resizing, all right, so this first piece here is right at 1.458. If I kind of mess around with it a little bit more, it ends up reading, yeah, 1.4580. So whenever I set up my sizing die, it's not only going to you know, reduce the size of the body of the case a little bit and squeeze the neck down and get it just the right diameter, it's actually going to bump this shoulder down as well. And whenever we get to the resizing process, I'll actually talk a whole lot more about this and hopefully it'll make more sense. But I mean, we just, we want to resize our brass as little as possible. So the less we resize it, the longer it's going to last. If we're sizing it way too small and then it keeps expanding when it's fired and then we're sizing it down a bunch more, your, your cases stretch more and they fail quicker. So I would not want to go back to reloading without a uh, headspace comparator kit. I think it's absolutely essential even for the most basic of reloading, right? So this, the littler guy here, is what they call their bullet comparator. Now, same sort of deal. These have different size holes in them, but these are bullet diameter. So you see this one right here is the 8-30, so that's 30 caliber. This one's 5-26, so that's uh, 6.5 millimeter. So I've got the 22 caliber one in here, and it's a very, very similar sort of deal where this allows us to measure the base of the cartridge to what we call the ogive of the bullet. It's a, you know, a fixed spot on the, on the curved part of the bullet. So the best uses for this are to, well, you know, if you measure them after you seat the bullets, this should be an extremely consistent measurement. And if it's not, that might tell you that you've got you know, an issue with your dies or your press or something like that. And it's also very useful whenever you're trying to duplicate a load. So let's just say the, you know, the, the, the rounds we load today in 5.56, 223, let's say they just shoot amazing, best ever. And we want to try and duplicate that again. If we recorded our exact overall length from cartridge-based ogive, it's a whole lot easier to dial, it, dial this number back in again later to duplicate your rounds. Because you know one of the most well, this happens to be a full metal jacket, but like the, uh, the match bullets we're gonna be shooting today in 22 caliber, the 77 grain Sierra Match Kings are a hollow point and the hollow point on those, I'll, I'll try and remember to show you once we get to the actual, uh, you know, some of the hollow point bullets we're loading today, but the tips are often jagged and ir irregular. So it, it's very common to have two, three, five, ten thousandths of difference in total overall length between cartridges that are actually identical, right? Cartridge based to ogive is, is exactly the same. It's just some of them are a little bit longer or shorter because of ir irregularities in the, uh, the me plat of the bullet, that very tip. So I would consider this one less critical. Th these kits are not cheap. They're not cheap at all. Yeah, right now on Midway, the Headspace Comparator is $43. So not cheap. And the bullet comparator is a little bit cheaper at 30, at yeah, $35. So a little bit pricey. I think you can get by for a pretty long time without the bullet comparator if you want to. But I think having that headspace comparator to help you set your seating die, you know, plus the kit's gonna pay for itself with longer brass life. And brass ain't cheap, so a couple more firings can be a big deal. So I mean, I think that's pretty much all we're gonna need. Nothing else is kind of coming to mind. You know, if, if we end up needing to pull out more tools, we'll expand our list of crap you need to buy. 
Well, I'll tell you what, there's one more thing I do want to show you. Let me get this stuff. Actually, this was uh, one of my viewers designed and made this little stand for holding all of your comparator tools. So it's got holes for the, for the headspace comparators and a bunch of holes for all of the bullet comparator sizes. And he did eventually set up a website and make them available for sale. So uh, yeah, if you're interested in one of these, I'll throw a link in the description for that as well. Okay, so this guy is the RCBS Charge Master Lite. It's basically an automatic powder dispenser. Pan goes down there, powder goes inside the hopper here. You dial up the charge you want and you hit go. Works pretty dang slick. And if you're, if you're mainly going to be shooting extruded powders, which if you're doing precision rifle or if you're a long range guy or something, pretty much everything you touch is gonna to be extruded powders. Extruded powders suck in the powder measure. They're a pain in the butt to, uh, to use, which we're gonna, we're gonna play with that as well here eventually. But for extruded powders, this, is, this might be a good choice for you. And it might actually be, you know, I'd have to look at the numbers, which maybe we'll do that at the end. But if you're planning to buy one of these and you don't really think you need or want a powder measure, it may end up being cheaper to buy things separately instead of getting the kit and getting one of these instead of a powder measure. I doubt you'd come out ahead in that scenario, but just something that popped in my head. Just looked at a couple sites. The best deal I see right now is $239.99. I think I've seen it for $199 before, but so that's probably the range you're looking for for you know a pretty good deal, maybe $225 to $250. So not cheap, but it's a big time saver, or at least it can be, and might be something you want to consider. So if you do end up in the market for a powder dispenser like that, the Lyman Gen 6 is another one to keep in mind. And the Frankfurt Arsenal IntelliDropper is another one. Both, I think both of those are a little bit cheaper than the RCBS Charge Master Lite. And I think Hornady's got a pretty new one as well. So you might want to shop around. So far I have firsthand experience with the Lyman Gen 6 and that RCBS Charge Master Lite. And both of them I'm pretty happy with. Okay, so our first step with rifle reloading is going to be the same as it was with pistol reloading. We need to resize our brass. But these bottleneck cartridges, we need to pull out our case slick spray lube. Now I hate, I hate products like this. It's got a nice handsome label. You know, that's, that's a good looking label, but the instructions aren't on here and there's not quite enough room to read it through the, the bottle. So it's got one of those peel here deals and it did not want to peel, man. It took me a good couple minutes to get it to where I could read it. I even went to their website and actually RCBS has a really good spot on their website with product manuals for a bunch of different stuff. I was hoping they maybe had a digital copy, but they didn't. So whatever. So instructions, shake container well before use, lay cases in a large shallow tray, hold bottle upright and approximately six inches away from cases, spray an even light coat of case slick. So an even light coat, okay? Roll cases one half turn and lightly spray again. Wait one to three minutes for the lubricant to evenly coat the cases before resizing. After resizing, clean the cases by wiping them with a soft dry cloth or tumbling in a case cleaner. And then there's a note that says applying spray lubricant to cases in a case loading block will prevent lube from reaching the lower part of the case. Okay, so they tell us to lay them down and then immediately tell us that eh, you can use a tray instead. So these instructions are very similar to this stuff that I've used a, a fair bit lately. This is Hornady's One Shot case lube. It's a spray on and let it dry sort of stuff. I don't know, like with this stuff, it seems to be critical to let it fully dry, but this, it just tells you to wait one or two minutes. All right, I think I got it. Now what we've got is this big old plastic bin. I use this a lot for case lube. I actually wiped it out with uh, alcohol just to make sure I didn't have any leftover lanolin lube, which is mainly what I use this for. You know, you just dump a bunch of cases in there and then spray the lanolin lube all over them and let it dry. But Instead of just dumping these in there, I guess what I will do is try and set it down in here without spilling it everywhere. And we're going to, yeah, spray it in the tray. I like the, the idea of, you know, our primer pockets being a little bit protected down in the tray. You know, the, the critical parts of the lube are, you know, the entire neck area, a little bit maybe inside of the mouth of the case, and then a little bit on the body. So this last little bit here at the bottom doesn't even really get, you know, messed with. So the fact that it's sitting down the tray and not getting lube on it is actually a good thing because best not to get 
anything in the primer pockets. You know, it, it doesn't specifically say, which actually, yeah, I almost forgot to shake it up. This stuff doesn't specifically say that it is safe for powder. I know the, you know, the Hornady one shot does. Yeah, here we go. Right here on the front of the bottle will not contaminate contaminate powder or primers. And I haven't run into any problems that I attributed to this stuff messing with powder or primers. So I'm a little bit worried that this, this stuff doesn't explicitly state, it does it just mention wiping them off or tumbling them. Like with lanolin lube, what I, I will generally lube the brass, size the brass, and then tumble the brass again to clean off all of the lube. I'd really rather not do that today. So I'm hoping this stuff isn't gonna to be too greasy or gross and that it'll uh, come off okay. All right, so she's, she's a squirt bottle. I'm just kind of going to come at it at a 45-ish and then rotate it. And I want to be pretty generous. So coming at that angle should get a fair amount down into the mouths of our case, I think. Maybe. This stuff doesn't really stink too bad, which is good. All right, I think that's probably more than enough right there. I'm just a little bit nervous. You know, first time ever using this product, I hate sticking cases. It's a huge pain in the butt. So I'm kind of going to go maybe a little bit overboard, which you know what, we can, we can wipe it off if we have problems, which I'll show you guys what it looks like whenever you do have issues with over lubing your brass. Okay, I guess I could dump it out now, like just go ahead and dump all the brass out. Yep, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Just to kind of let everything dry. Maybe I'll... Just kind of roll everything around a little bit. So hopefully things are coated evenly. And let me set this aside to dry for a few minutes. And we'll have a quick discussion about sizing dies. So I think I've pulled out all the dies we're gonna use. I could do a whole hours long video just rambling about dies. So I'll try not to do that. So the most basic set of dies for a rifle is going to be a two die set. So the ones I've been buying lately are these Hornady custom grade sets. There we go, yep, Hornady custom grade dies. These are for 300 Win Mag. It is a two die set and it says full length. Ah, part number and shell holder. Yeah, so this, I don't have the, uh, the seating die in here. Hold on one second, let me put this thing the way it should be. Yeah, here we go. This is kind of what you'd be what you'd be looking at. You've got a full length sizing die and you've got a bullet seating die. That's it. That's like that those are your basic two dies that you're always going to need for every cartridge no matter what. Now, this set also has their optional uh, micrometer adjustment stem up here on top, this guy right here, which allows you to, uh, you know, dial in your seating depth really precisely. I really like these dies. The uh, the mouth of the case doesn't go all that far into them, just into this little kind of guide that guides the mouth of the case. So you can use this with just about any 30 caliber cartridge, so long as the, you know, you've got room to adjust, which I've got a second. So here's the one that came with my 308 kit, and here's the one that came with my uh, 300 Win Mag kit. You can see 300 Win Mag is a little bit longer. So if I tried to dial this guy up to seat bullets for something dinky like 300 Blackout or 30 Carbine, maybe it wouldn't work. But for most, you know, medium to long cartridges, it, it will. The other thing about these Hornady uh, seating dies is they sell additional seating stems. So like here's a seating stem for the 230 grain and 250 grain A-tip. Here's one for some of the medium weight ELDX bullets. So I really like that there's multiple seating stems available for these dies. I like that they're cheap. I think these, you know, most of these two die sets for most cartridges are 30 to $40. And then I think you spend about an extra 20 bucks getting you some, uh, getting you one of these micro just adjusters. And it makes a nice little kit. So full length resize and an appropriate bullet seating die. Now their box does have a slot for a third die and you can see back there on the plastic, it says expander. So we don't need an expander die of any sort for standard 300 Winchester Magnum loading, so it doesn't include one. So what I just talked about 
I've got the exact same thing here for three for 308 Winchester and 6.5 Creedmoor. Now let me show you this Lee four die set. This is the Lee ultimate four die set for 300 Winchester Magnum. Now what they include in their four die set is a standard full length sizing die, you know, very similar to the one we just saw in the Hornady box, serves the exact same function. And we've also got, and we've also got a neck sizing die. There you go, you'll see the, the decapping pin, that's the dead giveaway for a D, for it's either a decapping die or it's a full length sizing die, generally if it's got a decapping pin. Now this neck sizing die, if we crack it, it open, you might see there's that, see that uh, collet split into four pieces? So the brass actually goes up inside of here and this acts as, I guess it'd be a mandrel and the collet squeezes the neck of the case around this mandrel. It does not size the body of your case whatsoever, it just sizes the neck. There are various designs. Uh, Lee calls this their, yeah, call it neck sizing die. And they're kind of unique as far as I know. Most of the other neck sizing dies are, are a different type of setup, but a lot of people think really highly of these call it style from Lee. Now, neck sizing is sometimes sometimes used for bolt action rifles. Like, you know, you can often get multiple firings out of a piece of brass before you actually need to resize the body or bump that shoulder. So some people prefer to just size that neck and then maybe they only resize the, the body of the case or bump the shoulder every couple firings to make sure their bolt still closes easily. Now, I don't really neck size anymore. I used to these days with the, you know, the, uh, the headspace comparator that we already talked a bit about. Like whenever I resize my brass with a full length sizing die, I'm careful to use the comparator to make sure I'm not oversizing the brass. And once you do that, it kind of negates some of the benefits of neck sizing. So I haven't really done much neck sizing in a long time. It seems like around the community, neck sizing is getting less and less popular, but it's still very useful in certain situations. And we're actually going to get to that here in a few minutes. We're gonna be doing a little bit of neck sizing later in a different cartridge. Oh, we still got some more dies to talk about. So we've got our, yeah, so our sizer, our neck sizer, our bullet seeder. They call this their dead length bullet seeding die. There it is right there. That seats your bullet. And then they also include the Lee factory crimp die. So they include a die in case you want to crimp the mouth of your case. Now you saw the Lee factory crimp die for pistol. If you watched that portion of the video had a carbide sizing ring and I kind of made a point to talk about how important it was and how great it was and all that. Well, on the rifle side, not so much. There's no carbide sizing ring or anything goofy like that. For rifle, all it really is is a little collet that closes around the mouth of your case and crimps it. So, We'll, we'll be using one of these for, yeah, on our 223 load, we're gonna be using one of these. So you'll see one of these guys in action, but that's what it is. That's their factory crimp die, and that is included in their four die set. And a shell holder and a little scoop. And these are generally uh, 50 bucks or a little bit under. So the Lee, value, Lee uh, dies are a really good value, and I've always had pretty good luck with them. Now, like I said, this is their ultimate set. They do have some uh, additional sets. I think they have a two die set and a three die set available. So this is kind of their, I want one of everything sort of set, right? Includes everything we could possibly need. So this next die is a Forster. This is a full length sizing die for 6.5 Grindle. You know, if it's not obvious already, like you can mix and match. There's, everybody uses the same thread pattern, like seven eighths by 14. And then there's a larger thread that's sometimes used for really huge dies, 50 BMG crap and stuff. But most of your standard dies for the cartridges you're gonna be reloading are gonna be uh, standard threading. And actually, heck, it doesn't even matter because the RCBS Rebel has that insert at the top to where if you do end up needing to do something with larger dies with the, they're like, they're like inch and a half by 14 or 12, or I don't know, it's a, it's a big thread pattern. You can remove that insert from the top of the press and those dies will screw right into the RCBS Rebel as well. So let's see, back to our die. Yeah, so this is a, this is a Forster full length die, very standard. This one, I've, I've just removed the decapping pin. My 6.5 Grindle brass does have small flash holes and the decapping pin that came in this die was not small enough, so I just removed it. Always use a universal decapping die. So standard full length 6.5 Grindle die. This is a new die that's gonna be the first time I use it today. This is a Mighty Armory 223 full length die. A viewer sent me this, so I'm looking forward to trying it out. Now on the inside of this die, you know, you can use a decapping pin like these and uh, he even sent me a spare. Or you can remove the pin and they offer a little 
kind of a rounded tapered uh, tapered guy there. Now I guess I, I should mention that with a standard full length sizing die, this is what we call the expander ball. You might be able to see, yep, from about there, if you can see that line about right there to right there, that's the actual kind of critical diameter of this thing. And so the brass is gonna come you know, up and over this to start out with as it works its way up into the die. And then it's gonna to get to the neck portion of the die and the die is going to squeeze that neck down really small. And then as it's coming out of the die, this expander is going to be pulled through that neck and that will set the final diameter of our neck. So the size of this is critical for our bullets fitting properly in our brass and you know we have sufficient neck tension and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's kind of a standard full length die or even a standard neck sizing die. I'll show you here, one here in just a second. They have that expander ball that sets that final internal size of the neck. So looking forward to trying that Mighty Armory die. Yeah, here's a Redding set. This is a deluxe set for uh, for 308 as well. Now this is a three die set. We've got a full length sizing die, which I just you know have removed the the decapping pin. So full length die. We've got a neck seat uh, neck sizing die. See the little NK on there. So full length and neck sizing dies, and then also just a standard bullet seating die. So hopefully a pattern is emerging. So full length die and seating die, you absolutely got to have. Maybe you need a neck sizing die, but eh, probably not. Maybe you need a crimping die like we had for 300 Win Mag. Eh, probably not. I don't do a lot of crimping in my rifle reloads anymore. Every once in a while with 5.56, but some of the other stuff, I've just never really fooled with the crimping. All right, so there's a Redding set. Now this is an RCBS small base sizing die for 308 Winchester. So I got a barrel for my 308 AR-10, awesome barrel. And I proceeded to get a loaded round stuck in the chamber because I didn't size my brass properly. You can actually see a video of it. It's the most popular video ever on my channel. I ended up having to remove the uh, stuck round with a grease gun. So be sure and check out that video if you haven't already. But after kind of going through that fiasco, I decided to go ahead and get a small base sizing die for the 308. Now this is just, it's a, it's a standard full length sizing die, but it just sizes that case a little bit smaller than a standard die. So if you've got a tight chamber or something like that, or if you bought a standard set of dies and you've messed around with it and you still can't get the, the sized brass to fit in your gun, you may end up needing a small base, uh, small base sizing die. So we're gonna use this guy in 308 today. Same deal, remove the, uh, the decapping pin. I pretty much remove all of my decapping pins these days. Cause well, actually for 308, we're shooting, we're shooting Lapua small primer brass. And those do have the small primer pockets. So, or the, the small flash holes. So you gotta be on the lookout for that. Couple other, okay, now things are gonna get weird. Things are gonna get really kind of weird. I figured I'd pull out this set and show you, just because for one, it's a freaking beautiful set of dies. So this is an Ellie Wilson set. Like these are very nice, not the cheapest dies you're ever gonna find. So this guy right here is a bushing type full length sizing die. So body of the case, shoulder of the case, gets sized just like a standard full length sizing die. But if we pull this guy out, you'll notice that the decapping pin doesn't have an expander bowl, right? There, there's nowhere on that decapping pin that's going to set the diameter of the neck of our case. That is actually done down inside of the die. You know, the silver flat part you're seeing there is something like this down in there. This is a neck sizing bushing or a neck bushing. There we go, that guy you'll see 288 is the internal size of this bushing. And you can use these to very precisely set the size of your neck. So if you want more neck tension or less neck tension, you can go you know bigger or smaller on your bushing size. Now, you gotta be on your toes working with a die like this because you know, so the bushing is setting that size by the outside of the neck. So let's say you have one brand of brass where the neck thickness is let's say 13 thousandths. And then you've got an, a second brand of brass where the neck thickness is, I don't know, 11. So let's say they're two thousandths difference. So you take two thousandths of difference on both sides, right? And you can imagine that it would make a very big difference on your neck tension. So your the thickness of your necks are very critical when using a bushing type die like this. So if you're just getting started, don't fool around with this crap unless you know what you wanna do. You know, the bushing dies, unless you know what you need to do. 
And even if you do, you're probably still in the end going to end up needing a standard full length sizing die every once in a while. Now these Ellie Wilson sets, this is actually the bullet seating die. The cartridge goes up into there and up here on the top, got to pull this out carefully. It's an extremely tight fit between the seating stem and this part right here. This is actually used in an arbor press. Here we go. This right here is an arbor press. Yeah, hopefully you can see kind of what's going on. So this goes up under here, you know, our, our cartridge and our bullet go in here. And then we bring down this lever to push the top of this to seat our bullet. So these are common in bench rest shooting. Like you might imagine, you could go ahead and prep your brass ahead of time at home and then use something like this to seat your bullets at the range. And I guess that's what crazy bench rest guys do sometimes, right? Like they're, they never know, they might need to tweak their load, their powder charge, their seating depth, all of that crap on the firing line. And this is how they do that. So we're not gonna be using this guy for 6.5 Creedmoor today. We're just gonna use the, uh, the good old fashioned Hornady set. Now, another thing that comes with this Ellie Wilson set is what they call a case gauge. So you put your brass down in here. It's almost like a little chamber. You know, you put brass down in there and these little marks here that you might be able to see. You're able to check the headspace of your case after sizing. And I think this side checks, you know, your maximum brass length and stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really use them. They're really cool. Like I got nothing against them. I guess I've just never figured out a way to integrate them into my workflow where it made sense. You know, I, I use other ways to verify a lot of the things that we're verifying with a case gauge. So they're just, just not my thing, but they're out there on the market and a lot of people like them. So maybe you will too. So all of that brings us to the weird, the weird thing, everything so far, hopefully you've been able to keep up. We're just going to do standard stuff. We're going to use full length sizing dies. We're going to bump our shoulder just a little bit. And we're going to talk a lot about that during the sizing process. We're going to use, uh, we're probably going to seat all of our bullets with these, uh, with these Hornady bullet seating dies, like I showed you earlier. I've got one for every different size we're going to load for today or every caliber. So pretty straightforward. Now the problem though, is these are the dies for my six PPC, for the six PPC bench rest rifle. And I don't have a full length sizing die for this guy because normally, so normal procedure with this gun is to use this, uh, this Ellie Wilson neck sizing die. This is also that way, there we go. This is also done on the Arbor press. So we can neck size on the arbor press and we can seat our bullets on the arbor press. And this guy, yeah, there's our, there's our decapping pin. Like I said, that's a dead giveaway that you're looking at a, at a sizing dies whenever it's got a uh, decapping pin. So this is how I normally resize the brass. Whenever we need to bump the shoulder, like maybe our bolt lift's getting difficult or whatever, you know, our, our cases need the body resized. I've got this guy right here, which is a Redding uh, 6 PPC body die. There you go. See, it says body right there. What this die does is it sizes everything except the neck. So this is going to size our body. We're going to be able to bump our shoulder with this guy. It's going to do everything, but it's going to leave our neck alone. So if you've got, if you're a neck sizing guy and you've got your neck sizing procedure down to a science, then I guess this can be useful because, you know, you size the body of your brass every few firings maybe. But even when you do that, the you know, your neck sizing, your bullet seating, your, uh, your neck bushings, which this is, this is a bushing die, just like we showed in the, uh, in the standard sizing die in the Ellie Wilson kit. Yeah. Even this little guy has got a, a neck bushing inside of here. So that's what we're going to have to do is use the Arbor press and neck size the six PPC brass with this. So we'll bump the shoulder with the body die. And then we have to use the Arbor press because I just don't have a standard sizing die to do the job. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. That'll give you a chance to see how the, how the, uh, the Arbor press works and all that crap maybe. Okay. One last die, and then we'll actually get on to doing some loading. There are some specialty dies out there. This one is uh, called the Larry Willis die. Some guy named, I guess, Larry Willis. LarryWillis.com makes this particular die and it is for belted magnums like our 300 Winchester Magnum. So the way a standard full length sizing die works 
it's not able to get all the way down to the belt. You know, the, the sizing die stops sizing a pretty good little ways above the belt. So your cases can end up growing right here above the belt and getting larger and larger, eventually make it to where it's, it's difficult to close your bolt and it's a problem. So that's what this die is all about. It's got this crazy collet inside that slips down over your brass and right up to the belt. And then this gets pushed up inside of here with your press and this collet squeezes down right there above the belt and resizes that portion of the brass. You know, it makes sense. Pretty cool function, but it's weird. Like, you know, this is a totally non-standard kind of weird die and you'll see some of that out there. So your favorite cartridge, if it's got a standard problem kind of inherent to the cartridge, you might run across a crazy die that's, uh, you know, made to help with certain things. We'll go ahead and use this guy today on our 300 Winchester Magnum brass. Might as well. All right, so I think that is about it. It is time to see how our case lube is gonna work. Let's pick a cartridge and go ahead and get to the sizing die. I, I was originally, I think earlier I may have mentioned it in the video that I thought I might split this up and do like semi-auto cartridges and then bolt action cartridges, but I'm not going to. We're just gonna, we're just gonna resize everything. So I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and yeah, we'll just start off with 300 Winchester Magnum. Okay, so I fished our 10 pieces of 300 Winchester Magnum brass out of the uh, out of the bin. They're definitely greasy. Like this does have a little bit of a greasy feel. It's not like super annoying, but definitely lets me know there's a good coating on everything. Uh, let's see, a couple things here. We need a shell holder, first of all. Okay, there's our shell holder. We snap it in. Here is our Hornady full length sizing die for, uh, yeah, three. I think it says 300 Win Mag there on the top. I did go ahead and grab a locking die ring here a couple different styles you know this is the the pinch style the pinch style there's a couple others that kind of have a uh, you know a set screw straight into it with a plastic tip or a, i guess it's brass or something so it doesn't jack up the threads a couple different designs so the the standard instructions for setting up a full length sizing die are to raise the ram all the way up screw the die down until it touches then from that point, you can actually drop the ram a little bit, and maybe screw it down just a little bit more, just to really make sure you're getting good contact between the shell holder and the die. So let's go ahead and tighten down the lock ring, tighten the set screw just a touch. So there it is, full length sizing die, ready to go. And then you just run your brass through it and pray to God you don't get a stuck case. All right, that went up there pretty darn tough. Let's see how it comes out. No big deal. So it gets down to about this point and then you feel it hang up. And that is that expander ball is now coming through the neck and opening it back up. So a little bit of force there and we're good to go. Let me grab a paper towel real quick. There we go. Well, I'll tell you what, before I wipe this off, let me show you. We did get a fair amount of lube that pulled around the, the shoulder. And that's that's the, uh, the downside of using too much lube. If it pulls up too much around the shoulder of the case, it will, you'll get dents in the neck. So like, you know, the, the pulled up lube causes a hydraulic dent to uh, form in the neck. This one looks okay though. Let me wipe off the lube. So there we are, fully sized. Don't see any major dents in the shoulder. Maybe a few wrinkles here and there, but nothing to freak out about. So we're good to go. Resized case, ready to go. Now the problem with this is that I suspect we just oversized the hell out of that brass. So I've grabbed my headspace comparator. Now the headspace comparator does come with a lookup table. This is the E420 insert. Yeah, there we go, 420. There's a lookup chart. You can see which one to use with each cartridge, but you can also go to the, the SAMI drawing. SAMI is the agency that puts out all of the standards and stuff for the cartridges and crap. You can look on their documentation for the drawing and there will be a line that goes right down through the center of the shoulder, the datum line. And you'll see that uh, for 300 Winchester Magnum, it's a 0 0.420 inches. And there's just a couple kind of standard sizes, you know, 420, 400, 375, 350, and 330. Those are the sizes that your comparators come in, and those are the standard sizes that Sammy seems to use on everything. I think I ran across one cartridge one time where it was something different, but these sizes are gonna, are gonna cover the vast majority of your standard cartridges. Let's get a measurement on this one we just sized. You kinda gotta, you gotta give it a little, little bit of a wiggle, make sure everything's fully seated down in there. It's looking like 2.2650. 2.265. And sometimes, you know, we want to compare this one that we just sized to the ones we're about to size and maybe some others here. So a lot of times it's easier instead of trying to remember 2.265, 
you can just go ahead and hit your zero button and zero out your calipers at that size. Then if we go to a piece that we haven't sized and do the same wiggling exercise, make sure we're getting a consistent reading. And there it is, 13 and a half. So 13.5 thousandths is how far, how much longer the base to shoulder is on this size we, on this one we haven't saw, uh, resized yet. Should be exactly the same on the next piece. There we go, that was 13. The next one is 13 and a half. And the next one's 13. So we sized this brass way, way, way too far. So if you're shooting a bolt action rifle, all you need to bump the shoulder is like one thousandth. Like you just barely kind of want to kiss the shoulder, just barely bump that shoulder back a touch. So that'll be our goal. We want to bump these shoulders one or two thousandths for a bolt action. And with a semi-automatic rifle, same exact thing, except maybe we'll give it an extra thousandth. Maybe we'll go two or three thousandth with a semi-auto rifle just to make sure it's got a little bit of extra and won't run into function problems. So let's set this one that we sized way too much. Let's sit it to the back. It, you know, it's not a ruined piece of brass. We're gonna go ahead and shoot it. It'll probably, probably be fine, but we just put a lot of wear and tear on that case basically. All right, I'm gonna loosen the, the lock ring here and back the die out about a quarter of a turn. Now you'd think by now I would know how many thousandths of an inch one turn gets you on a Hornady die. I'm sure they're, or actually it'd be any die. They all use the same thread pitch, but I don't. Maybe we can figure that out here today. Now, the other thing I want to be careful of is this brass. I can't remember for sure which gun it was shot in. This is, you know, the brass we're resizing. This is some Jag brass. Now I've got a Savage 110 Precision Rifle, which is the one we're going to shoot when we get out on the range here in a few minutes. But I've also got a Thompson Center Compass. I cannot remember which, which gun this brass was shot in. However, I do have some other brass that I know for certain was fired in the Savage. So let's compare these two numbers and see what we see. So I'm gonna go ahead and zero my calipers back out on my comparator. Okay, these are coming in right around 2.276. So let's see what this Jag brass is. First one here looks like 2.278. So just a touch longer. Next piece is 2.278. Okay, so it's pretty close. So it's two thousandths longer, and I can't remember for sure how much difference there are is between my two guns. It could also be a difference, you know, between the brass types. So that's Peterson brass. This is Jag brass. This might be thicker. Maybe it springs back a little bit more. Maybe it acts a little bit different. Well, I'll tell you the way to be sure. So once we, let, let's go ahead and shoot for um, like around 2.276. And then we'll just grab the gun and make sure that the brass is fitting in the gun. So let's see, 2.276 is our goal. We've backed our die out a quarter of a turn. Let's go ahead and size this guy. I tell you what, I have, I've had my fingers on this thing so much. Yeah, it still feels greasy. It still feels okay. Please don't stick. Okay, that's 2.284. I think it actually got longer. Yeah, so this number actually grew quite a bit. And what that means is the die, it sized the body of our case and the case got longer, but the shoulder portion in the die never made contact with the shoulder. So at this point, we're not only not bumping the shoulder, we're making it longer. Okay, I went about halfway back to where, you know, toward where I was before. Still a uh, yeah, little bit of gap there. I can't feel the shell holder hitting the die. So. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to another piece of brass because I don't wanna use one piece of brass over and over and over here because you gotta think about what's happening to the neck where that neck is getting squeezed down and then the expander ball is opening it back up. If we continue to size one piece of brass five different times while we're messing with our die adjustments, you know, we've just really fatigued that neck. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next piece and you know keep using a fresh piece of brass until we get our die set just right. Then I'll go back through and size them all one more time. Okay, here's the next guy. Hey, I might've hit it right on the head here. So that one's 2.276. Let's see, our old number was 2.278, right? Just uh, trying to remember. Yeah, old number was 2.278. So we've bumped the shoulder right about two thousandths on this piece. So I'll wipe it down real quick. I have got a gigantic moth flying around. That's what you get for opening the windows, I guess. All right, here's another piece. We'll double check, make sure we get the same same number out of this guy of about 2.276. Yeah, exactly 2.276. Let me go grab the gun real quick. We'll make sure those chamber. And then at that point, we'll be ready to buzz through the rest of them. Okay, so I got my Savage. 
I can some, find somewhere to lay it down. There it is. Okay, here's our piece of brass. Just want to see. Yep, it chambers nice and easy. No problem whatsoever. So we're good to go. So we've got a good setting that's only minimally bumping our shoulder. The brass is fitting into our chamber, no problem. So this is, this is just the way you want to see it go. All right, just need to redo this last one. All good, and we're all resized. Now, before I move on, I want to grab our, yeah, that crazy Larry Willis die I was talking about. And if we wanted to save, you know, save this die setting, just double check, make sure our die is nice and tight, which that one wasn't mm, quite tight. There it is, that's nice and tight, and we should be able to break it loose. Actually, <laughs> that entire insert I was telling you about came loose. So this is the, yeah, this is the big insert where if you, if you need to use those big giant dies for 50 BMG or whatever, you just pull that guy out and they're ready to go. So, hmm, all right. I probably should have checked to make sure that was tight first, but I didn't. Probably going to need a crescent wrench here. Well, of course, I don't quite have a crescent wrench big enough for that guy up there. You know, no, that's a pretty good size crescent wrench. That's a 10 incher and it's just a touch too small. So I'll need to grab something else to tighten that. I think what happened was whenever I tightened the lock ring, maybe that kind of moved stuff enough to where it's, it's like really, really, really tight right now. So what I'm going to try and do, so, so I've got it loosened up. What I'm going to try and do is turn the ring and the die together just a little bit while it's loose. Yeah, that was just about perfect right there. And then tighten it back down. There we go. Now it should be loose enough to where I can. Yeah, now, now it's loose enough to, to come free, but I'm not sure if I messed up my setting a little bit or not. Whatever. So I guess getting the function of your lock rings down is going to be uh, something, to, something to get used to. Now, I guess we could check these because this crazy uh, Larry Willis die, you know, this is the side you, you work with on the press, but the other side is actually a case gauge. <laughs> where what you're supposed to do is, is take your piece of brass, put it into this side, and if it freely goes all the way down, then you don't need to use this die. It's the ones that don't go down in there freely that need a little bit of, uh, of help. So this first one here I checked is totally fine. So if these don't need done, we're not gonna do it just for the hell of it. If you wanna see this die in action, I've got plenty of 300 Winchester Magnum videos. Yeah, these are all good and they're not even close. Like they're just plopping down in there, no problem whatsoever. Yep, last one. There it is. All right, so I guess that's it for 300 Win Mag. All right, so I'm going to do 308 next. I've got my RCBS small base sizing die. Remember, this is the one I stuck that cartridge in the chamber. So I've kind of been using this small base die ever since. And actually, this is a good opportunity to show you what the RCBS lock rings look right look like. So this is the 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 kit. The plus kit comes with a, what four of these or five? I don't know that many. And I'll tell you what, let me spin this off real quick. We'll see if we can see what the material looks like on the inside of this set screw. Yeah, it looks like a, yeah, there you go, a little, little brass screw. Sweet. So we'll use this guy for this sizing die. And we're not going to oversize any brass on purpose this time. All right, need to switch shell holders. There we go. I'm going to raise the ram, screw it down until it touches. And then I'm just going to back out a tiny little bit. So we're just off the shell holder there. Maybe a little bit more. Don't want to go too far. All right, let's see what that does for us. I did grab the, so for 308 and I think 6.5 Creedmoor, which is what I'm going to do next, use the, the 400 insert. Now, one thing, did I mention, you know, you got to be careful if you're, if you're loading for multiple guns, it makes this a little bit more difficult. You know, you might have to gather up brass from, from all of the guns you're loading for and try and figure out which one has the tightest chamber, which you might be able to just take some fired brass and see, you know, okay, does, does fired brass from this gun fit in this gun before we resize? You know, just kind of mess around. See if you can figure out which one has the tightest chamber and, you know, what's the, the smallest amount you can resize and fit all of your guns. Now, if you're, let's say you're loading up a bunch of just general purpose 223 ammo that you might shoot or your buddy might come to the range and shoot. You don't really know what gun it's going to go in. Then in that case, then maybe it is smart to just go ahead and size the brass a little bit more than you otherwise would. But anytime I have the opportunity to size less, I'm going to take it. All right. So we're starting out 1.624. So we'll shoot for 1.621, maybe 1.622. 
Let's see what this setting gives us. Felt pretty good. Nope, I didn't make it to the shoulder. That one actually grew a little bit. So let me, I'm gonna raise the RAM and just see if I can feel about how far off the shell holder I was. All right, that's a good bit lower. Nope, same deal. Still haven't, <laughs> haven't hit the shoulder. Tell you what, this die is pretty much gonna be right at the shell holder or pretty darn close to it. Hopefully I didn't go too far here. Nope, but I actually saw no change there. So that's good. That means we're right down at the shoulder. Maybe just need one more little tweak. See what it gives us. All right, that's just about perfect. So I'm getting 1.620 or 1.621, right about the same, right about what we were wanting. Before, okay, 1.623. Resize this one and check it. Yeah, just over 1.620, just like that other one. So we bumped it about two and a half thousandths, which should be perfect. That ought to run just fine. All right, here's the last piece of 308. And that all went very smoothly. So I'm gonna do 6.5 Creedmoor next, then I'm gonna do the 6.5 Grendel, then I'm gonna do the 223. Those are all going to be exactly the same as what you just saw. Okay, so I didn't have any problems whatsoever with 6.5 Creedmoor resizing. And moving on to 223 and figured I'd flip on the camera because this is the first time I'm using this, uh, this Mighty Armory full-length sizing die. Figured I'd bring you along. All right, so our brass beforehand is measuring right about 1458 or, yeah, 1.457. Let's shoot for 1.455. That'll be about two and a half, three thousandths of bump. Wrong shell holder. There we go. Just kind of going to start over here with my adjustment. All right, so there it's like pretty close to the shell holder, but not quite touching. See how this first piece does. Well, it went up in there nice and smooth and dropped out nice and smooth. Now it doesn't look like it changed or it maybe got just a smidgen longer. All right, let's try right there. See how that does. Hey, that's just about perfect. 1.455. Try the next one. Yeah, so far this die is nice and smooth. Exactly the same, 1455. I'll go ahead and grab my upper here in a few minutes and make sure the brass is going to fit, but I would be shocked if it doesn't. For the most part, companies have, have, uh, have got their 223 dies worked out. So yeah, don't expect, don't expect too many issues. All right, that's that. No, no stuck cases so far. The lube, you know, our, our RCBS case slick seems to be doing a pretty good job. And I haven't had any, you know, significant shoulder denning. I think I've got a little bit more lube on these than I need. You know, it's been that way for all of the others. Like, you know, right here around the neck, I am getting a little bit of, a little bit of lube pulling up, but so far, so good. No dents whatsoever. And haven't even really felt like I was coming close to sticking a case. So everything's going good right now. It's almost too good. A little bit worried about what crazy crap's about to happen. Okay, so I'm down to my last 10 cases and they are the six PPC. So our little body die, it's gonna be set up exactly like a sizing die. So I'm gonna start off just a little bit back off of the shell holder. And this die is actually a little bit easier to adjust because you know since there's no expander ball messing with you know the diameter of, of our neck, we don't have that same concern we had earlier where we were you know, working the brass too much, we're sizing the same piece over and over sort of deal. It wouldn't really matter too much in this instance. Okay, so let's get a nice good measurement of our current headspace. 1.143, same thing here, 1.143. So I wanna bump this just a little bit. I'd like to hit maybe 1.142. We just wanna nudge it. So let's see what this setting gives us. Went up in there nice and easy. Yep, we actually got a little bit longer, 1.143. So let's slowly bring it down a little bit and run it back through. Kind of back where I started now, 1.143. So let's just breathe on it a little bit and double check our measurement just out of paranoia. It's good practice to be extremely paranoid in everything you do, 1.143. Yeah, I may be breathing on it, 1.1425, so like half thousandth. All right, I'm gonna bump it just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust it just one more little time. Eh, 
that might be too much, but only by a half thousandth or so, I bet. Yep, sure is, 1.1415. So we bumped it about one and a half thousandths. Double check this next guy, pretty much the same, 1.142. Good, I think we're all set here with the six PPC. So let me re run through these 10, and then I'll grab the, the Arbor Press, and we'll run these guys through the next sizer real quick, and then we'll be done. Okay, so here's our next sizer. It's already got a, you know, the right neck bushing installed and all that crap, right? I mean, it, this video isn't really about this, so we're just gonna get it over with as quick as we can. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, this end here, we just take a piece of brass and set it down in there like that. And you can see the, uh, the decapping pin there is floating. So this part sits down over top of here and we actually push directly on the back of our case until it's flush. So we just sit it right here. We adjust this upper part a bit. That looks like it should be about right. Yeah, it might not have enough stroke left. Let's try it out. Yeah, that actually did go all the way in. Double check there. There it is. Down there nice and flush. And then we use this to pop it out. So we flip it over. This goes down. It would pop out the primer if there was one in there. And it cracks the case loose. And hopefully you'll be able to see you see how the bushing only went down the neck, I don't know, maybe 60% of the way? That's totally normal, and you see that a lot with, uh, with bushing dies, especially, you know, 6PPC has a particularly long neck. But whenever we seat bullets in this particular case, we don't, uh, we don't seat them down that far anyway, so it's not really, not really anything to be concerned about. Just a neat little factoid. All right, so now we're done with sizing. Uh, we need to move on to trimming. Trimming is probably my least favorite part of the reloading process. It is a bit of a pain in the butt. And I wanna show you guys several different options. So let's move on to that. So I must admit, I mean, I'm pretty surprised at how well the, uh, the case slick spray lube worked out. I, I really over lubed them. And going forward, I'm gonna try and, you know, cut back a little bit slowly and use less. But it's nice to know that, you know, when you do get too, mu too much on there, it's pretty forgiving, you know, with the shoulder dents. Some other lubes, well, like the lanolin and alcohol lube, really bad. Like if you get too much on there, you're gonna be chasing shoulder dents and trying to wipe off excess lube and stuff, which is annoying. So, you know, pretty happy with this stuff. And like it's definitely there and you feel it, but like it's not something where you feel like you gotta grab a towel and wipe your hands off immediately, you know? Like it's, uh, yeah, it's not too bad. I'm kind of digging it. This stuff isn't cheap. Like these bottles are about 10 bucks. And just from over lubing these cases and screwing around on that live stream, setting some of this stuff on fire, used up a, a fair amount, you know, a couple bucks worth. But hopefully by the time I'm done with this, uh, this bottle, by the time I'm ready to buy the next one, I'll know how much to use at that point and the next one will last longer maybe. I don't know. So far, pretty happy. Okay, on to uh, trimming. Trimming is the worst. It is the worst part of reloading. And it is also the task that has the greatest variety of tools available. I mean, from extremely expensive setups down to you know just little gadgets that'll cost you 15 bucks. I'll warn you ahead of time, they all still suck. Let me make some room here. Cause if you're gonna stick with RCBS, like you've got your RCBS tattoo all picked out, you want everything to be RCBS. This is going to be your trimmer. This is the RCBS Trim Pro. It simply holds the case, you know, holds the case and you've got a rotating blade that trims it to, uh, to length, and, you know, which is adjustable here. This is a pretty universal setup. You'll probably recognize that set of jaws there, because if we grab our uh, universal hand priming tool, you're going to see some similarities. Now it does have, you know, this big old handle hanging off the back here. Yeah, this guy right here takes pressure off of this dude. Yeah, you might see the part in the back there moving. So you push the handle, snap in your brass, and you're, uh, you're off and trimming. 
I really like this trimmer. It's pretty fast. It, it, uh, it's reasonably fast. Setup's a little bit of a pain in the butt, but once you get it locked in, you can, you know, you can go through cases pretty quickly. However, this isn't, this isn't terribly cheap and that there's multiple versions. Like this is the, you know, the, the very basic trim pro. They've got one that's like motor driven, got a motor hanging off the back that spins it for you. And they've got kits that have uh, pilots and some that don't pilots are uh, little pointy things that come out the center of the, the cutter to align your case properly. Yeah. So like there's kind of a whole other set of accessories and upgrades you can do to this guy. Oh, they've got a really cool, actually the next thing I'm going to buy is one of these three way cutters. Yeah. So here's the cutter head. Thank God these are actually universal across the industry. As far as I know, you know, most of the, the main reloading trimmers use this exact same thread and you can buy different blades from different companies and mix and match them to whatever you want. So to switch over to that Trim Pro three-way cutter blade, all I have to do is, you know, unscrew the old one, screw in the new one, adjust it, and I'm off and going. Because, you know, the standard cutter, you're left with a, you know, very flat, clean edge on your case mouth, and that's when you've got to come back in with your deburring and chamfering tool and clean up that case mouth. That three-way cutter combines all those steps into one operation. Could be a, a serious time saver. And that's what you have to think about as we're discussing trimming here. Like it's not going to be a big deal for us. We've got like 70 pieces of brass to trim. It's not going to be a big deal. But if you've got a whole bucket full of five, five, six that you're trying to prep, you know, a thousand pieces or something, cranking on this stupid handle gets old after a while, you know? Now, if you don't want to spend the money on Trim Pro or that doesn't seem like something you'd like, what I recommend is this very basic cutter from Lee. So you have to buy two different pieces. So the first piece is the case length gauge and shell holder. This is my, my one for 300 Winchester Magnum. The case length gauge is the big long rod and then the shell holder is, uh, you know, the thing that looks a lot like our press shell holder. And then you also need to buy the, the cutter and the lock stud. So this cutter is where you screw in that case gauge, that, uh, that thingy, and then this is what you screw your shell holder on. And on, with the cutter, they've got a couple of other upgrades. This, this one here has a, you know, wooden handle on it. So this one has the gauge for my 6.5 Grindle and this guy's set up for it. So if we grab a piece of 6.5 Grindle brass and tighten this down, then this part goes into here. It goes through the, through the flash hole and we're trimming. Now that did pretty much nothing. It might have barely touched it. Now this is ready to rock and chuck up into a drill if you want to or it's got some knurling on there where you can grab it with your, uh, with your fingers. A lot of it depends on how much you're trimming off. Like if you're trimming off brass where you're taking off 10 or 15 thousands, you're going to want a drill. You're going to want, uh, something doing the spinning for you. If it's brass that, you know, like maybe you just, you just trimmed it during the last reload, but you want to just make sure no, none of them stretch too much, or maybe you just want to knock off a little bit. Then this, you know, this is really, really quick. So this one just felt like it barely touched. Yeah, the spot it touched is so small, you might even, not even be able to see it. Just a tiny little bit. So that guy's ready to go. Next step would be to uh, clean up our case mouth. I don't need to go crazy here because I didn't really uh, trim off very much. So that is all it takes, trimmed and ready to go. I think what I'm gonna do just for the heck of it, I'm gonna keep uh, a cloth here and just wipe off a little bit of the excess lube. And then I think we're ready. I mean, I guess, you know, there, there's probably still a little bit of lube inside of the neck. We could pull out the brushes. Not really made for this, but <laughs> we haven't used them yet. Remember our little, our little tool came with these plastic brushes. This is, this is meant more for like, you know, if you're reloading some brass, you didn't, you didn't tumble it this time. Maybe you've got some fouling and some, you know, carbon and stuff build up in there. You can just go ahead and uh, swipe it through there a couple times, but I don't know, maybe that would remove a little bit of lube, whatever. We, we got the tool. Might as well use it, but that guy's ready to load. Now, this is one of the biggest advantages of not oversizing your brass. If you're sizing the heck out of your brass and, you know, cranking down your uh, sizing die all the way and that sort of stuff, you'll find your brass is going to stretch a lot more and you're going to be trimming every time. But when you just bump the shoulder, one, two, three thousandths, you just don't get much case stretch. So you can often go two, three, four, five firings before you need to trim again. So this is not adjustable whatsoever. 
So how do we know it's cutting the correct length? We don't, we have no idea if it's cutting the correct length. Now, if we grab our manual and go to the 6.5 Grendel section, yeah, there it is, 6.5 Grendel, we'll see a maximum case length of 1.520 and a trim length of 1.510. So let's grab our calipers and see what sort of numbers we're getting. This is 1.512. This is the one that it just barely skimmed. So this next one, didn't get touched at all, 1.511. So it looks like right there. So these, this case length gauge is trimming perfectly, just barely longer than our trim length. Well, if this Grendel brass doesn't really seem to be getting trimmed much, let's try something else and see if we can actually get it to work. So I'm gonna use the, the standard cutter. Here is our case length gauge. This one's for 300 Winchester Magnum. Screw it in and you fill it bottom out right there. Yep, so that, that's in there. So our shell holder onto a case length gauge. And let's see if this 300 Winchester Magnum needs trimmed a bit. I'm afraid it might not need much either because this, this Jag brass that we're shooting in the 300 Win Mag is once fired and I remember when it was new, it was pretty short if I'm remembering correctly. So let's see how this goes. And sometimes it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to find the flash hole, especially in long cases like this. But you can see it just uh, ended up falling right through. The fit's pretty nice and the alignment's not too bad. But every once in a while you get one where you just can't find the damn flash hole. All right, yeah, this one's doing something here. That's doing a lot, as a matter of fact. There we go. And then, you know, you'll feel it. The resistance lessens quite a bit. And after another couple turns, you're uh, not feeling much of anything. Good. So there, that's better. Now that, that's properly trimmed right there. Tap it out, make sure we don't get any brass shavings. That's another... Uh, Kind of crappy thing about having some lube on it or something, the brass shavings do tend to stick to it. So a lot of times when I'm, when I'm especially doing larger batches, I'll definitely trim before I tumble that second time. You know, sometimes I want to get the lube off with the tumbler and I'll always trim before then, that way all of the brass shavings get removed. All right, let's see what our length is on this dude, or actually let me grab the manual first. Okay, 300 Winchester Magnum, trim length 2.610. Okay, 2.610. This one's coming out at 2.613. So just a couple thousandths short or uh, longer than our trim length and a full, you know, seven thousandths or so below max. So that's just about perfect. And a lot of times, you know, you gotta watch if there's a burr or something. Sometimes you'll clean up the case mouth a little bit like this, a little bit on the end. Now, you know, like this piece, we got a full chop, right? We took off a, a fair amount of material so I'm really establishing a new taper here. So these take a little bit more time to clean up nicely. So that guy's ready to go. Yep, 2.613. This next one, let's see how much is getting taken off. And actually, now that I think about it, with 300 Winchester Magnum, that's the one where we had that one piece where we cranked the sizing die way down. And I'm curious if we've got one piece that's significantly longer than the others. Yeah, this first one, 2.613. 620, so that's our that's our max case length. Next one's 2.617, 2.616, 2.619, 2.617, 2.617, 2.619, 2.619, 2.619, and 2.618. So we didn't, unless it was that first one that we trimmed before we measured it, we didn't really have one that was significantly longer than the others, which we could, we, you know, we could find out. We could pull out our headspace comparator and see which one's the short one. I'm just I'm running out of motivate, motivation, man. I don't think it matters. Now, so so this batch, the longest piece we saw was, let's see, I think it was this one right here. Yeah, 2.621. So our maximum length in the manual is 2.620. Uh, if I was in a big hurry, like, eh, I, got, I might try and get one more firing out of this stuff because it's pretty darn close. All of it seems to be in that 2.615 to 2.620 range probably get one more firing. But that is one really nice thing about this little lead kit. Did I mention like these, uh, you, you buy, you know, you buy this piece, I think it's six or $7 or something like that. And then you can buy either the cutter and lock stud, or I think this is, they call their case conditioning kit, has a cutter and lock stud and also a, a little primer pocket scraper and the world's worst uh, chamfer tool. Yeah, and I think you can just buy the cutter and lock stud if you don't want the other, uh, the other crap. You're looking at seven, eight, nine, ten bucks, something like that. So you're you're trimming for less than twenty bucks. And 
even if maybe you're going to get a more elaborate trimming setup, it's nice to have these around because, you know, occasionally, like, okay, maybe this batch, it just has that one piece that's, that's a little bit long. There's nothing wrong with just, you know, just trimming the ones that, that are long. So this is very easy to pull out and do one or two pieces without feeling like you're dragging out a bunch of equipment and, you know, starting a whole significant procedure, you know? You know, unless you pull out the drill, it's not particularly fast, but it's cheap and convenient. And sometimes that's all you need. The at this piece comes out to 2.613 as well. Sweet. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and finish up the, the other eight pieces of 300 Winchester Magnum and our 20 pieces of 6.5 Grendel Brass here with the Lee set up. Then maybe we'll try out the Trim Pro. Okay, so I'm done with the brass that used the Lee case length gauge and shell holder with the cutter and lock stud. Definitely recommend these. Even maybe it's a placeholder, like maybe the entire world of trimming is just too confusing right now if you're just getting into it. Start with this, it's cheap. Then maybe down the line you can make the decision on which way you want to go. So with both the, the Trim Pro and the the Lee setup, the Lee or the uh, the brass is trimmed by total length, right? It's indexed from the base of the cartridge, which is nice because you know that's how it's given to us in the manuals, right? We know how long this is supposed to be, and these trimmers use those same two points as the index. Well, there's an entire other world of trimmers that index off the shoulder of the case, and let me show you the simplest one I've ever seen which I'm not sure these are even available anymore. If any of you guys recognize this, this was, uh, this was in my grandfather's stuff for his six PPC. Very simple little hunk of metal. There's a cutting blade down inside of there that I probably won't be able to show you. And we'll give it a half-hearted try with the flashlight here. Yeah, there we go. You see that down in there? So there's a cutting blade. And to use this, all you take is your, your piece of six PPC. It slides right down in there. You twist it. Yeah, this one, this one needed a, bear, a fair bit of trimming. There we go. We twist it until we don't feel it cutting anymore. And then I assume we've got a little bit of brass there. Okay, so there's our trimmed piece of brass. I really like this little thing. I don't know if it's still made anymore. I hope it is. I wouldn't mind buying a couple of them. Now, of course, this would be cartridge specific or at least shoulder angle and caliber specific. And you'll find that's the drawback on a lot of these that index off the shoulder. There's a really nice setup called the Gerard Trimmer. I forget how much that thing is. It's crazy expensive. There's some that are a little cheaper called the World's Finest Trimmer. And another one I just recently did a video on is this guy. This is a Frankfurt Arsenal Universal Precision Case Trimmer. You can see it goes on a drill. And just like, you know, this simple little hunk of metal was set up just right for, for the shoulder of our 6PPC. Well, this has, you know, various inserts and stuff that basically turn this into the exact same thing we just saw with, with this. Okay, let's go ahead and use the Trim Pro next. I do have it kind of uh, fully pimped out right now with all of the accessories that I've got. This is my carbide cutting blade, which these boogers are not cheap. I think they're about 50 bucks or something like that. I don't even remember why I bought it, to be honest with you, because these do, these do just fine, and I don't think I've ever really completely dulled one of these. So, eh, whatever, you know. And you also might notice that there's this little uh, dingus hanging out, hanging out of the front of there. That is called a pilot. So this is a 22 caliber pilot. And you might notice back here, there's a full set of pilots. There we go. There's, there's one for 30 caliber. We'll be using that one here in just a few minutes. Now, I think you can buy the Trim Pro in a kit with the, uh, you know, with the pilots, which is what I did back when I bought this guy a long time ago. Or you can buy it without the pilots. And to be honest, this... Uh, this carbide cutter stays in my other trimmer, which I'll show you here in just a minute. So normally I just have one of these guys on the Trim Pro and don't even use a pilot. But it does help, you know, it helps stabilize. It helps helps to uh, ensure that you get a perfectly square cut. So since we've got the 22 caliber pilot in here, let's start with 223. So uh, you can see I kind of, you know, like you push down on the handle. And after you snap it in, I found, you know, just kind of giving a little bit of a jiggle, maybe a little bit of a twist helps to center it in those jaws. Because that's the one thing that's a little bit annoying about the pilots. You know, you got to you gotta have it aligned perfectly for the pilot to go in. And whenever you really kind of get into a flow and you're doing these really fast, your camera goes out of focus. No, you can sometimes, uh, you know, not quite get these as perfectly centered as you should. All right, so let's get this guy set up. Here's our here's our piece of 223. I think this is uh, 
This is once fired Lake City brass. I think it's probably going to be long. Uh, let's see, 223 is 1.750, right? Is our trim length, 1.760 is our max. Crap, I can't remember. I shoot too many different cartridges. Might as well just check the book. Yep, let's see if I can squeeze the book in here for you. There we are, max case length, 1.760. Hand where it's 1.752. Let me, let me measure the rest. We may not be uh, trimming 223 after all. Now that one's really long, 1.765. Interesting. 1.753. This actually, maybe this is a mixture of some stuff I've trimmed before and some that I haven't. That guy's short as well, 1.753. Okay, so I just checked them all and this is the only long one. Eh, that's weird. Okay, so we're, we're just gonna trim this one piece. And to help with getting set up, here's a, a normal shorter piece that's about the same length as the others at about 1.753. Let's use this guy to set up the trimmer. So if we drop that in there and move that forward, well, this looks like it's actually already <laughs> already set. I must have been trimming 223 last time I used it as well. Screw it. Let me trim this one piece real quick or see if that takes off. Yeah, looks like it took off just a little bit. And that'll probably be good to go. Yeah, it's at exactly 1.750 now. So good, that's fine. Let's move on to our 308 brass. Okay, so for 308, we need 2.005 is our trim length. 2.015 is our max. Well, doesn't look like these are gonna need trimmed <laughs> much either. Yeah, I should have planned this out better and made sure I had some brass that needed trimmed. This 308 brass does not need trimmed. <laughs> Okay, 6.5 Creedmoor, which is our last hope here. Max case length is 1.920. Well, hell, these are short of trim length. Like most of these are coming out like 1.906, 1.907. All right, good to go. I guess we're not doing much trimming today, which is fine, right? This freaking kit doesn't even come with a trimmer. What the hell are we even talking about trimmers for? Hopefully this brief demonstration kind of gives you an idea what the RCBS Trim Pro looks like, how it works. You know, you adjust for different lengths with this crap over here. You got a coarse adjustment and a fine adjustment, and you just kind of make small adjustments, trial and error, dial it into the length you want, and you're off and running. This is actually a pretty, pretty darn fast unit. The universal shell holder is awesome. And if you, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, if you remove the handle and rig up a drill here, it can really buzz through some cases quickly. So last thing I'll show you here is this Frankfurt Arsenal Case Trim and Prep Center. So this trims cases with this big honking thing right here, which is almost the exact same thing as what we were talking about earlier that hooks to a drill. So if you kind of want to see more about these, go, go check out that video I just recently did with this. Might give you a better idea of how they're set up and how they're adjusted and how much of a pain in the butt they are. They're not too bad. Like most of the trimming I do, especially, you know, anytime I'm doing something in bulk is here with the Frankfurt Arsenal. And it's also because, you know, you might notice the deburring and chamfering tools here. It's got these, it's got spots where you can screw stuff in. Remember earlier I was telling you like all this crap is like industry standard, even like the brushes that came with our RCBS handle or our primer pocket brushes or anything like that. It screws right in here. So it's all, it's all pretty universal. So that's very fast when you can trim, take care of your case mouth and you're done. You know, you just have to touch the brass one time. But this is still not fun, man. Like th there's no good, easy option that makes this an enjoyable process for me. Like if you've got, if you've had time, like you kind of really got one of those lazy days where you're just looking to fill some time with some mindless work, brass prep is awesome. <laughs> but usually it just ends up being repetitive and it's tough on like your fingers and your hands and you're doing all these repetitive motions that make you want to just buy factory ammo. But you got to power through it. All right, what's next? We're all trimmed. We're ready for primers. Like we're, we're ready to load. So brass prep, what we would call brass prep is complete. Now, a lot of times whenever you're in brass prep mode and you know, you got your trimmer out and all that crap, it's nice to do some brass prep ahead of time, right? Like maybe you got a batch of a hundred or something of six, five Grendel cases that you shoot and you just get them all, you get them all to this point where you're ready for primer powder and bullets and then just load them as you need them. You know what I'm saying? So this is kind of a good stopping point in the process. All right, I just need to, I'm gonna wipe down these last few 223 cases, clean up the uh, case mouths with our deburring and chamfering tool, and then we'll move on. 
So I'm down to the last couple pieces and just a couple thoughts that had come to my mind. This is taking a while is the first thing. You know, we skipped over a lot of stuff here, but you know, wiping them all down. Then I've been taking the, uh, the brush and just kind of hitting the neck a couple times with it. And it actually has been dislodging quite a bit of loose brass shavings and stuff. You know, in some of the ones that actually got trimmed a bit, it's helping to clean up. And then I'm, and then I'm doing my deburring and chamfering. So like this, this piece of brass I just did is a piece of 308. We didn't trim any of the 308. But still, even though we didn't trim, I always go ahead and clean up the deburr and chamfer. It makes a big difference on bullet seating. Like getting the bullet started during the seating operation. If you don't have those cleaned up and slick, it, it makes a not noticeable difference. So I like my bullet seating to go nice and smooth. So always, always, always clean up the case mouth. So like even if you, like let's say I took this brass, instead of wiping it off, I decided I was going to throw it back in my in my wet tumbler for 15 minutes just to just to get the lube off there that little bit is enough to rough enough up that surface enough for you to know it notice during bullet seating so you have to hit them one more time and it, you know it's just extremely light you're just just polishing up that chamfer that's already there so very light pressure and just for a second all right that's the last of it let's see primers there is absolutely nothing you need to see on primers we covered everything during pistol reloading and everything is exactly the same. So if I can dream up anything to talk about related to priming, I'll flip the camera on, but otherwise I might just see you here in a few minutes once we're ready to weigh out some powder. All right, finally time to weigh out some powder. And we're gonna start with 308. I've got a gigantic moth flying around. Did you see that thing swoop through there? Eh, whatever, that's what you get for leaving the windows open, right? All right, 308. So for 308, we are gonna shoot a classic 308 combination, the 168 grain Sierra Match King with IMR 4895. IMR 4895, very popular choice for 308 gas guns. So we shot this combination in a previous video and it shot ridiculously good from the Krieger barrel in my AR-10. So I'm expecting an itty bitty tiny group out of this combination. And that goes for almost all of these. These are, these rifle loads are known good loads. And I figured that'd be the best way to test a press, right? Okay, I don't know how I got off on that tangent. I'll tell you what, let's let's get one thing out of the way first. IMR 4895 is a is an extruded powder. It's little sticks. So if we dump some of this in our Uniflow powder measure, I'll show you how it normally acts. Now let's see, this is still turned way down for a pistol charge. So just for the heck of it here. Alright, so that's set for a halfway decent rifle charge now, I think probably 20 or 30 grains or something like that. Now, the problem we're gonna see is, is it's similar to the problem we saw with the flake powder earlier loading pistol, but it's 500 times worse. So as we raise up our handle, you see right there, very first raise of the handle, and it is totally stuck. So that rotating drum is totally hung up on one of these big sticks of powder, and the option is either to just keep going and shear it in half, or let off and try again, and there you go. You can usually, you know, slowly <laughs> work your way past it. I just spilled powder all over the godforsaken place. Whatever. Let's try the second one here. You know, occasionally you do get lucky and you get a clean throw. Nope, not that time. So let's kind of jiggle it a little bit to get past that kernel. And now we're dumping a charge. Now, those are normally heavy. Like, let's say you deal with the frustration and finally get this thing dialed in so that it throws a true load whenever it doesn't get hung up, right? Well, whenever it did get hung up, all that jiggling around with the handle and messing around generally results in that load being a little bit heavy. So you pretty much need to dump it and start over. Very frustrating. Let's try one more just for the heck of it. Yep, get stuck. Every single time, I'm not gonna waste our time even messing with this thing with stick powders. I'm just gonna go ahead and put in our little dump tube and empty this beast out. All right, I think I got most of it out of there. Okay, while I got apart, I'm just gonna go ahead and pull the drum out, make sure there's no kernels left laying around in there, and there aren't. Okay, so instead of messing with all that garbage, especially for 10 loads. Ain't nobody got time to mess with that, right? So we take our bowl, which I just wiped out. We dump some powder out into it. And then what we'll do is we'll grab our trickler. Yeah, remember this guy? Yeah, this dude right here. Go ahead and fill that guy up about three quarters of the way. 
And then it's time to pull out that Lee powder measure kit I was talking about that I was trying to talk you into buying. Come on, it's like 12 bucks. So I think from memory, we're looking at the 2.5 or 2.8 CC scoops, one of those two maybe. That should be in the ballpark, but we should step back just a touch. Let's double check our scale real quick with our check weights. There they are, what I do with my tweezers, there they are. All right, this should be 20.0. It is 20.0. Here's another 20, which gives us 40. Here's 10 more. Perfect. Here's five more. Pretty close. Sometimes these will lie to you. Let it sit a second or lift up the pan, set it back down. Sometimes it'll... Well, I guess it's just going to be stubborn. All right. Here's two. Here's two more. Here's one more. And this one is 0.5. All right. 60.6. Let's... <laughs> Set it back down, 60.5. All right, scale's looking good. It is weighing accurately. All right, so our charge weight for this 308 load is 43.0 grains. So those two scoops I just grabbed, let's take the 2.8 and grab kind of just a, a full scoop. Let's see where that puts us. That is 39.1, pretty close. So it's definitely not the 2.5, which is a little bit smaller. And then what we can do from 39.1 is trickle on up to 43. I might grab the next bigger scoop and see if it works. It's probably going to be too big. So it takes a minute before any powder starts coming out of your trickler. All right, assuming the trickler is working. Is this thing working? What the hell's wrong with this thing? Let's see if there's any powder that's made it into the nozzle. Almost none. I don't think I've ever <laughs> had this problem. It's like the trickler's not feeding. All right, I clearly broke something here. Tricklers are pretty, uh, oh, a bunch dumped out right there at the end. So maybe maybe right at the end it started working. Yeah, down here in this trickler, you just got a big old hole in a stick. Uh, you know what? Look down inside of the stick if you can, through the hole. You see that powder stuck to the wall? Now that I think of it, I did not degrease this, I don't think. Maybe this thing's got some oil on it or something. That would make sense. That would cause our problem. All right, go ahead. pop off this little nozzle extension thing like that. Okay, and then that plastic piece comes off. I might have to go see if I can find a pipe cleaner. I've got Q-tips, but I don't think they're gonna be long enough. Let me grab one real quick. All right, let me scoot that back out of the way. Got some Q-tips. Let's see, how far is that gonna go? Yeah, that actually might be long enough. So I picked up the alcohol we were using earlier. Like I said back then, this 99% stuff is gonna, is gonna dry really, really fast. I'd like to go farther with it. I wonder if this plastic, ooh, yeah, just pulling the plastic piece off and that should make it a tube, good. So I can just, actually we'll take our little brush and poke this Q-tip through. There it goes. So it's like a cleaning rod. Now if I can get my brush back out. Okay, I might need the handle. <laughs> I might get something, something a little bit smaller to poke with next time. Holy crap. Oh, there it went. Okay. We're not going to do that again. Okay, a little bit more alcohol. We'll get this other tube here. Yeah, that guy. We just push the next one through with the previous one. <laughs> there we go. I think these last two got it pretty clean. All right, there we go. Pull it out while we got the chance. Looking pretty good now. So I'm gonna give this a couple minutes to dry and then I'll put it back together. So yeah, be right back. All right, so we've had a couple minutes to dry here and we're, uh, we're good to go. I did, I'd forgotten to wipe this out as well. So uh, yeah, wiped it out. Hopefully we're all degreased now. So let's uh, start over. Also grab the next bigger scoop. So we'll try that guy out. But first couple scoops we'll use to fill up the old trickler. Okay, that ought to do it. Let's see if it'll flow this time. Point that guy, point that towards you guys. So you, the glare will make it so you can't read it. Yeah, that, there we go. Okay, trying again here. <laughs> Usually you see a little bit of, uh, yeah, like powder movement up here at the top. Like looking at the powder level, you see it starting to go down. <laughs> Why isn't this working? <laughs> of all the things in this uh, kit, I thought that would give us a problem. The trickler never even dawned on me. Hey, we finally getting a couple kernels out the end of it here. Now this is an uncommonly low scale. There's a lot of room here from the spot it's dropping 
down to there. This, this adjustable base can actually go higher. Yeah, you loosen up this thing on the bottom here to make it taller and you can freaking jack that thing in the sky <laughs> like crazy, which is good. But for our particular needs, we really kind of need it lower. I wonder if, I think most of the weight is in the, uh, you know, the metal body. So I think I can remove this without losing the heft. You know, having a little bit of heft to your powder measure is very important. So it stays still while you're adjusting. Look at this dinky little thing that comes in the Hornady kit. That's a little plastic dude. I actually had to put, fill up the bottom of this guy. It had, luckily it had a hollow bottom, filled it with, uh, filled it with lead shot and put tape over the, over the bottom just to give it a little bit of substance. So I like the weight of this unit. If I can just get the freaking powder to flow, we'll be in business. There's a couple set screws around the base of this dude that I think if we loosen them up enough, which hopefully that's enough, we can just lift this right up out of there. Yeah, this thing is is weighted. Yeah, this is this is like the majority of the weight right here. So this is this is just kind of not going to work. Oh well, it was worth a shot. I would say as a general rule, you know, it's better to have one that's a little bit too tall rather than one that's a little bit too low because I have worked with certain scales that were just so tall that they didn't really work with my normal trickler. All right, we're getting a little bit of powder flowing out of here. Maybe over time We'll get this guy going. The other possibility, I guess, let me let's take off that little extension tube, see if it's, you know, the bottleneck is in the tube. Oh, it looks like it is. Look up the back end of it, completely full of powder. See what's going, in, going on on this end. Nothing whatsoever. So this is where our log jams go happening. Yeah, this, this part's flowing great. Okay, I mean, I cleaned this part as well. What the hell is going on here? First of all, I'm trying to decide why do I need this? Like, I don't need this additional length. You know, this right here is perfectly fine. So we'll, I mean, we need to get it working with it for crying out loud. It came with it, it ought to work with it. I wanna make sure I got this seated all the way. You know, maybe I didn't have the sleeve all the way on there and there was a little little dip there, a little log jam. Okay, I think this thing's going good enough now. All right, yeah, we're good. So let's dump this out, clean the crap off of our scale. Zero this dude back out. Okay, what's our what's our freaking goal weight here? Let's try the bigger scoop. And our goal is 43.0. Okay, get back to business here. Crying out loud. Freaking trickler ended up screwing us up. Ah, 42.9. Perfect. So we need a tenth of a grain, which is three or four granules of powder. So let's slowly trickle a couple of them out. There it was. Did say 42.9. Drop another one or two in there. Sometimes at this point I'll pick up the pan, set it back down. It's like it's reading right, 43.0. Give it one more chance. I think it's still just a touch light, right? 42.9. So let's trickle in another granule or two there. Okay, maybe one, maybe one more granule. There it is. Okay, 43.0. One last check, we'll call it good. All right, yeah, 43.0. Now I really should have had our loading block over here. <laughs> there we go, those are our 308 cases right there. So we need our funnel which should sit right down on this guy pretty good and let us dump in our powder. I was just looking at how much the case was filled up and did notice, let me grab that flashlight again. There we are. Can you kind of see some of those granules that stuck to the neck of the case there? We've definitely got a little bit of lube contamination. I think we're gonna be just fine. I'm not gonna worry about it. We're gonna continue, no problem. But if things go really sideways today, this might be something to think back on. All right, so I'm gonna move my funnel over to the next one. And away we go. Oh, baby. Almost perfect. 42.9. So you can see how awesome this scoop is, right? It's almost like having a powder measure. One scoop puts us just under where we need to be, which is just perfect. It allows us to trickle in a couple more granules like that. Oh, might, went, might have went a little bit too far. Let's try it again. Nope, 43.0. Let's call it good. And I think I trickled in a little bit too much that time. I bet this is going to be high. Nope, maybe not. Yeah, so that time I went a little bit high, so I need to fish out two tenths worth. That's just about perfect right there, I think. Yeah, maybe put one more back in. All right, I'm gonna call that good. So you get the idea, this is pretty straightforward, right? Grab a scoop of powder, trickle it up to the final number, move on to the next one. Oop, went way over on that one. Half grain, pretty close. All right, so once I get these last couple charges weighed out, we'll move on to bullet seeding. Okay, do you remember our big funnel? 
yeah this is where this is where it gets used stuff like the trickler i'm just going to be careful to you know pick it up with the nozzle pointed towards the sky and then just plenty of room to dump it in i probably should try and scoot my loading tray back a little bit and the same thing with our little glass bowl of powder and we're good to go i'll tell you what let me grab our bullet seating die okay so i've grabbed the 30 caliber bullet seating die that i want to use one of the Hornadies that we were talking about earlier. And I've got like four different seating stems we could possibly use. And instead of going by like the, you know, what the package says they're for, I just try them all and see which one I think fits better. Because the older style, like the ones you buy now from Hornady have the part number on there, so you can actually tell what they are. But the older ones, they were all the same and they had no part numbers. So as soon as you got them mixed up, they were mixed up forever. Those actually look like they might be the same the same stem, whatever, doesn't matter. Best way I've found to check them is just to take a bullet and drop it down into the stem and kind of feel how stable it is. You can see lots and lots of wobble there. In my experience, that means that, you know, the, the contact surface between the seating stem of our seating die and the bullet is not large, right? It's small. And sometimes you can run into problems, especially whenever you're shooting a compressed charge, which means, you know, there's enough powder in the case to where the bullet is actually gonna to have to go down and you know compress the powder a little bit. There's a lot of force applied to these bullets during that operation. And if you have a very poor seating stem fit, you'll end up with a ring around the bullet after it comes out of the die, where that small contact area actually you know makes a, makes a groove around the bullet. We don't want that. We want nice, sleek, aerodynamic bullets like they were designed, not ones with a big old ring around them, right? So let's see, here's the next stem. That one doesn't seem terribly good either. Try this guy, nope. It's our last hope here. <laughs> oh, and that's perfect. Like that feels really, really good. The bullet goes down in there. It, it, it self aligns really well and I can't really move it. It's almost a perfect fit it seems like. So that's our seating stem. Not all dies are gonna offer you, you know, different seating stem options. Some dies you just, you, you kinda, you get what they come with. But if you run into problems with seating, and you can tell that it's you know related to your seating stem. There are things you can do to either modify the seating stem in a die, or you know switch to a die that gives you the flexibility of different seating stems. So let's uh, yeah let's get to seating some bullets here. Now seating die setup is pretty darn simple, and uh, most of them work more or less the same. Hmm. Not sure if you can see without me cr uh, making my camera settings crazy, but just down inside of here is a ring. You know and that's where the the mouth of the case is going to go up there and stop. So it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't come all the way down to the shoulder. It's just kind of guiding that neck. Now this, this die, I think, I'm pretty sure most, most dies will also uh, do crimping. Like most bullet seating dies have got a crimp in them. I pretty much never use that crimp. In the few situations where I like to crimp, I end up using a separate crimping die. I don't do it with my my bullet seating die. I kind of hate the thought of, you know, during the bullet seating operation, that bullet's still in motion, you know, getting seated down to its final, final spot. And then here comes the die trying to crimp the brass at the exact same time at that last second. I don't know. It probably works fine. It just always kind of seemed weird to me. It seems like a lot going on there in one operation. So I like to split it out separately. But that crimp being there in most, uh, that's the wrong shell holder. I should probably put in the appropriate shell holder. Yeah, let's, let's try that one. That is much better. So what we want to do is, you know, raise the ram with just a, you know, piece of brass in there. And then we can screw the die down until we hear, until we feel it touch. And that's what's touching is the, the crimp ring is touching the mouth of the case. There we go, right there. Now the instructions for this Hornady die tell you to back off from this point at least one turn if you don't want to crimp. And most dies will tell you, you know, something similar to that. Screw it down until you feel it touch and then back it off one turn, two turns, whatever. But as long as you're off that crimp, like you could go a quarter turn and be fine. But with these Hornady dies, I usually go ahead and go about a turn. And these have a scale that I need to read while I'm uh, there. That's a better view. These have a scale that I want to be able to read. So I want to make sure and get that lined up with my, with my view of the situation. And then we can lock down, lock down the die. Now all of our actual seating depth adjustment is going to be done up here with the with the uh, micro just adapter here on the Hornady die. If we didn't have the micro just, the top of this die just looks like this. It's like a knurled adjustment and then a lock ring and a uh, like foam washer sort of deal. 
So this is just harder to adjust. That's the only thing this gives you is easier adjustment. Now this load is totally simple. Standard SAMI overall length of 2.8 inches is what we're after. So I'm gonna go ahead and just, uh, you know, set a bullet down on there and raise it up. And we didn't make any contact. So I didn't feel the bullet hit the uh, seating stem of the die at all or anything. So turn that down just a little bit and I'm starting to feel it make contact. So I'm gonna drop this and then crank this down like, uh, at least a hundred thousandths probably. We've still got a long way to go here before we get where we want to go. Okay, let's let's try that. Now we're, you know, we feel the bullet going down into the neck of that case. And this is where, like I was telling you, you know, you want to make sure and have a nice, nice chamfer on those case mouths. You want a nice smooth transition whenever you, you know, first feel the bullet starting to seat and then overcome, overcoming that pressure and starting to, you know, kind of glide down in there. You want to feel that happen very smoothly. Okay, so our overall length on this guy right now with this setting is 2.946. So we are 146 thousandths long right now. So we can actually dial in 146 on this die because it's, you know, shows you in thousandths of an inch. So let's, let's dial it in exactly and see if we can get it perfect. There's 50 and 100, 10, 20, 30, 40. Did I, I said 146, right? Okay, I just dialed in 146 and this should come out right at 2.8 inches. Ah, pretty close, 2.8015. All right, before we declare victory, I wanna go ahead and seat. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and seat two more. I've got it up to that point where, you know, the bullet hasn't started into the neck of the case yet and just kind of in increasing pressure and then feeling it start to seat. That felt really good. And here's our third, nice and smooth. Yeah, really, really smooth. So we've got a 2.807, we've got a 2.809, and that first one was a good bit shorter, 2.802. Let me seat one more. I don't know why that first one was so much shorter than the others. Just wanna make sure it's not because we, you know, like seated it multiple times during the adjustment. No, this fourth piece is actually 2.8. Yeah, 2.800. So what we're seeing, something I mentioned earlier about these hollow tip, you know, boat tail hollow point match bullets. The tip of these bullets, are all sorts of janky. So a few thousandths of variation in total overall length, totally okay. Now what we could do is grab our bullet comparator and measure the overall length from the cartridge base to the O-drive of the bullet. And I can tell you right now, these would be exactly the same. We might check it here in just a second. So here's, here's the concern. We've got some that are long, as long as 2.808 or something like that, right? Yeah, 2.809 as a matter of fact. Now, my concern, so this is for an AR-10. I'm using Magpul P-Mag magazines, and you can't go much longer than 2.800 and still fit in the magazine. So I'm a little bit worried, even though, you know, some of these are coming out right about 2.8, I'm worried about these long guys that are a couple thousandths longer, perhaps due to just the uh, bullet tips. So what I wanna do is go ahead and go down. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and go down nine. So that should take this guy right to about 2.8. So we're gonna have some that are a little bit shorter and that doesn't hurt a thing. All right, 2.8, close enough, 2.799. Okay, I don't know why this just happened. So that one there, it felt a little bit more resistance right as the bullet was starting to seat. And then once it started seating, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel like it was sliding. It didn't feel like it was gliding. And have a look at this. Right down, right at the mouth of the case, do you see a little bit of copper there that it actually dug out of the bullet? Let me see if I can wipe it off onto my finger. Yeah, that's not good. You know, we don't want to see that. So maybe this one, you know, I didn't quite give that case mouth as much care as I needed to to get that bullet sliding nice and easy. Tell you what, let me grab a Sharpie just for the heck of it, you know, like when we're on the range, if we get a crazy flyer and we're wondering to ourselves, like, oh, I wonder if that's that one where we had a little seating issue. So there we go. I'll black out the end of that guy. We'll try and keep track of it whenever we're on the range and see how it shoots. Nine times out of 10, those type, no problem at all. They go right into the group like normal. But every once in a while, you do get one that flies a little bit funky. Let's see how this one feels. Yeah, that one, no problem whatsoever. Nice and smooth, looking good. And that's not always the fault of your case prep, you know, or your, your chamfer or you, didn't quite get that stuff right. Sometimes it's, you know, your sizing die, the expander ball and the sizing die is leaving the neck too small and you've got too much neck tension. That can cause, you know, 
bullets to be really hard to seat and have problems with digging up copper. But I know this die is fine and I haven't had any problems with it in the past that I can recall. So, all right, so there's 10 pieces of 308 ready to go. Yeah, look at that. Feels good to finally have some rifle rounds ready. Okay, so this is the RCBS Charge Master Light. This is what you do when you've got extruded powders and you need an easy way to measure them out, right? Powder measure sucks, pretty much useless. Weighing each one by hand is tedious. So this guy is the alternative. You know, you're looking at a couple hundred bucks, but it sure does make things a whole lot easier. So I've dumped in some powder here. I've got this scale. I haven't let it warm warm up very long, so I'm actually going to double check our uh, going to double check our charge weights on a second scale. But we might as well check it real quick with some check weights. So I bet it's right on. Here's 20. Can you guys read that? Yeah, that says 20.0. I've found this to be a really really good scale, just kind of on its own. 25.0. Here's 20. 45.0, you can see it's fast and it's dead on. So 46. So maybe you bought this kit and you hate the scale. Yours is a piece of junk like ours is. You know, instead of putting some money into another cheap small scale like that, you know, this might be worth saving up your pennies for because it makes life really easy. Okay, 60.0 and 60.5. No problems whatsoever. It's dead on and reading perfect. So I'll double check zero on our other scale. So I picked this uh, this load, the, the 6.5 Grendel load, because I'm actually loading 20 of these. We need to put a scope, like this upper doesn't have a scope on it. So I need some rounds to get the gun sighted in and all of that. Didn't have any cider ammo for this gun. So decided to just load up 20. This is a really good load with 120 grain Hornady ELD match. My gun loves these bullets. Just about any powder, any charge weight, it'll shoot a good group with these bullets. So expecting something really good here today with this load. All right, what's our charge weight? Charge weight is 27.1 grains. So we go 27.1 and then hit the green button. And this guy just starts automatically dispensing powder. Okay, first one's done. Unless we see one that's like grossly off, we're just gonna go with it. Like whatever the hell this thing throws, we'll shoot it. Okay, first one done. Put the uh, tray back on there. It automatically starts dispensing the next one. Kind of fighting for this one. Took it a minute. Other scale reads perfect, 27.0. Now the only real downside to these units other than just cost is the uh, the cleanup time. You know, it does take a few minutes to empty them and make sure you get all the powder out. But once you get used to that procedure, it's not bad at all. It's not bad at all. See if this one finishes a little faster than that last one. And eh, maybe a little bit faster. Now there is kind of an opposite problem, like with our, you know, our powder measure doesn't like extruded powders. These don't really like ball powders. What happens is the ball powder comes out of the nozzle and hits the bottom of the pan at the beginning of the charge and a bunch of it ends up bouncing out. It's like this one might be just a touch light. It's reading 27.0. And what you can do if that happens, there's a trickle button. So if I just tap that, it moved, yeah, I went way too far that time. <laughs> it's 27.3 now. Okay, I got a little work to do on the trickle button. This thing's still really new to me. Okay, for the for the 6.5 Grendel, I've gone through the same uh, process. I've got my 6.5 millimeter seating die. I've found the appropriate seating stem that fits the bullet really nice. And what I'm actually going to do is steal this micro just off of the 30 caliber die and put it on the 6.5 because I don't own enough of these for all of my different dies, man. They're not they're not super cheap. Man, I got my camera angle all jacked up here, don't I? There we go. Is that better? All right, bring out the 30 caliber die. Not quite done with it. Still got to do three uh, 300 Winchester Magnum. Need to switch shell holders. There it is. And it's the same process as last time where we raise the ram with a piece of brass in it, screw it down until it touches, and then back off at least one full turn. Now, for those of you getting the RCBS tattoos, RCBS makes some really cool, you know, micro adjustable seating dies. I think they're called the Matchmaster is their current kind of high-end dies. They're pretty sweet. I haven't had a chance to try any yet. They look pretty cool. 
All right, so this one's a little bit different. So in my notes for this load, I didn't write down the overall length, the total overall length, or I did, it's, it's about 2.260, but I also wrote down the cartridge-based ogive overall length. So I pulled out my bullet comparator and put in our 6.5 millimeter insert, and our target here is 1.728, and I'm currently measuring right about 1.817. So that is 89 thousandths long. All right, let's dial in 89 thousandths. 50, 60, 70, 80, 89. Seated a little bit farther, see what happens. Nice smooth bullet seating, feels pretty good. And I think we have nailed it in one adjustment, man. 1.7285, that's close enough to me. Half thousandths never hurt anybody. So let's look at our total, total overall length so we can flip it around and put the base up against the comparator. Yep, 2.260. So that's just, you know, it's another way to, to keep your records and to accurately duplicate ammo. This is better. This is a better way to measure than measuring total overall length. I mean, those, those 308 loads were the perfect example. But then again, you always got to keep in mind, you know, th this ammo as well, like, you know, this is going to be shot in an AR-15. We're going to be loading these into a magazine. Now, my Grendel magazines can handle ammo all the way out to almost 2.3 inches. So we've got plenty of wiggle room to work with here. But that 308 load, we didn't, you know, could not go much past that 2.8 inch target before we were going to run into problems. So we had to, had to shorten them up. So otherwise here, the 6.5 Grendel is going to be exactly the same. So I think I'll do the uh, the 6.5 Creed more next. That's a really good load that shoots really well with IMR 4451 and the 140 grain Hornady boat to hollow point. Gun really loves that bullet. So that's gonna be, you know, I'm gonna weigh them out by hand, find the right scoop and, you know, do them like we did a few minutes ago with the 308. And the seating procedure will be identical to the one that you've now seen twice. So we may just freaking skip over 6.5 Creedmoor. I'll have the camera turned on in case I do something stupid or run into something interesting or think of something to say. Okay, so I've got one thing to nitpick about and I can't believe I'm gonna do it. It's the funnel. This funnel has caused me a little bit of heartache as I went forward. First of all, hopefully I can get it on camera. You see those little steps down there? Yeah, let me shine a little extra light. There we go. You see those little steps down there? Apparently those are, you know, for different different calibers, different neck sizes. And I didn't realize that. I'm kind of used to, you know, as far as these generic universal funnels go, I'm kind of used to the Lee, and the Lee uses a taper. It's just tapered. There's no steps. So the Lee has never given me any problems, you know, kind of going down over a case and sealing properly. But with this, I set it down on a case had it just a little bit crooked and didn't get into the right groove. And I ended up spilling powder out down onto my loading tray. So that was a little bit annoying and I just had to be, you know, once I realized what the design was, then I was just a little bit more careful to set them down on there carefully. The next problem, well, first of all, this universal tray has been doing a great job. Like pretty much every cartridge has had, you know, a slot in the grid where it fits pretty well. You'll notice these 300 wind mags are kind of floating around like crazy. That's mainly because of the belted design. It's pretty much impossible to get a nicely fitting slot for the magnums. But, oh, okay, what I was going to show you was that 223 uses one of the lower holes. I'm going to end up knocking powder everywhere. So, yeah, 223 is sitting down in there. And whenever you go to put the funnel on, there is just barely enough room for it to make good contact and kind of seal up to the mouth of the case. And it gets worse the deeper into the grid you get. Once you get to the point where you've got like four big circles around you, there's pretty much no room for any movement. So this was a little bit frustrating. That You know, this, this problem would be fixed by getting a specific tray for this. You know, I've got some of the per, uh, Frankfurt Arsenal Perfect Fit reloading trays for 223. They fit perfect. Plenty of room for any funnel, including this one. So that's mainly a downside of the, of the universal tray. But one more thing to complain about the funnel, which is not really fair. You know, the, the hole in these guys is very small. It needs to be smaller than 22 caliber, right? Well, once I got to 300 Winchester Magnum, I'm using uh, IMR 7977. It's an extruded powder, but it has particularly large granules. And same thing with IMR 4451 that I used in 6.5 Creedmoor. Both of those powders had some pretty big granules. And whenever I was dumping the charges, I did have some problems with bridging, which bridging is whenever basically 
you know, you dump the powder in too fast and it gets clogged up, creates a little bridge there over our, uh, our orifice. I love the word orifice. One of my favorites. Now that problem, it's just kind of a downfall of universal funnels. It is what it is, but I kind of hate that stepped, you know, sizes under there. Made it a pain in the butt. All right, so 300 Winchester Magnum. I want to show you it because it is by far the largest cartridge we're shooting today. Now the window on this dude, I forget what the measurement is. It's five point something inches, I think. It's larger than the uh, Rock Chucker Supreme. So this is supposed to have a nice big press opening. I'm interested to see how it works with uh, 300 Winchester Magnum, especially this. We're shooting the big old 240 grain Sierra Match King. Our last video with my new Savage 110 Precision Rifle. The group of these bullets was ridiculous. Tiny. So expecting a really good, like, you know, like I mentioned, all these loads. I'm expecting to shoot some good groups. I'm going to be very disappointed if we don't. But this combo, I've been loading it in, the, in other presses. And I think pretty much all of them, the Lee press and the Hornady single stage press I've been shooting, like you have to like tilt it in place. Like there's not enough room for it to fit under the die. Like, you know, you've seen me with uh, shorter cartridges. So let's see how it does with the RCBS. Now I did, I checked the seating stem. It fits this bullet nicely, but it's not going to fit the press unless I switch the shell holder. That's better. Okay. Let's raise this all the way to the top. Screw the die down until it touches. Yep, about right there. And then back it off at least a turn. So we are shooting for a 3.450 inch overall length. So first of all, let's go ahead and sit the bullet back in here. Yeah, like that, ready to go. And let's see if it'll go into the shell holder without the tip of the bullet hitting anything. Oh yeah, and there's a fair amount of space there. That is awesome. Yeah, that's gonna make, uh, that's gonna make life much easier. All right, let's go ahead and start setting this die. What'd I say? 3.450. Holy crap, that's already too short. I didn't back off my die enough. Almost positive this is too short. Dang it. Crap, 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 crap. Oh, just barely. I'm okay. So 3.461. We're looking for uh, 3.450. So this one is 11 thousandths long. Now I did feel a little bit of crunching. This is a compressed load. Let's go ahead and dial in that, what I say, 11? Yeah, we'll dial in 11. Let me seat the next one and we'll see how this one goes. They're seating nice and smoothly, that's nice. Yeah, this one's just a touch long, 3.453. You seat, you seat the first one again and see if it's dialed right in. Yeah, 3.450. This one's right on the number. Now this one looks to have a pretty normal tip of the bullet, but the other one that's reading just a little bit long, let me see if I can get you a view of it. It's got one edge. Yeah, like it's pointing towards me right now. On your right there, there's a little, there's a look at it. So I think that little peak is what's, uh, you know, causing our overall length to look a little bit wonky. No big deal. This is another gun. We've got plenty of room in our magazine. Don't really need to sweat every you know thousandth of an inch all right last one here those went nice and easy okay so next was 223 we're shooting the 77 grain sierra match king this is a load from my mark 262 cloning series the mark 262 is a military round with these components 77 grain sierra match king and we've got a bunch of videos trying different powders and trying to uh, match the performance of that round so this is one of those loads. And in that video, we crimped them simply because the factory ammo was crimped and we were just trying to clone it as qu as closely as we could. So we decided to go ahead and uh, crimp it. So we'll crimp these. This is the Lee factory crimp die for 223. I think we had a look at one of these earlier, right? It's got a little collet down there. And basically the harder this gets pushed up, the, the tighter those collets close. And it's right around the mouth of your case. So, so there's not a ton of precision when setting these up. You just screw it down until it touches the uh, the shell holder. And then usually what I'll do is stand up and look down into the top of the die and look at the collets and how much they're closing, you know, at any given adjustments. So we're not going to go anything crazy. I want it to, uh, yeah, let's try this setting. So the collet is not completely closing. So you can still see, you know, four distinct openings between the segments 
of the collet. It's been a while since I've used this. I'm trying to remember about where what sort of setting we used. We'll try this and see what it looks like. Okay, that's tight enough. Go ahead and run this up in there. All the way up. That felt like, that felt heavy. That felt extremely heavy. And it was. That's a little bit more than I was looking for. I'd call that extremely heavy. So small adjustments make a pretty big difference with this. So I'm gonna back it off, eh, maybe a, about an eighth of a turn. Let's try this again and see. Oh, that felt a whole lot better, but still might be a little bit too much. Yeah, that's a little bit more, a little bit more than I'm looking for. There's another, I don't know, 16th of a turn. All right, now we're getting somewhere. I think we'll call that good enough. This bullet does have a cantilure. So, you know, the case mouth kind of gets crimped down in, into the cantilure. And sometimes that can be deceiving. Like when you're crimping on a bullet that doesn't have a cantilure, you know, it takes quite a bit of force before you really start seeing the brass deform because it's, you know, basically having to deform the bullet at the same time. But bullets that have that cantilure that that, that case mouth can easily crimp into can kind of look a little bit over crimped a little quicker than you expect. So those first two, those first two that maybe got crimped a little more than I'd like, I think they'll still be fine. I bet they'll shoot right into the group, which I'll mark them with a Sharpie as well, just for the heck of it. And we'll monitor them out on the range and see if they shoot into the group or cause us a headache. Okay, so last up is six PPC. And I wanted to show you this one because this is the only flat base bullet we're shooting today. This little guy is the 68 grain Bart's Ultra. Now this is a, it's a special bench rest bullet. Now Berger has a 68 grain flat base target bullet that would probably be the, you know, the closest commercial, you know, big company equivalent to what these are. As far as I know, this is like, I don't know, a guy makes them in his garage or basement or something. I don't know. It might be a bigger outfit than I know, but I'm not really in the bench rest world. But my grandfather was, and these are bullets that he had bought for the gun we're shooting today uh, many years ago. Now, flat base bullets can be a freaking pain in the butt to, you know, kind of get started. They don't want to, they don't want to sit there. You kind of got to guide them up in there into the die and rely on the die to get everything aligned. So it's a little bit of a pain in the butt and I'm afraid this might actually be a pain in the butt on this press. Actually, this die is hanging down pretty low so I can get my fingers right up there to guide it in. Yeah, should be okay. Some of the other dies from earlier, I had noticed that you know they were up in there pretty far. Okay, so with this guy, I've got a cartridge-based ogive target. Let me back this off a little bit. Yeah, I've got a cartridge-based ogive target of 1.730. So I put in the six millimeter insert into the Hornady bullet comparator. And crap, I already went too short. That sucks, 1.710. So I need to back this out 20 thousandths. Well, crap, can't believe I did that. Seat the next guy here. Pretty close, still 2 thousandths long. All right, here's the next one and it's right on the money. 1.730 or 1.7295, close enough. I'm really excited to see if these shoot or not. Like this is probably what I'm most curious about today. Cause this, I mean, this gun's capable of shooting absolutely ridiculous groups, but I've always used that Arbor press to seat the bullets. All right, last one here. So the question is, what do I do with that one that I seated too short? And there are a couple options. Yeah, let's kind of do it the right way. So I'll tell you what, we need this seating die again. And of course I wasn't paying it any attention in the, uh, the screw to tighten it down is back there. <laughs> ah, screw it. I can't even see the thing to tighten it up. It'll be faster to just reset the damn thing. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> screw it. You guys remember this bullet puller I showed you earlier? This grip and pull job? I love this guy for a job like this because, you know, so what I wanna do is basically pull this bullet out resize that neck again and then seat it again. Now, if I use a kinetic bullet puller, you know, the hammer style, you know, the, the bullet goes in there like that and you basically just beat the snot out of it until the bullet falls out. And of course the powder falls out, which it's hard to make sure you recover all the powder. So then I need to go get, you know, I need to fire my scale back up. I need to get the powder can open again, whatever. I, I would really like to preserve this, you know, powder charge that's already seated in here. So what I can do with this puller here is just put it, put the uh, the round in the press and raise it and you can see the bullet sticks out over the top. Then we pick the right size hole, which is that guy. And while we squeeze on it, we drop the ram and the bullet pops right out. 
Now, I just dropped that and it, and <laughs> it rolled under my bench. Whatever, it doesn't matter. That bullet was junk anyway, because I can already tell you, just from gripping it and all that, I probably scarred up the bullet. I'm just gonna use a new one. So we need to neck size this piece of brass again. So I need the, I need the Arver press, which crap, this might be a problem. I was thinking like, okay, I'll just pull out the decapping rod from this, but you use that rod to pop the, uh, the brass out of the die. So I'm gonna need to pour out this powder charge anyway. Got my pan there. And I think I should be able to get it all out of there cleanly. There we go, tap on the cartridge a little bit. Looks like I got it all. All right, back in the sizing die, which I am uh, <laughs> pushing against this live primer here. That's fun. Which I wonder if there's a way I could keep from popping out the primer. I wonder if I rotate this around. No, not really. Screw it, whatever. All right, down into the bushing, and then our primer's probably gonna pop out. So I'm gonna turn my eyes, shield my face. Oh, it actually fell out, and looks like our primer's still in place and looking good. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, screw it, we're good. All right, powder back in the case, just like that. Now, one thing we can do, so we need to set this uh, seating die back up, but we've got a loaded round that we know we want to clone, right? So we can use this to speed up the process a lot. We put this guy in here and raise it up, back out the adjustment on top, same procedure, except this time, now we can screw this down until we feel it hit the bullet. Yeah, right about there. So that should get us pretty close. Yep, I'm about one and a half thousandths long. So just gonna tweak this guy down just a touch, run it back through and call it good. Now, I can't think of any reason why this guy shouldn't shoot as well as the others. But I guess we got a Sharpie right here, might as well mark it. We'll just keep an eye on that guy, make sure it doesn't shoot outside of, the, our, outside of our group. So I think that's it. All of our ammo's loaded up. We've talked about everything at least five times a piece. It's a good deal. Let's go ahead and get out to the range. Okay, I think I finally have everything I need dragged out here. There's a very good reason why you do not take nine guns to the range on the same day. It is awful. Trying to track down every magazine and bolt carrier and scope mount and everything for all of these guns has been a nightmare. But that's okay, we're finally out here. We'll talk about the individual guns here in just a few minutes. I think I wanna shoot the six PPC first. This is my, this is my grandpa's old six PPC bench rest rifle and I cannot wait to see how it shoots this ammo it might be a really good group. But I'll tell you where we're gonna start. Let's start out with the pistol stuff, cause let's see, down that way, I've got some steel targets set up. We're not gonna do anything fancy with the, with the pistols. We'll just shoot some steel and then move on to shooting from the bench. And I need to take our target down there. I did put one big orange dot in the center of the target that we'll use for shooting the, uh, yeah, the Henry Big Boy Silver in 357 Magnum. We're just gonna shoot it with open sights today. These big old buckhorn sights that come on the Henry. So that's what the big orange guy's for. Otherwise, I'm not using my, my favorite orange dots today. We're going with just a little black dot. All right, let me get set up for pistol stuff and we'll get started. All right, let's stand here by the cabin. I've never really shown you guys the outside of my house before. I'm still working on it. So we're starting off 45 ACP. We've got our Kimber. So I've got a Wilson Combat Magazine here. We'll do, uh, we got 10 rounds. We'll do five magazines of five. So. Let's see if it shoots. Got these two still targets at 10 to 12 yards, something like that. Let's see if I can hit them. So this ball ammo should uh, cycle nice and easy. Kind of <laughs> slipped out of my fingers. Got bug spray on my fingers. Oh, we got one in the chamber. All right, so I do have a malfunction. Looks like it actually locked back. Huh, that was weird. That was really weird. All right, let's go for the far little one. Got it. Okay, first one magazine, kind of a funky malfunction, but they're shooting okay. Okay, five more shots. See if it loads okay if I just drop the slide. 
Yep, looks pretty good. All right, let's shoot the long, small one until I miss. Oh, that didn't take long. I knew I was off to the right as soon as it went off. Let's keep trying. Okay, we got another malfunction. Yeah, this guy kind of kicked a little bit high. And this gun has not traditionally given me many problems with malfunctions. Hmm. And we'll go ahead and load it back in the magazine. See if it cycles a second time. Yeah, it seems like maybe this loads a little bit light for this gun. I have to go back in my notes and see if I've shot it before. Cause I mean, honestly, I just kind of pulled it out of my butt. Opened the manual. I knew what powder I wanted to shoot. So just opened the manual and grabbed a, grabbed a charge weight. So, hmm, interesting. All right, two more shots. Let's make it two hits on that far small one. Okay. Don't screw it up. And I screwed it up. Did lock the slide back nice and easy, so hmm. that's how reloading goes. Sometimes you leave the range with more questions than answers. Okay, let's move on to a cylinder full of our 357 Magnum loads with the 158 grain Hornady XTP. The gun is a Ruger GP100 Batch Champion. See if these will shoot. All right, so we'll shoot these first couple in single action. Kind of get our eye in a little bit. Go for the long, big plate. Okay, that felt pretty good. Definitely a little snappier and a little more recoil than our 45 ACP loads. All right, let's try the far small one. See if I can hit that guy. Nope. Let's try it again. There it went. All right, next let's try some double action shooting at the closer of the large plates. That second one, I, that second one I just jerked, but none of those seem particularly strong hits. Hmm. All right, so that's that cylinder, ran just fine. Do we need to shoot any more? I don't think so. Let's get to the bench and shoot some small groups. All right, folks, I'm finally settled in and ready to shoot. We've got the shot marker electronic target system down there at 100 yards. And you'll see, you know, up above, which I actually need to clear our target because I just shot two rounds of 223 through it just to make sure the system was working OK. And it is. There's what we are looking at on shot marker. And with the 6 PPC, this barrel is completely and totally clean. So the first shot is generally considered like an oil shot. It's kind of a, you just shoot it into the berm and forget about it, as far as I know. And we've seen that first shot uh, open up groups. So kind of just want to shoot the first one. This is going to be a nine shot group, which is weird. I'll admit it's weird. Oh, actually this works out good. If you guys remember back to whenever we were loading these, we had one where I seated the bullet too deep and then I had to remove it and resize the neck again and the, all that crap. Remember that? Yeah, you remember that. So that'll be our oil shot. Perfect. So this is a custom bench rest rifle, 6 PPC, hand built by elves or some sort of crap like that. I don't really know much about it. Uh, the little bit I do know, you can go back in our, you know, I've got a 6 PPC playlist where you can go see we've shot the smallest groups ever on this channel with this gun right here. And it is pretty remarkable. So it is a single shot. Uh, uh, actually doesn't even have an ejector. You know, you just dig them right out of there. Very simple rifle, very uh, gigantic, huge bull barrel. You can see um, very flat stock here. It kind of uh, glides forward and back on the, uh, on the front and rear rests. So as I'm shooting this, I'm, I'm uh, really going to minimize contact as much as possible. Probably float my head above the the uh, the comb here or whatever. So 
that's kind of the name of the game here uh, minimize contact and then just barely touch that trigger because this is a two two ounce trigger so if a bird flies by the damn thing goes off so that's it let's get started this first shot we'll just shoot it at another dot actually i'm going to shoot it at the bottom right dot that'll kind of give us a chance to check our sights and see where we're hitting I think I had this gun sighted in to uh, hit a little bit low, perhaps. Got my ears in and the chronograph is armed. So we're ready to go. Okay. All right, so we're actually right on the dot. Good. All right, so I guess I ought to look at our first piece of brass here. Looking pretty good. A little bit of primer cratering. Hopefully we don't pierce any primers. But I remember our last video, like kind of where we ended up with this load this is you know this is a pretty hot load so all right let's uh let's go on with the real group i'm gonna leave that open while i readjust over to the other dot it's a big part of shooting this thing is just getting everything lined up the way you want it and then once you're shooting the shots go pretty quick okay i think we're ready to rock all right that guy did not go off Huh, that's not good. Why didn't that go off? Never run into that with this gun. I'm gonna let it sit there for just a second while I think. I did use a different primer this time. So I used CCI 41 primers in everything just to simplify matters. Cause like everything except 300 Winchester Magnum that I was shooting used small primers. So I just wanted to use one, huh? All right, let's see what she looks like here. Well, the bullet's still there, and we got a pretty deep strike on the primer. So this may just be, you know, one of those deals where this gun, the primer spring, and all that garbage is really optimized for federal primers, which I think is what we've always shot in this until today. So maybe just the harder CCI primers. I don't know. We'll give it a second strike here in just a minute. Our chronograph is timed out, so let's arm it again. All right, here we go. Okay. Bolt lift a little bit heavy. And we blew the frickin' primer. Well, crap, Bola. Crap. Crap. There it is. Didn't pierce or anything. All right, here's what we're gonna have to do. I don't. I don't want to continue. I don't want to. I don't want to be blowing primers. I don't want to mess up this bolt face or do anything goofy like that. So we're done. We don't have a ton of daylight left anyway. So we got a whole lot more. You know, we're gonna be back out here tomorrow anyway. So what we'll do is we'll move on to the next thing. Then we'll go back to the bench and reload these with federal primer. Cause so far we got we got ourselves a shit show going on here. And the smart thing to do is stop. If I can get my bolt in. All right, I'm too stupid. All right, there we go. I had to flip it around by hand. And I clearly went the wrong way, apparently. There we go. Good grief. Okay, yeah, so that's that. Let's move on. What do you guys want to shoot next? I'll do a poll on Twitch. I'll let them pick. Okay, so Twitch chose the 6.5 Grendel. I just got a scope put on it, and we got it sighted in in one shot. So we're very proud of ourselves today. So we're ready for a group. I've got five shots in the magazine. I've got the chronograph armed. Let's see what it looks like. Uh-oh, that's already, yeah, that's already 0.89 inches. Gross. All right, let's go ahead and finish off these five. See if it's, going to try and group for us at all all right looks better from my view yeah the rest of them piled right in there didn't it well i can't really blame it on barrel heat can i like we shot one whenever we were getting the scope dialed in maybe it just needed you know one more warm-up shot before it was ready to rock and roll you know <laughs> like well let's hide this shot and see what the remainder are yeah the next four were in the 0.32 inches kiss my butt that is really good man dang it well i'll tell you what if it's warmed up and it's wanting to group now i don't want to wait too long so let me fix the microphone and we'll just dive right into that second group we're going to shoot at the same dot 
and hopefully this time we're not going to have that problem with the first round somebody mentioned like on twitch mentioned that you know maybe it was you know first round syndrome he called it where you drop that bolt on the first one and it has a little rougher journey through the feeding process i don't know man we'll see if it happens again Uh-oh. Is that done? No, we got a malfunction. Well, crap. <sighs> hmm. Poop. Looks like we can go ahead and shoot the round. It did kind of get dented right at the shoulder. What are we looking at as far as a group goes? Point, of course, we're in the middle of a freaking point three two inch group, and this crap happens. I do have, maybe I grabbed a bad magazine. I do have a couple bad Grendel and Ark uh, magazines floating around that I need really need to put in the trash the next time I do them for sure so all right so I cleared I, I made that round the last one which we got plenty of ammo we don't have to screw up a perfectly good group with crappy ammo what am I thinking so yeah this one we'll shoot it here in a minute I'm gonna grab a nice pristine one that's ready to go all right let's finish this off 0.32 inches Oh no, did that go, what in the heck? Well, crap. Crap. <laughs> oh man. Is that just, is that the sort of day we're gonna have today? Is that what, is that what's gonna happen? 0.86 inches, let's hide it. The other four, 0.32 inches. Freaking bull crap, man. <laughs> Damn it. All right, let's go after it again. Another five shot group. This time, no flyers. Should I clear? Yeah, let me clear the target. There it is. I'm gonna, yeah, we're good to go. All right, five more shots. Chronograph's armed. Here we go. Tell you what, I'm gonna switch to a fresh dot. Let's go over two dots. Yep, just, just for a fresh aiming point. There we go. Another malfunction. Put another fresh one in here. What's our group look like? Already 0.74 inches. Things just aren't going well. Oh, now I just jammed another one in there. Did I not drop one out? Had I double fed and I didn't clear the chamber all the way? I don't think so. So now that one's jacked up. It's got to be a bad magazine. We haven't had any function issues with this gun in a long time. So I know this gas block setting's good, and I know this load's good, so I think I just grabbed a crap magazine. That one went like four inches high, didn't it? Okay, maybe an inch. I don't know what to tell you, man. The gun's trying to group. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated at this point. We've got our, we got a couple pieces of Grendel that have all been jacked up. Tell you what, let's go, sh let's just shoot them real quick. That way they're fire formed out and ready to reload. But uh, I was hoping for a little bit better from our Grendel. All right, not what we envisioned here for the Grendel, but that's okay. That's all right. Still, even with all of our issues, you know, nine shot group, 1.33 inches, that's not the end of the world. What about without that four? Take away four, we're right at an inch, you know? Nothing to cry about. We got other loads that are gonna shoot good. Which speaking of that, all right, I think what I'm gonna move on to is the 357 Magnum. I wanna shoot the Henry Big Boy Silver because this light is perfect for shooting open sights. Like there's gonna be no glare on my front sight post or any of that goofy stuff. So let's go ahead and do that. And then tomorrow we'll shoot all the rest probably. All right, I need to figure out how to point this thing. I'll tell you what, I better hurry. Like I'm, 
I had that perfect light and now it's running out. So yeah, let's try a lower bag here. Yeah, I can live with that. Holy crap, I forgot how crude these sights are. Man, those are some janky sights. <laughs> they get the job done though. All right, I think that's looking good. All right, so this is uh, tube fed here. So we need to put our hand in front of the muzzle, which is always safe. Freaking excuses already with the light. I know, man. All right, let's just do a five shot group like normal and see how she does. So this, this gun, if you want to see how it shoots with a scope on it, we did have a scope on it for a while. And uh, yeah, some of the previous videos in the 357 Magnum series, we're testing, yeah, testing it with this very bullet. And actually it, it ended up preferring the 140 grain XTP. So yeah, if you want to see that, those videos are out there. All right, that loaded okay. Let's see where we're at on paper. Cause I don't really remember exactly how I sighted this guy in. I remember we did sight it in, so. Okay, chronograph's armed. Let's see if we're on paper here. Okay, where'd we hit? Eh, a little bit low. Oh, I didn't consider this. I don't know if you see on the shot marker here, it says the velocity of this shot is very low. Shots arriving under Mach 1.03 will not be recorded. So the shot marker system re relies on shots coming through at supersonic velocities so you know luckily i guess this one was just barely over but as we shoot we may end up missing some on the shot marker i don't know let's find out i've never really i've never really tried something right there on the border with the shot marker so it'll be fun there we go that's in the same ballpark 1.94 inches and uh I hate shooting this thing from the bench, like, you know, slowly opening the lever and then you dump that one out and the next one gets a little bit crooked in there. Yep, it ended up okay that time. Man, that front sight is gigantic. Like that front sight is covering at least 16 inches down there. <laughs> so I'm surprised I'm able to kind of keep them going in there halfway decent. Well, how about that? Man, I'll take that every day with open sights at 100 yards. With crappy eyeballs, 2.74 inches. I will take it. I'll tell you what, let's shoot five more here with the Henry, and then we'll call it good. And we'll just keep this existing group going. 2.74 inches. Okay, so I've loaded up five more rounds here in the Henry. First shot, here we go. Uh, already, already screwed it up. Dang it. All right, did I already? Yeah, I already did that. Why did I do that again? I'm kind of stupid. All right, that one's ready to go. Here we go. Put that guy back in there. Crap. Okay. I gotta be realistic. Those sights are just garbage, but they're fun. And I'll take a four inch group with them any day. Any day. I love shooting open sights. All right, so here's what we need to do. First thing, pack up and get inside. Next thing, get some Chinese food because Twitch has been talking about Chinese food and now I want Chinese food. Then after that, we're going to reload those six PPCs. So I guess I'll see you guys back at the bench. All right, so I've been reviewing everything and having a look at some previous load data here for the six PPC. So here's our, here's our primer that popped right there. No other like clear signs of major pressure. Like we're looking for any, looking for any uh, case head separation. So it happens right in this area. I don't see anything, nothing crazy going on. And here's what I think happened. I think this might have just been a bad primer pocket. 
because so whenever I was priming this brass, I thought about bringing it up in the video and decided not to, but whenever I was priming this brass, several pieces, the primers went in way too easy. But I thought we could get away with it. Like sometimes, you know, when you feel that, it's like, eh, we can get one more firing without running into problems. And I think that just backfired on me. Here's the other one we shot that didn't pop the primer. You'll notice how the, like where the firing pin struck, if I can get you the right angle and focus, you might see that it's, it's protruding up a little bit from the rest of the primer. We call that cratering. So that is a, uh, a cratered primer, which can be a sign of pressure, but some guns just do it. Like actually the 6.5 Creedmoor Thompson Center Compass we're gonna be shooting is really bad about cratering primers. So looking back through some, you know, some previously fired brass that's still hanging around here. And oh, look down there. That looks like another primer that might've popped in the past. Like mo most of this brass I've never fired. It's, it's my grandfather's old stockpile, but I do have notes on stuff. And, you know, I think this should still be okay. There we go. There's two previously fired pieces and you might notice similar cratering on these. So the charge weight we were shooting was 28.4 grains. I picked that just because it shot the best group in the last video with this gun. In that video, we went six tenths of a grain higher than that up to 29.0. So I just, I, yeah, I don't think it was charge weight. Like th these are hot loads. These are extremely hot loads, but that's the way these bench rest guys shoot them. Actually in my first video, we had gone by some published load data. Like looking in my notes, my grandfather's old charge weight was astronomically high when you looked at like published load data. So first video we did, like I was shooting much lower charge weights and a lot of bench rest guys showed up in the comments and said, yeah, we don't, we don't shoot that low. Your grandfather's numbers are closer to what we actually do. I don't know if I've made a coherent point here or not, but I really, I don't think this was necessarily pressure related. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to pull these bullets and recover the powder because this Vitavori N133 powder, I'm just about out. So need to recover this powder. Then I'm going to set up our body die and bump the shoulder on some of these. I might end up just doing all of them just for the heck of it. Because after I do that, I've got a little gadget here that is a primer pocket gauge. It actually has a, uh, a no-go gauge for primer pockets. So uh, once I get these guys sized and the primers are popped out, then I can go around with the no-go gauge and see if I can come up with the ones that have the tightest primer pockets. So once we've got good sized brass with good feeling primer pockets, then we'll, we'll cut back on our charge weight let's, just a little bit, just to say we did, we dropped our charge weight a little bit. We'll go down to 28.0. So four tenths of a grain down on charge weight. And also very importantly, I think, we're gonna switch over to the primers we've been shooting in this gun, the GM205M small rifle match primers. So the CCI 41 primer might have just given us a little unexpected pressure spike as well. So that's the plan and you've seen it all before. So we'll probably skip through most of this and get back out to the range quickly. All right, here's a quick problem I just ran into. No big deal, but uh, you know, something I ran into that might not be obvious to you. So remember we've got cratered primer pockets. So it stands a little bit proud there in the center. Well, I'm getting ready to set up my body die to bump our shoulder, right? So I've got my headspace comparator in here and I'm looking to take my baseline measurement from this brass. Well, if you look where your calipers land, it's right on top of that cratered primer. So this is not going to be an accurate measurement. I've got space between the case head and my caliper jaw. So what I'm gonna to have to do is pull out the body die and uh, throw in a decapping die. There we go, don't even need a lock ring on this guy. I just need to pop out a couple primers. Oop, I forgot my trash can. All right, let's try that. I got a coffee can down there or a big, uh, yeah, one of these, that ought to make a pleasant sound. Okay, that one, it either missed or didn't fall out. And I've got that terrible feeling I'm doing something stupid right now. Like my primers aren't dropping out the bottom. They're coming out. Like what the, what have I done here? What have I screwed up? All right, they're not up there. Oh, my primer discharge 
has gotten completely clogged up with grease. Let me grab a paper towel. Let's see if I can get you guys an angle of it. All right, is it showing up? Yep, I think she's plugged up. So let's see if I can dig some of that out of there. It's hard to get it out with just packing it farther in there. And here's a just a random uh, pin I had laying around. Grab a little pin here to maybe help dig it out. Well, there's one of the primers. There's both of the primers. That's not good. All right, there's a nice glob. All right, I think I got it clear now, but definitely gonna have to keep my eye on that. All right, let's let's uh, let's do the next one, see if it falls out like normal this time. Here it comes. Hey, there it is, that's better. That's much better. Actually, so even during decapping on this one here, like that primer just fell out. So I don't know why I'm doing this under the desk, but real quick, let me grab that. Yeah, this primer pocket gauge I was, uh, telling you about. So the larger end is the one I've got sharpied red here. So if we take the primer pocket, this should not go in there. And it's not only going in there, but it's going in there and it's loose. So this is a complete garbage piece of brass with a gigantic primer pocket. This is what we've got to uh, weed out of here. So this is what I ended up with. I've got 15 pieces that the primer pocket gauge is saying are good. I found 26 pieces that were bad. And most of them were not just bad, they are sloppy bad, like that. Yeah, just like that. Usually this no-go gauge, by the time you get it to go in, and it's going in pretty easily, like that, that primer pocket has already caused you some problems. Or you've noticed it be loose during priming, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, more evidence, I think we just, you know, ended up working from a bad batch of brass, which I've got new brass for this gun. A generous viewer sent me a bunch of Lapua 220 Russian brass that I just need to form to, you know, into six PPC. So that's going to be the next freaking video with this gun is getting a new batch of brass broken in and set up and ready to go. All right. So next steps are to recover my old powder and I've changed my mind about bumping the shoulder. I'm not going to do it because that means I got to lube the cases and I'm kind of like my day is getting away from me here. I really want to get out on the range. So we're going to skip the shoulder bump. So these will be fine. They just need a neck size and they'll be perfectly good. So recover powder, neck size these cases, prime them, weigh our powder, seat our bullets. Sounds easy enough. So since I'm not tumbling these, actually I should go ahead and leave this on. This is going to give me a chance to actually use my case neck brush, you know, for kind of what it was meant for. So all of these, I'll give them I don't know, maybe about that much. And once I'm done with that, I'll switch over to the smaller of the two primer pocket brushes. We didn't have any opportunity to use these earlier. Yeah, there they are. That goes right down in there and you just kind of brush around. So these do a really good job. So just a couple twists and that's a pretty dang clean primer pocket. So I've already neck sized these guys. They are ready to go. I might give it just one more quick twist with the chamfer tool to clean that up, make sure we're ready for nice smooth bullet seating. And I'm ready for a primer powder and bullet. Okay, so the second time through this priming process, I'm gonna be a lot more aware of how these feel. Like that still seemed to go in pretty dang easy. That one felt really good. So I'll tell you what, the ones that I feel like maybe are still loose, even though the tool didn't tell me so, I'm gonna start, uh, yeah, I'll put them at the back of the tray. And that does happen sometimes with that tool because it's all about, you know, getting it aligned just right. And sometimes if you don't have it aligned just right, you can think one's good whenever it actually wasn't. These next three have been good. That one feels good. All right, there's another one. Like that one, it just felt like the primer fell into the pocket. So we're gonna quarantine it as well. That one was kinda, I'm gonna call it good but it wasn't as tight as these others. Start a middle middle section of them there. That one felt perfect. Eh, that one was kind of iffy. All right, so it's kind of funny. So we ended up with 10 pieces that felt perfect. We've got three pieces that were kind of like, you know, definitely some resistance there, but a little looser than I would like. And then there were two that I think are bad. 
the tool just missed them. So these two we're not going to load. These 10 pieces we'll have for our main 10 shot group and then we'll have three pieces as oil shots and ciders and warm ups and all of that stuff. And like, you know, adjusting our bullet seating die and all that. I like this plan. All right, perfect. All right, I'm gonna, hopefully I've got enough powder for that. I think I do from what I recovered plus what's left in here. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be plenty. Now, in case any of you guys were wondering about the primer that didn't go off, like this is the primer strike. Maybe a touch shallow, but man, that looks like a pretty dang good primer strike, you know? Really surprised that didn't go off. And I thought it might have gone off, but whenever I was dumping the powder out of here, I looked and it definitely did not go off. So if we hit it again, it might have eventually gone off. All right, I gotta weigh some charges. Okay, everything has gone very smoothly and I'm just seating the bullets. It's funny, you know, thinking back, I, you know, of course I wish I would have stopped during the priming process with the previous batch and thought, you know, why do these feel loose and checked them. And usually when something goes wrong like that, there's something to think back on where like something wasn't perfect. Could be sizing, could be seating operation, could be priming operation. You get a feel for when everything's going right and it just doesn't happen all the time. And I still occasionally ignore signs that I should have paid attention to, right? I mean, that should have, that should have stopped everything. We should have fixed the problem and we should have never been back here a second time loading this ammo. All right, it's the last one here. So that's it. Let's get back out to the range. Okay, back for day two. We're gonna start out with our cider, you know, our three ciders. And we may only, only shoot one, or maybe two, I don't know. We'll just, we, I know we want, at least wanna shoot one, just to kind of warm things up a touch. All right, here we go. See what that brass looks like. Well, the primer didn't blow. That's a good start. Yep, a little bit of cratering like we saw on the other brass we looked at at the bench. So I think we're okay. Tell you what, let's go ahead and let's just start shooting rounds for real here. And let's switch over to this left hand dot right here and we'll zoom way in. And actually this first one, yeah, this cider will just erase it. There we go. Here we go. All right, that shot felt good. Primer looks the same. Let's keep it moving. That trigger freaks me out. I'm, I'm always like, I'm always scared to death trying to get my finger up around the, uh, you know, trigger guard as kind of a reference and I'm afraid I'm touching the trigger. Whew. Hey, group got a little bit bigger that time, didn't it? All right, one more to finish off the first five. Ah, oh, last shot opened it up even more, didn't it? 0.31. That's still okay. I'm pretty happy with that. After all the drama, you know, and all that crap. All right, our first six shots so far average uh, 33.61. Standard deviation 2.3 and an extreme spread of six. I'm not gonna brag. We're just gonna we're just gonna let that linger. Let those numbers just linger. Okay, five more shots. You can see on the shot marker I've hidden the uh, the old shots. You can see the the circle still there. But we'll see what these next five measure out to, and then we'll see what the see what all ten of them measure as a whole. It hasn't been all that long. We just you know took a couple minutes. So hopefully things haven't cooled down too much or anything. And our first round will be uh, good to go. 
I need to kick on the chronograph again. See if we can keep up these freaking uh, ridiculously good standard deviation and extreme spread numbers. I think we can. Here we go. All right, still so far so good with the primers. See, over on Twitch, they've got these stupid channel points that people watch. Like, if you watch for a certain period of time, you earn you earn channel points as you watch. And they've got this prediction feature where you can bet your channel points on, you know, some outcome. So these groups, we've, we've always got bets running. And the bet on this group, the over-under, is uh, 0.250. So right now, the unders, with our group being 0.230, they're crapping their pants. And the overs, you know, with us being 0.230, they're crapping their pants. So it's an exciting time to be on Twitch right now. All right, that was enough break. Last shot. Let's see what happens. What do we get? Oh yeah. See, the unders won it. And now they get to celebrate. All right, but even more importantly, we made it through our 10 shots. The pressure signs on these look like just, you know, look exactly like the, the older rounds we looked at on the bench. So everything's good to go. So that was successful. And our freaking velocity numbers look incredible. Yep, 11 shots, 3361, standard deviation of 2.3, and an extreme spread of 6. That's at the muzzle. And also, like, you know, on shot marker up there in the corner, you can also see it shows a 2886 average at the target and shows a good SD of 4.5 down on that end as well. So like, this is all good. I'll tell you what, we got two more. We might as well shoot them because we're retiring this batch of brass after this video. It's, it's, it's served its purpose, it's time to retire. All right, so over on Twitch, right now we're at a 0.31. I, I, here's what I want to bet. Will the, will the group get any bigger? So we got two more shots to fire, which go ahead, let me go ahead and pull this guy out so it ain't cooking in the chamber. Is the group going to get any bigger? I doubt it will. So that's going to be the bet. Okay, here we go. Last two shots. So far, so good. Here we go. Oh, well, that one kicked a little bit left, but our group did not get bigger. Good deal. Ooh, wow. That's our tightest bolt lift so far. Oh, man. Did our last shot do something goofy? No, it doesn't really look like it. But yeah, that, that bolt lift was a little bit, a little bit crazy. All right. A lot of fun there with the PPC. Let's switch out to something else. All right, so we're moving on to 223 next, and we're going to start out with a five-shot group. These are the 77 grain Sierra Match King with uh, accurate 2520, 25.2 grains of it. These are very hot loads. These are very hot loads, so don't be don't be doing anything crazy. This rifle is a 223, so it is a white oak armament, 18-inch SPR barrel in an uh, Aero Precision M4E1 upper set. And uh, my standard uh, the Magpul PRS stock. We got a LaRue MBT trigger. We're shooting a uh, Silencer Co. Omega suppressor and a Vortex Viper PST first gen 6 to 24 by 50 scope that we've got on 24 power and sighted in. Guns warmed up. We're ready to go. First group. We're going to start out five shots. Let's see. Where's, where's Twitch got their money? We've been running a, a prediction. Or no, we haven't. I need to start a prediction. All right, let's see. What's the final prediction? I put the over under at 0.6 inches, and they're thinking it's going to be bigger. 74% of the channel points are on the over. All right, here we go. Let's shoot the center dot.
Uh oh. I'm gonna keep shooting, but I see like that. Looks like it might be over. Looks like it might be over. Oh no. It's like about an inch or okay, 0 0.71. That's not the worst, but God, that fifth shot made it even worse, didn't it? Let's see if we hide this guy. Okay, I was working on a 0 0.64. Okay, we've done a little bit better with this load, but it looks like it's kind of trying to group. I'm interested to see how the next five do. All right, next five shot group is going to be, so we, the bet we put up was 0 0.7 or larger or, or less, whatever. So 54% say it'll be less than 0.7 and 46 say it's going to be big so all right 0.7 is our goal these first two these are the ones that uh, i think they're 100 zip fine but i did uh crimp them just a little bit more than the other eight so we'll see if these first two go into the original group or if we catch a flyer you never know man all right here we go Where are we at? Oh, gross. 0.7 inches. That nah, just happened to... Thank you, Mr. Helicopter Guy. They're coming for me. All right, standard deviation 16.1, extreme spread 54, which is not too bad because I don't think I let Twitch know these were thrown charges. These were not measured charges. These were thrown with our new uh, uh, RCBS Uniflow 3 that came with the with the uh the rebel kit we're doing this video about so let's see what was our total group size let me go go ahead and unhide everything nine nine ten okay so 10 shot group 0. 0.71 inches that's pretty close to like the results we've gotten in that mark 262 series with these 18 inch white oak barrels uh we've shot as good as 0. 0.5 you know down we've shot some small groups but we also every once in a while we'll throw one down there that's an inch or so but about three quarter MOA is pretty good average for this. So pretty happy with our performance today. It wasn't bad. That's really all we're looking for here is bad stuff. And this isn't bad. I'll take it. Okay, so next up is 308. And for 308, we are gonna be shooting this gun right here. It is my AR-10. It is an Aero Precision M5E1 setup, you know, upper. And actually, actually the whole damn thing is Aero Precision, except it does have the same stock I used on the AR-15, the Magpul PRS. So same feel and uh, yeah. And I just moved this scope over from the last gun we just shot, the 223. So it's on this guy now. So it's another uh, Vortex Viper PST. So we just got it sighted in with some a little bit of factory ammo, some gold metal factory ammo that uses the 168 grain Sierra, which is what we're about to shoot. We'll start out with five shots in the magazine. So this, this load shot really well in the last video we did with this gun and over on twitch so let's see 62 percent are thinking this is going to be bigger than 0.5 inches but 38 percent think it's going to be smaller i don't know you get the lab radar fired up here all right there we go let's see what happens in case any of you guys are wondering this is the 168 grain sierra match king 2.8 inch overall length imr 4895 43.0 grains of it All right, doesn't look too bad from my view. Yeah, 0.59 inches, I'll take that. A little bit off the screen there. Yeah, I'll take that. What was it looking like before that fifth shot? Oh, 0.42, that sucks. All right, but still, pretty darn good. I'll take it. See what our velocity numbers look like here on the first five. 26.35, standard deviation 6.1, extreme spread 16. Not too bad, not too bad at all. Tell you what, we shouldn't have to waste too much time here. I reckon this barrel can handle 10 shots without heating up too much and giving us mirage problems or anything like that. So let's go ahead and shoot them. 
Okay, for this one, we're not gonna hide the first five shots. We're gonna go ahead and make it a make it a 10 shot group. And the bet over on Twitch is whether it will be bigger or smaller than 0 0.70. All right, here we go. Okay, 0.81. Dang it. Man, that actually looks like a pretty good group through the scope. Let's see, where were we? Let's hide the first five shots. Let's, uh, nope, not that one. Let's look and see what the uh, second five shot group looked like. Oh, so the second shot is way the heck up high and made it 0.77 inches. What was it without that guy? Eh, still 0.69. Yeah, we had three of them trying to tuck in together over there, but... Oh well, that happens. Okay, yeah, you know, it is what it is. It's hoping for a little bit better there, but still not terrible. All right, let's, I think we got enough daylight for, how many more we got left? We got Creedmoor and the 300 Wind Mag left. Huh. All right, all right, so I'll let Twitch decide, and they want to see a cold bore group out of this gun. This is my 300 Winchester Magnum. It is a Savage 110 Precision with a uh, Vortex Viper HS, HS scope on top, yeah, six to 24 power. This guy's sighted in, should be ready to go. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna do totally cold bore and see what happens with our 240 grain Sierra Match King and IMR 7977, 70 grains of it. Whew. Let's see what happens. Quick look at the brass, looking pretty good. Oh man, last freaking shot. And um, trying to decide whether that was my fault or not. Still not bad, you know, 0.91 inches. Big old 300 wind mag, it's a lot to hold on to. What was I doing before that fifth one? Oh baby, 0.44 inches. That hey, looks like at the target, shot marker showing pretty good SD number. Let's see what we got here at the muzzle. Yeah, pretty close, 2660 average velocity. Uh, standard deviation is 6.9. Extreme spread right now is 18. So I'll tell you what, let's keep it going. Don't want to wait too long or I'll run out of daylight here. We're going to keep the five shots on the, on the screen. Make this a 10 shot group. Over on Twitch, we're betting on whether it'll be a 10 shot group under an inch or over an inch. About 50-50 on the believers and the non-believers. I don't think it's getting any bigger. I, it'll be a 0.91 inch group when we're done. They're all going to stack right in there with those first four, and it's going to be a thing of beauty. So as soon as I arm the chronograph, let's make that happen. There we are. Okay. <laughs> that one went down there with number five, didn't it? What in the heck is going on here? All right, that's pretty wild. Scope's loose. Yeah, it does kind of seem like that sort of nonsense, doesn't it? All right, let's keep going. All 
All right, where'd we end up? <laughs> 0.98 inches. Oh, that's hilarious. Hey, it's under one inch. The believers win it. All right, so on the whole, this was kind of disappointing. I, I don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, the gun dropping down like that, really, really weird. Let's see what the first five shots, if we hide them, what our second group looked like. And let's see, one more. Yeah, there we go. So there's our there's our second five. So that's a 0.49 inch group. I mean, that's a freaking smoking good group. I don't care who you are, but I don't know. It wasn't quite trying to stack them right in there, right? So I don't know, maybe it's a, you know, my cheek weld, my shooting position, my bag position. I just kind of jacked something up between that first and second. Or it actually was right between, right before that, uh, the original fifth shot. That one right there, right? That was the first one that kind of started this whole drop low into the left. So I don't know, interesting group. I still think, you know, the 240 Match King and this gun are going to be very good friends. Just got to find the perfect load for them. This might not be it you know but it's still not bad it's still not bad at all yeah this is a brand new rifle so you know it's probably still you know breaking in and it's probably going to speed up a little bit and all the things that barrels do as they break in so we might have to chase it a little bit all right it's it's officially too dark i was going to try and squeeze in the creed more but you know what we haven't shot the the 65 creed more compass in a while so we might as well give it the honor that it's earned you know like it's been a good shooter here on the channel for a long time so we'll come back out tomorrow and shoot for it and yeah see how it does okay we're back out here for day three on the range we've got one more group to shoot it's 6.5 creedmoor this is my 6.5 creedmoor a gun that i love dearly and my audience loves dearly it is the thompson center compass in an oryx chassis and this is is a uh, vortex strike eagle scope this is a i think it's a four to yeah four to 24 by 50 and it's a good shooter so the group you see on the screen there we just shot it i had five uh cider rounds haven't shot this gun in forever so just wanted to double check and make sure it was still zeroed and everything was looking good you can see our first shot the cold bore shot was a little bit low into the right and then the next four stacked right in there this then that that loads the same bullet we're about to shoot right now which is the 140 grain hornady boat tail hollow point with imr 4451 let me get you a charge weight here Yep, 41.6 grain of IMR 4451. And these are standard 2.8 inch overall length, so standard SAMI overall length. Let's see what happens. Yep, double checking the brass. It looks normal. This gun's really bad about cratering primers. It's even worse than we had seen on the 6PPC, but that's just normal. <laughs> wrong, <laughs> wrong dot dumbass all right let me hide that one i get in the zone man my brain goes crazy places all right well <laughs> hide that one <laughs> okay we're ready to continue what I want to do is clear all of these off the target. Okay, there we go. Blank target. We've got five more shots in our magazine. All right, let's see what happens. Last five shots of the video. Need to settle down, make these count. Deep breath. Yeah, that was smooth and nice right there. Four more just like that. It'll be like a 0 .034 inch group. Oh, that was another beauty. Where'd it go? Heck yeah. Where are we at? 0 .14 so far. We're zoomed in as far as we can go, folks. I can only get you so close to this amazing feat of marksmanship. It's not getting any bigger. It's not getting any bigger. Here we go. Number three. Oh, perfection. That one felt perfect. What? 0.48 inches. That's bullcrap. That was a perfect shot. Garbage ammo. That's 
what we're dealing with. Oh, yes. Perfect. Execution. 0.48 inches. All right, so our bet on Twitch is 0.5. So probably some people crapping their pants right now. Watch this. All right, listen. Those were some. Those were five good feeling shots. I don't care where they went. All right, point four eight inches. The unders win it. Nice. All right, let's look at our velocity numbers real quick, just for the heck of it. We collected them. Might as well read them. Oh right, yeah, the average velocity was twenty five seventy four, eighteen point four feet per second. Standard deviation, extreme spread of fifty eight. Nothing really special about those numbers. Kind of, eh, not that great, but. All right, that's it. Let's get back to the bench. So before we get into the five minute conclusion, you know, for the people that wanted to skip ahead and all that crap, and I, I'm thinking I'm going to spin it off. I'm going to post it as a separate YouTube video now, because way back in the beginning of this video, I had no idea that the length of this project was going to get this far out of hand. I was thinking an hour and a half, maybe two hours, which is not unprecedented on my channel, but six plus hours is a little over the top. So that's why I want to just post the conclusion separately as well, but we'll put it in the end of this video also. It'll be the same thing. Now, I have been editing this video live over on Twitch, and we've been at it for seven straight days to get to this point. And I've learned a couple things. Some of the most important about this little trickler that gave us so much frustration. So apparently a lot of people don't use the, the extension tube. That was a big part of our log jams. And, you know, and back then I mentioned, like, why do I need this? I don't. The big one, though, that I didn't notice until I was editing, I noticed some writing on one side of this black base. It says scale. So apparently this is tilted or something, and that side is supposed to point to the scale. If you look at the orientation of mine right now, it's completely backwards. And I'll tell you what, while I've got this apart, another thing I want to try that we never tried earlier, like I was saying, this, this part's pretty darn light. And actually, to make a shorter one, there is this big cavity. I could almost do something like I did with the Hornady and add some additional weight there but yeah here it is in that configuration that that would work that would absolutely work that might be the way i i use it most often going forward it's just like that it'll be a much better height for our pan and hopefully it'll flow properly so all right let me put the base back on but let me put the orientation correct now of course this is my own stupidity right all of this i'm sure is right there in the manual i still haven't even looked i should probably do that like i'll, I'll do that here in just a second Okay, there we go. And now whenever I set that thing there, that is like a freaking sick gangsta lean this thing's got now. Are you seeing that? You see, you seeing that? Yeah, there's a bunch. So I was fighting against that earlier. So trickler issues, my fault, as we expected. The second annoying equipment thing that I wanted to look a little bit closer at was this. Because in one of the shots during editing, whenever I was loosening or tightening this, I thought I saw a big brass like shaving or something in the threads. Well, I've messed around with this a while. Basically just took it apart and screwed this in and out about 150 times and got it 100 times smoother than it was. Like now it's nice and easy to tighten this up. And I finally figured out, you know, towards the end of that portion, that flat part needs to line up with that, right? And then whenever you adjust, you just need to loosen this a touch and then, you know, your adjustments will work. I've got it. There it is. Yeah, the adjustments will work. So if that breaks in and gets a little bit less annoying, I'll be very happy with the powder measure. It worked just as good as my old Uniflow 2, and that's all I could ask for. Now, one thing I kind of mentioned a little bit, but I just want to bring it up again because it was super annoying. Like these Hornady, the pinch style lock rings, I always thought I liked these, but I think it just comes down to the fact that I don't use locking die rings very often, and I didn't know enough to hate them. And I think what's going on is so, you know, whenever this is loose and you get it all set up and it's pinched down tight to the press and then you go to tighten this, I assume whenever this is tightening, just the nature of lining up with the threads, since, you know, the, the press is already pushing upward, I assume that the lock ring is going to want to go downward or, you know, kind of cinch 
the die in place. That, that's what I was running into. Every time I locked one of these down, I couldn't remove it from the press anymore. You know, part of that was because the insert was a little bit loose, but part of it was just this. So I think I might be on board with uh, lock rings like RCBS's with the straight in screw to lock them. So you might keep that in mind. I just, I load so much different stuff and I use so many different dies that I guess I've just, I've gotten comfortable with just setting up the dies every time. And that's not necessarily best for consistency, but I guess it's just what I've gotten used to. But I know that ability is important for a lot of people. And actually speaking of that, with the, with the, with the bushing in the top of the Rebel Press, yeah, you remember what I'm talking about, right? The, uh, which I guess we're done with that guy. I can get it out of the way. But yeah, the black insert, you can install the Hornady lock and load system or the, the Lee breech lock system, which is a quick, uh, quick install, quick release die system. I'm not a huge fan of either, to be honest with you, but it's out there and having the big bushing makes that a pretty easy swap in. Now on the subject of our range results, we did have some function issues with a couple guns. So 45 ACP, you know, in my Kimber, we had several jams, it just wasn't running right. I think it's just the load. I can't imagine it was anything in the loading process that could have caused it. You know, that's that pistol stuff's where we had the barrel out of the gun, made sure the, the ammunition was fitting. We had the, uh, you know, the Lee factory crimp die with its little sizing ring. So we had a lot of safeguards where I, I don't feel like it was something physically wrong with the, the ammo. I think it was just a, a, a load that was too weak to run that gun perhaps. And you'll, you'll run into that, you know, like uh, it's a big part of reloading for any semi-auto. You know, that's kind of your first goal, goal is will this load run the gun? And, if, you know, if it won't run the gun, it's kind of useless to you. It doesn't matter how accurate it is or how economic it is or how cheap, whatever, you, you know, whatever. Nothing else matters if it won't run the gun. And the other problems we had were with 6.5 Grendel. I was having issue, uh, feeding issues in the Grendel. That was 100% a bad magazine double checked it afterwards it was a bad magazine nothing related to our to our loads i do wonder if that kind of screwed up our groups a little bit you know our, our groups were pretty good across the board as soon as i got done finishing i, I kind of felt like you know we had more large groups than i thought but then later during the editing process and looking at them again like this was this is pretty dang good shooting ammo across the board i'm pretty happy with how this turned out and i'm obviously happy with the rcbs rebel aka rock chucker 5 and I think of just about all of the kits out there, this might be my favorite. But, you know, I, I'm probably biased just because of my background. You know, I've been using the RCBS Uniflow 2 for a long time, and it's already my favorite hand primer. So this kit was full of stuff I already loved, and I had pretty high confidence going into it that the press would be a good one as well. All right, I guess at this point we should start the five-minute conclusion. And before we do that, just, you know... To those of you who slogged through this whole thing, I appreciate you. If you're looking, you know, if you're looking to get into reloading, hopefully this answered some questions for you or gave you a better feel for what the process is like. If you've got questions, I'm here to help. Got a whole community of people really, you know, enthusiastic about helping. You can come join us on our Discord server. I'll be sure to have a link for that in the description. Uh, you can come over to Twitch and we're live a lot over there, but Monday, every Monday night at 7 p.m., no matter what, we'll be live then. And that's kind of our pre-scheduled uh, Q&A, just hangout session every week. And then other than that, I just kind of come on live whenever whenever I feel like it or whenever I, we're on the range. You know, we uh, live stream every time I'm on the range. So come on over to Twitch and hang out with us. Check us out on Discord. And welcome to the community. And hopefully, you know, the first time you're actually loading, it doesn't feel like the first time. Hopefully this six and a half hours you just invested in this video gave you a good idea of what you're getting yourself into and we're pretty much all happy to see whenever the community grows by one so welcome okay i probably need to get the gigantic box you think they'll want to see that I, I reckon they'll probably want to see that i can do this in five minutes we're going to work off our list of crap you're definitely going to need which somewhere along the way this became a list of crap you're definitely going to need plus of some other stuff you might need whatever it's still a good list we did not have a trimmer on here so whenever we talked about brass trimmers we forgot to add it so i've added it over here and moved some things around and i think our list is pretty complete you guys see anything missing like i think this covers everything we touched and a few things we didn't all right this time i promise let's get to the outro 
All right, folks, welcome back. This is the RCBS Rebel Master Reloading Kit. I just posted a gigantic video that's over six hours long where we use this kit to load up a wide variety of ammunition for a bunch of different cartridges. We test out each component of the kit and we keep close track of what we used that wasn't included in the kit. So if this short summary doesn't answer the questions you've got or if you're new and just kind of want to see the whole process in every detail, I would urge you to watch that. But this is the five minute version and we need to get going. This is the RCBS Rebel Press. I really have no clue why this press exists. It seems to be a direct competitor to the RCBS Rock Chucker. As far as I'm concerned, this should have been the RCBS Rock Chucker 5, but it's the Rebel. So I don't know what the long-term plans are from RCBS, but if they're gonna keep pro both product lines, then it seems a little bit weird. This one, uh, the opening is a little bit bigger than the Rock Chucker. It's heavier than the Rock Chucker. It's beefier than the Rock Chucker. It's thicker than the Rock Chucker. So as far as I'm concerned, this should have been the next generation of Rock Chucker. Now, unlike the Rock Chucker, you'll see no primer collecting nonsense going on up here, you know, above the, uh, above the bench level on the press. This press ejects spent primers down through the ram and out the bottom. So with this design, you're going to need a trash can or some other type of collecting stuff under there. Now on top of the press, you've got the same bushing. So if you need to switch from the seven eighths size dies up to the big inch and a quarter dies, you can pull that out just like the rock chucker. There's a Zerk fitting on the front of the, the ram thingy for greasing it. And that worked pretty well. We used it and it worked fine. One problem is uh, I did over grease it and the primer ejection port on the back of the ram ended up getting clogged with grease. So you can definitely overdo it. Now, this press, whenever it came out of the package, was very stiff. It has loosened up considerably just loading, you know, 100 rounds worth of ammo. So if you take it straight out of the box and it feels a little bit stiff, don't sweat it too much. It'll break in really quick. So, you know, that tight feeling to begin with, I think comes from just an exceptionally tight fitting ram. There's very, very, very little, like I can't feel slop in this ram. So I think the ram to press fitting is just so tight that it takes a minute to get it broken in and gliding properly. So otherwise with the press, it is pretty darn standard O-frame design. It does have a second spot you can put the handle for left-handed operation, I reckon. Now, when you lay the kit out on a bench, it looks pretty sparse. So first question, is this kit worth the money? Is it a good value? And the answer is yes. I paid, I got a really, really good deal from Midway USA at uh, $359.99. They had it on sale last December. Then I waited four or five months for my back order to get filled, but they're finally coming back in stock. Best price I see right now is at Natchez Shooter Supply. This kit is $394.99 and it's in stock. It's also in stock at Mid-South. Their price is a little bit higher at $488.95, actually, so quite a bit higher. So number one, I guess, shop around. Find it for under 400 bucks and you're probably getting yourself a good deal. Street price for all of the pieces that are included, not retail. So if, if I bought all of the parts at a good price, it comes out to right about $575. So let's round it off a bunch and say that we're saving $200 over buying the parts individually. Now that's not worth much if the parts are garbage. This, this kit is excellent. The only true piece of garbage in the kit was my scale, which we'll get to here in a minute. And I wasn't a big fan of the funnel, which we'll get to here in a minute, which is a weird thing to complain about. Otherwise, it's all great stuff, like really, really good stuff that you're not really going to need to upgrade. So I consider it a great deal. So we've already seen the press. The next big piece is the powder measure. This is the Uniflow 3 powder measure. I have used a Uniflow 2 for quite a few years, so I'm very uh, comfortable with it and happy with it. And I'm also happy with this one. It's a little bit easier to adjust, but I did have to fiddle with this. Mine had a burr on this brass screw that really, whenever we were getting started, I was running into, into a bunch of uh, problems with this guy right here, this little lock guy. But otherwise, functionally, it worked great. We threw extremely accurate and repeatable charges with ball powders. We did pretty darn good with flake powders, and we did horribly with extruded powders. Extruded powders and powder measures just don't mix. They suck. And it's not just RCBS, it's most of them. The next piece in the kit is this scale. Mine is faulty. Like not only is it just cheap and crappy, like mine's actually broken. You turn it on and the number just sits there floating back and forth, it's completely unusable. So I wasn't really able to give you a true uh, evaluation of this. And one that's working properly like RCBS intends might be okay, but mine's, mine's junk. 
There are other scales that are pretty cheap over on Amazon. This guy right here is one of my favorites. It's the True Way Marksman. This guy works well. There's a Bryfit. I've got a I've got a, a video I did not too long ago testing kind of my my recent batch of Amazon scales. So if you're looking for a cheap scale, go check that out. If you're a rifle guy who shoots a lot of extruded powders, like I was talking about how much they suck in the powder measure, well, this might be the time to buy a powder dispenser like the Charge Master Light. That's a couple hundred bucks, but if you're gonna spend 30, 40, 50 bucks to replace that scale, then, you know, it's almost like a discount on Charge Master Light. And it, and it works fine for a general purpose scale as well as a powder dispenser. So a lot of options there. I definitely don't trust the scale. Happy to have the pan though. You know, it does come with the RCBS powder pan that we all know and love. Or if you don't know it and love it yet, once you get your hands on one, you will know it and love it. It comes with the RCBS Universal Hand Priming Tool. I love this hand priming tool and I really like hand priming, which that's another thing I should have mentioned over on the press. There's no on the press priming with the RCBS Rebel. This is what they give you in the kit or if you want to, you know, come up with other arrangements, that's fine, but there's nothing on the press to, uh, to prime. And I love the RCBS hand, Universal Hand Primer. I have actually owned two of these for a long time. I keep one set up for large primers, the other set up for small. This is my favorite priming tool on the market. So I'm glad it's included in, the, in this kit. The powder trickler actually gave me more issues than I thought it would because I didn't really read the instructions very well. Powder trickler, very simple. You put powder in here and then it slowly trickles out the end of this tube. Um, I'm getting the feeling from a lot of people uh, that I'm chatting with over on Twitch that a lot of people don't use this extension tube. So this extension tube ended up causing some problems. We would get blockages here in the, the joint but for, as it went from this tube to this tube, whatever. So you might need to ditch the tube, but the biggest problem that I didn't realize, which I feel like a big moron, is this black base, which this is an adjustable black base where you can change the height of the, the powder measure. I just put it on there and screwed it in. There's actually markings on it where that way is supposed to point toward the scale, right? It's supposed to point the same direction as your tube. I had it completely turned the wrong way. So it had messed up the, uh, the tilt because this thing, once it's pointed the right way, has got a pretty aggressive down tilt, and that would probably make it work a whole lot better with this tube I was having clogging issues with. You can also run it, so without the extension and without the base, it's a uh, pretty nice little compact version, because if you do end up using the RCBS scale, it's awfully low, so your trickler is sitting quite a bit high up off of the pan, and we did have problems with you know powder splashing and stuff when it hit the pan a little bit, but it wasn't a big deal, it wasn't a huge deal. So that's the trickler, good trickler. It comes with a basic plastic uh, universal funnel. The problem I ran into this guy, ran into with this guy is the stepped design down there that is supposed to fit different size case necks. I was used to the, yeah, this guy right here, I'm kind of used to the Lee funnel design or I've got it like an MTM funnel that's the same way. It's a, it's a tapered, yeah, it's just, it's a taper. There's no steps in there. So what happened was as I was loading, didn't realize how that was designed. I got one on crooked and ended up dumping powder all over the place. And that wasn't all that much fun to clean up. So the, the funnel kind of annoyed me a little bit. It was also a little bit challenging with particularly large extruded powders going through the tiny little orifice, but no way to fix that, right? A universal funnel needs to be able to handle down to 17 or 22, or yeah, th this one's 22 caliber, 22 to 50 caliber. So that hole can only be so large, I don't blame them there. But the, uh, yeah, the step design, once I knew it was there and once I started paying attention and making sure that I was making a nice seal between my funnel and my case, everything was fine. Next is the manual. It comes with the Spear 15th edition. Hand loading manual number 15, it's a good manual. It's an excellent manual. Like particularly as we were loading and I was looking up load data for each cartridge, there's a really nice section for each cartridge where they talk about some history about the cartridge and some, you know, tips and tricks, what bullet weights usually shoot well, they, you know, that sort of stuff. So lots of good information in the manual, plus an entire section that teaches you how to reload, which is better than watching a guy on YouTube. The next is a universal loading tray. One of these guys here. These work pretty well. I broke mine. Yep, actually, I think I rolled the press over onto it when it was in the box, but that was my fault. So I don't know, maybe be a little bit careful, but I think it was just a fluke. But otherwise, it worked pretty well. I would definitely recommend you buy another tray because a lot of times we pulled out, yeah, here's a, here's a Hornady Universal tray. A lot of times whenever you're loading, it's nice to be able to have two trays to work from. 
they also make specific trays for particular cartridges that fit perfectly. And that's really the way to go, especially if you only load for a couple, couple cartridges, get you a, a handful of those Frankfurt Arsenal perfect fit reloading trays or something similar to that, you'll be, you'll be in business. It came with a bottle of RCBS case slick spray lube and we didn't have any problems whatsoever. I went a little bit overboard. Like I over lubed these cases cause I was a little bit worried, didn't want to get a stuck case. So even though they were over lubed, I didn't run into problems with shoulder denting, but next time I use it, I'm definitely going to cut back and try and reduce the amount that I use. It is a little bit expensive at like 10 bucks a bottle, but comes with the kit and it works pretty well. So I can't complain about the case slick. It comes with a basic set of Allen wrenches that work just fine. It comes with a little handle for using uh, accessories, which you get two size brushes and two size uh, primer pocket cleaners. That one's upside down. There you go. You want to see the brush end. Primer pocket cleaners and case neck brushes. And the last piece in the kit is a deburr and chamfer tool for your case necks, which is uh, a good one. So all those parts were good. The, the scale was the only piece of crap. So I think this kit represents a really good value. Now this is the master kit. There's also a plus kit. Don't get the plus kit. The plus kit's crap. And let me explain why. The first thing, so we're talking about things that come with the plus kit. The powder measure stand. This is $25. You're gonna want that. It's, uh, yeah, the kit does come with one of these where you can hang the powder measure off the side of your reloading press. But if you wanna have it permanently bench mounted, kinda like I do here, you'll want the stand, it's 25 bucks. Now the main reason I would stay away from the press kit is the hand primer it comes with is not the universal kit or not the universal primer like this one. It's their standard primer that uses shell holders. I don't want to use shell holders, man. I've gotten used to the universal one. This one's a better product. This one's the more expensive product, right? So they basically downgrade your hand primer in that kit, which I have a big problem with. You get a, a kit of shell holders. You know, it'll be the four or five standard shell. Yeah, it's actually a five shell holder kit and it'll be the standard ones for your most popular cartridges but you may need to buy more shell holders, but it's nice that it comes with five shell holders. I guess they felt obligated to throw those in because the, the hand primer required them. I don't know. It comes with a set of die lock rings, six die lock rings. Most dies come with lock rings. So I'm not sure how much use you'll get out of these event, you know, uh, immediately. Eventually you'll use them. You know, it's always nice to have die lock rings laying around, but it's not like the first thing you should worry about buying a kit unless your dies happen to show up without lock rings, which that, Unless you're buying some weird custom die from somewhere weird, all your major brands of dies are gonna come with lock rings. The plus kit includes a set of analog dial calipers. I do not want analog dial calipers. I am a man of the 21st century. I want digital calipers. I'm not smart enough to read analog dial calipers. So they can just keep those. I don't want them. And the last thing that comes in the plus kit is a bullet puller. You're going to need one of these. You know, this is a bullet puller. This one here happens to be a national metallic brand. These are on Midway for like $11.99. Very cheap. The, the RCBS one, the kinetic bullet puller from RCBS is definitely a nicer unit. It's about 25 bucks, but I reckon it probably works just like this one. I don't know. So the best price on the plus kit I see right now is like five, $34.99 at Natchez. So did you see $140 worth of value in that list for the plus kit? I didn't. I don't want my hand primer downgraded. I don't want analog calipers. So I'll just pay $25 to buy my powder measure stand separately. I'll buy the set of calipers that I want instead of those analog ones. And we'll pick up a bullet puller for, you know, somewhere between $12 and $25. That's a much better path forward than the plus kit, in my opinion. Now, while I was filming this video, we did, we kept a list of crap you were definitely going to need to buy. It, it got a little bit less definitely toward the end. So a couple of these you might not need, but number one was press mounting hardware, right? At the very least, you're going to need some, uh, screws and bolts and stuff to mount the press to the bench, or you might go with the RCBS mounting plate, or you might like me use the inline fabrication quick change press mounting kit, whatever, you need to figure out your press mounting situation, right? Next, your powder measure stand, we already talked about that. Those are 25 bucks from RCBS and uh, you're probably gonna want one. You'll want a large powder funnel and a bowl. We'll talk about the next two at the same time. So this large uh, funnel just from my local auto parts store is what I use for moving powder around, you know, dumping large amounts of powder, emptying my powder measure, that sort of stuff. You're gonna want that and this little bowl comes in really handy when you're dealing with small amounts of powder, so get you one of those. 
You need to get more loading blocks for the reasons we already talked about. I would definitely prefer you get fitted ones that fit your cartridges perfectly. Bullet puller we already talked about. Calipers we already kind of touched on. This is the bare minimum I would re recommend for calipers. This is an eye gauging set that I bought from Amazon. They're about 40 bucks right now. Six inch digital dial calipers. These work really, really well. If I can get them to turn on. There we go. Yeah, there, there you go. These are surprisingly well made for, you know, just being $40 calipers off of Amazon. So you might consider these. I'm happy with these. I use these and a slightly more expensive set. I don't know what I did with them, whatever, but at least go with the eye gauging set. I'll have links in the description. But if you want to get fancy, get you a set of Mitatoyos. The next thing on the list is a stuck case remover. This is the RCBS 09340. It's a tap and die and uh, spacer sort of setup. I've got a video on it if you want to see it. It's for removing cases when you get them stuck in the die. So like if you, if you screw up and you forget to use case lube or you use too little, you can get a case stuck in your die. It's a big pain in the butt. And especially if you're going to do bottleneck rifle reloading, it's nice to have these laying around because cases only stick when you get in a hurry. So you'll want to have one on hand. The next is something I consider absolutely crucial. And that is a set of check weights for your scale. So this set has weights all the way from 20 grains down to 0.5 grains. So you're able to just have full confidence in your scale every time you sit down to reload. They're not cheap. You're going to spend 30 or $35. There are some cheaper sets on Amazon. I was actually talking with somebody the other day about those. So I'm probably going to be testing some of those personally here in the short term, but this is a Lyman set. RCBS sells a set. There's several of the reloading companies that sell a set of check weights and I would not reload without them. So the next thing on our list is this uh, Lee powder measure kit. It is a set of scoops. It's a bunch of different size scoops. These are very, very useful when measuring out powder. A lot of times when you're only loading a few cartridges, you know, you dump you a little bit of powder in your bowl. You grab the, the right size Lee scoop that gets you almost to the right spot, dump it on your scale, and then use your trickler to uh, trickle in the last little bit. Works great. That Lee powder measure kit is like $12 and it'll more than pay for itself in time saved. Next is dies. Dies is a huge conversation that I don't have time to deal with in this video, but we do go into my die choices and why I choose the dies I do in the, the longer video, but for here, you're going to need dies and you're going to need shell holders to go with those dies. Some dies come with shell holders, some don't. Maybe your kit, maybe you got the plus kit, so you've got a set of shell holders. Maybe you don't need to buy any more, you know, whatever. Next, number 13 is uh, you're going to need a tumbler whether it be a wet tumbler, a dry tumbler, or perhaps an ultrasonic cleaner to clean your brass. We didn't really cover that much in the big long video. It's a pretty big topic. I prefer wet tumbling right now. You can pick up a wet tumbler now for, you know, 99 bucks. RCBS has one that's 150 bucks. Either of those would work great, but a lot of different, yeah, a lot of different uh, ways to clean brass and you're going to need to do a little bit of research. Number 14 is a scale, right? I had to replace my scale. Mine came out of the box faulty. I'll probably get with RCBS and have them send me one or see if they will. I can't imagine they wouldn't. But for me, we needed a scale. A trimmer. That's a big, that's a big decision. A lot of ways you can go with trimming. On the RCBS side of things, there's the, uh, the Trim Pro. You could get you one of these. You could get something like this. Frankfurt Arsenal Universal Case Trimmer that goes in your drill that isn't too terrible. You could get the extremely inexpensive but immensely handy uh, Lee setup where you buy a case length gauge and shell holder for each of your cartridges. And then there's another part called a cutter and lock stud that you need. You're trimming for like 15 bucks and these actually work really well and they're, uh, yeah, pretty fast. So, the, so if you don't really know what you wanna do, start with this setup and then decide what you wanna go with later. You know, it'll give you time. At the very least, it buys you time to make a decision on one of the more expensive routes for trimming. If you're going to run into military brass, so mainly if, you, if you're loading 223 or maybe some 308 military brass or nine millimeter, 45 ACP, whatever, you may run into crimped primers. The only time I really usually fool with them is in 223, where we run into a lot of brass. With crimped primers, this is just a little thing that uh, it's a little blade that screws onto your little handle and lets you remove the military crimps. It's like, uh, I think 18 bucks. Last time I bought one, something in that neighborhood. And that's another process, like some people swage. RCBS actually sells a uh, primer pocket swaging kit. Big discussion, lots of options. Cheapest, easiest I've found is that little, 
is that little uh, RCBS remover blade thingy. The next one are headspace comparators and bullet comparators. This is the, up here is the Hornady headspace comparator kit, and then the bottom two rows here are the Hornady bullet comparator kit. You could probably hold off on the bullet comparator, but as far as I'm concerned, if you're loading rifle ammo these days, I think you need to just go ahead and start out with a uh, headspace comparator kit like the Hornady. There's some others out there now. If you're wanting to stick with RCBS, you got your tattoo all picked out and everything. They make one called, uh, I don't know, it's really cool. I've never used one. Here it is. It's called the RCBS Precision Mic. I want to try one of these sometimes. They're pretty, uh, pretty cool, but it all kind of screws together and stuff, and you can take measurements on your headspace and whatnot with that guy. Serves a similar purpose. So these... These kits get you into it a little bit cheaper, I think. The Hornady, you know, with the, the different inserts where the precision mics are caliber or cartridge specific. So no matter which route you choose, just, you know, having a way to monitor your headspace while you're setting up your sizing dies, I think is very important. I, want to, I wouldn't want to go back to loading without them. So that's it. That's the end of the list. That's everything that we used in the video. And we managed to load everything from 45 ACP up to 300 Winchester Magnum and didn't run into any equipment related issues other than just kind of the normal, the normal trials and tribulations of a day of reloading. Tell you what, one more little tool I want to bring up that we didn't actually put on the, the list of crap you're definitely going to need or might need, but we use this in the big video. It is a, this is a go no go gauge for primer pockets made by ballistic tools. You can get them for like uh, $12. I bring this up not because you should buy this necessarily, but to just let you know that there are a million little tools for a little task like this in the reloading world. And most of them are very helpful in certain situations like this one was to us in that problem we ran into. So don't be surprised if you know maybe you're looking around at all the information you can get your hands on right now because you're about to get into reloading and you know some minor stuff like you know maybe you'll go to another video and they won't even mention any of this comparator, comparator tool garbage. This is more of a, you know, can you reload without these? Absolutely. I just wouldn't want to. Or is it smart to buy a uh, stuck case remover when you haven't got a stuck case to remove? People are gonna say no, they've never stuck a case, they've been reloading 15 years, whatever, they've been they've been lucky. I've stuck 15 or 20, you know? Like, I, I, I like having it around. So good luck on your research and good luck getting your head wrapped around everything. So I think that's where we leave it, folks. So far, I'm very happy with this kit. There really weren't any surprises. It was exactly what I was expecting. If it fits in your budget, I would definitely recommend it. That's it for this project. I'll see you guys next time.